introduced with the statement, and uh, we provided yesterday a statement, we an instruction we want given to the court, and those issues have been intermixed. So this is this is the exhibit. This is the link on the uh, exhibit that people have been showing the email, but to the plaintiff to his daughter and back the same day as the incident. True. It has nothing to do with the GoPro. The GoPro is a it's separate the issue. It's the link at the bottom of Mr. Sanderson's email. Comments. Okay. So we've got right. we've got the the exhibit now or the results of that link. Yeah. yeah. With, a, with a string of comments. So you you can correct me, Pete, but. I understand that we're in agreement that it, it can come in, but we defense would like to have it be connected to both the page that we've already shown. I don't know if you can see this, Your Honor, but Whitney. it's the picture of Whitney with some description, which is actually the page you get to if you press the link um, at, or would have gotten to before. Which, you know, we'll, we can explain that. Once it was activated. And then... And then uh, another page which you have to exit out of that picture with a little uh, caption and it gives you another page that uh, includes a little event link that when you press that link it goes to these comments and so we think they, they should all go together to make a clear picture but we're not uh, objecting to the comments themselves. Well we can't, there's no way we can get that done in time. Uh, we're putting him on first and uh, if they want to supplement and we'll stipulate that no one's at fault for this. You know? well, we've got one stipulate. Let me just, I don't know if you knew this, uh, Mr. Sykes, but we may not be starting, we're not starting at 9, and we'll start at 9.15 if the jury's assembled. I'm not sure, they're not all here yet because of the snowstorm, so we've got a few minutes. Um, so, but but in principle, do we agree on on that, Mr. Sorensen? We do, we agree that it's it should come in. Um, it's kind of working out the logistics of how we want to bring that forward, I think, is where we might be. We had, I so you want me to, to instruct the jury that the, that it's been found? Well, we, yeah. we, had, we had a it's couple different accessed. ideas. I, I think that that is a very fine instruction, Your Honor. I, I think we had also thought about possibly having Terry log it in to the to the site. And no, don't but we don't need to do that. that. Okay. We don't need to do that if... if this is already and, and yeah. judge if they want to find that other page we have no problem to that coming into you know if there's some other page you have, well, we just yeah, want to delay it because it's, we have it's five just minutes a matter of, of creating the exhibit I think okay. that's where we are now all right and then this, I think then the statement that you would give to explain to the jury we proposed one and um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that I, that's something I didn't see let's okay. hand it we have uh, may I approach your honor yes side needs to hear what's going on here let's just do it openly yeah so so page three at the bottom is what we're talking about do you mind if I read it your honor and then I'll add what we're thinking maybe we add to it to help make clear from plaintiff's side what's happened sure so we propose the following statement members of the jury I'm, go I'm going to tell you about a new piece of evidence a viewer following the trial and familiar with finding archived website links investigated the link referenced on defendants exhibit 102 mr. Sanderson's email to his daughters on the day of the accident through the viewers efforts and expertise he provided a functional link to defendant on Friday that was two days ago uh, defendant immediately disclosed those documents to plaintiff and the court and then this was the addition we just were thinking of adding. Plaintiff has since accessed the page through Terry Sanderson's meetup login. This link leads to, um, well, I guess that wouldn't be able to go right there, but that should be added somewhere. Um, this link, the one that was provided by the um, person following the trial, leads to a meetup.com post made by Mr. Sanderson and the associated pages of comments, which includes comments made by plaintiff and Mr. Ramon uh, about the accident that were previously unavailable to either party. Either party. Previously unavailable. Yes. Well, 
So I don't like that last sentence. Okay. Because I think it was previously available to them. Well, what I propose then is that you say, or that I say, that we're equally available to both sides. I think, I, I think that's accurate, Your Honor. I, every, there's a kind of continual insinuation that plaintiff hid something or withheld something that's already been in the fabric of this case. And, and that's the biggest issue for us on the plaintiff's side is that we disclosed this, we disclosed these links, and whether they were explored or not, I think it was moot at this point because we've now discovered there's additional evidence that I think it should be neutral. I don't think so why were they not equally available? Because he reactivated his password just days ago and brought That's up. That's not accurate, Your Honor. I'd you like to hear it from Mr. Owens. Go ahead, Mr. Owens. In chambers, they said. No, you don't need to repeat that. But, but why, why was it not equally available to both sides if, if this um, tech geek, for lack of a better word, was able to find it? Because it required their password. So this person that contacted defense counsel had their password? Okay. It this seems like with computer forensics, either side could have accessed that link. Your Honor, we tried a hundred times to access I realize that, that. I realize that. But it seems that it was equally available or equally unavailable to both sides. It was very difficult. I think what happened is Terry reactivated his account a few days ago, and then the viewer was able then to access the... Uh, and how, how, do we so know, that, how do we know this? Do you have a computer expert that's going to say that? Your Honor, if I may, that's, that's the crux right there. It's, there's no facts to back up that. That might be a defense theory, but besides just pure speculation and supposition, there's no computer expert that will say that somehow logging in under Mr. Sanderson's credentials reactivated anything. Well, I, I think I've already identified that being the issue. But and, and, through dis and, and, if you're, and even if that were true, Mr. Owens, um, through discovery, you could have asked for that. I did, in writing, and well, De Deer Valley did. Give us all photos this like This isn't that. the time, though, to to fight that battle. I'm, I, I, we're dealing with something that came about Friday morning at 10.30 a.m. So, there's, so, so it's see. simple for them. It wasn't simple for us. Well, it, I, I'm not convinced that it was simple for them. I don't have facts before me to, to, to say that it was simple for them. This is out because it came to us and we disclosed it. Right. To this day, they didn't get it. Um, this idea that it's it's all equal, I, I, I don't agree, and I think they're going to argue, because they told me they would on Friday, that Mr. Owens in opening said this is the most important evidence, and look, here it is. And without some statement, like a viewer contacted Mr. Owens' office, my office, and we immediately disclosed it, then it looks like I've lied to the jury in opening, Your Honor. Because well, it was equally available. Why don't you show me what you can agree on, and maybe the availability comment just isn't part of the court's instruction. Just, I'll just give them the facts that on Friday, a viewer of this trial was, you know, basically sent a copy of the document that they were able to obtain through Internet Archives and got it to the defense counsel, and the defense counsel then disclosed it to the court and to plaintiff's counsel. Mr. Sykes? How about just saying, this is totally neutral. This has since been discovered. No one is at fault. Uh, but it's since been discovered. That way you don't help anybody by the way you announce it. You know? Well, if you could give me that additional language that you believe that the two of you had agreed on, and I'll just look at it and I'll make a decision. I understand Mr. Owen's position that he doesn't want um, nobody's at fault, or it was equally available or equally unavailable. He doesn't want that language in there. I'll, I'll consider all of the proposals and, and give them an instruction. And that defendant found it. I think that's in the language. Not that you found it, but that someone sent it to you. And we immediately disclosed it. Yes. Yeah. OK. 
Okay. But, but that's trying to get some benefit from it. See, I'm saying that it should be neutral. Well, I'll, I'll take that into account. And what I want to do is disclose to the jury the facts of what happened so that they can understand it. So there'll be there'll be some information about that in there. There's still a viewer, found, a viewer found it. It's been produced, and here it is. That's it. It doesn't have to be. We immediately disclosed it, or every somebody's at fault. Nobody's at fault. A view, it, the viewer found it. We have it. Here it is. And Owens is saying it doesn't exist, but here it is. But it was Owens who just found it and disclosed it. I, so I didn't find it, but obtained it. I think we've, we've okay. got everything out that needs to get out on that issue. Plaintiff's exhibits one through what? 43? Is it? 44. 44. Is there agreement on this? There are some objections, Your Honor. Um, we filed some, and I, I should pull up the. Um, you, this was our objections from before, not recently filed. Right. I've got that here. Um, the, the, maybe the first things we should address are those some of those end exhibits, which include some literature that uh, was late, and the court ruled that Dr. Fong's testimony talking about it couldn't be shown. That's forty. One and forty-two. Can we go in order? Because thirty-nine, I uh, I learned that this was plaintiff's lawyer's handwriting. Do you have thirty-nine in front of you, Your Honor? I don't have anything right now, and I'm looking for the objections. Just give me a moment. Do you, do you have a list of the? Do you have a list of the exhibits that? can be admitted that you're not objecting to? So would it make sense, Mr. Uh, Sykes, to introduce the exhibits that there are not objections to right sure, now? Sure. And, and we will withdraw any effort to admit the literature. We were going to use it to, not to admit it, we were going to use it to put it in front of the witness. But we'll, we'll withdraw that so no, no literature comes so in. So that's 41 and 42 withdrawn. Your, your Honor, um, this binder they've given us, 1 through 38, these are authentic documents, but some have not been referenced. So I don't think they just get a ream of paper, uh, many of the documents of which have not been referenced in the trial. They haven't rested yet, so perhaps we have to extend this conversation um, until after they rest, because now they're calling two witnesses. So I guess if there's a motion to admit exhibits and some of those exhibits you're now withdrawing uh, perhaps you could make a new motion mr. Bueller that would identify those exhibits that you're moving to admit okay um, well, your honor uh, plaintiff moves to uh, admit plaintiff's exhibits 1 through 40 and 44 and 44 1 through 40 and 44 on, on number 44, I just looked at it. I think there's one little redaction that needs to happen. There's a cell phone number. We should probably redact that out of yeah. one of the comments. Okay. And then... And and what's the defendant's position on 1 through 40 and 44? So uh, 33 is Dr. Fong's records, and there are fMRI records that she didn't speak to, and um, I think those should not be admitted given the court's ruling on her fMRI. Testimony in the objection we filed, I believe I noted each of those particular pages within Exhibit 33, which is her records okay. that need to be removed. Um, no, we'll stipulate to that. Okay. okay. We'll withdraw 33 from our list. Okay. So 33 is withdrawn. What's the next exhibit where there's an issue? Your Honor, 39 is not, uh, I think, uh, to be clear, Eric Christensen was deposed. It was over Zoom. Let's give you a copy. I've got... I guess I don't have. Your Honor, we have the actual easel that was used. 
during Barry Christensen's deposition, so it's not a photograph. It's the actual page that he, uh, yeah. Barry Christensen was directing this. Yes. Sure. To this is my copy. So we have that actual exhibit, Your Honor, or the actual easel, which was used behind me while I was questioning Eric Christensen. So that is Lawrence Bueller's handwriting. That's not. That's that not directed by Eric, Eric Christensen. Christensen. So uh, Eric Christensen is going to say that there's a far better document, which is this animation, that represents his testimony, and. Um, is the witness? Uh, well, I guess you could. Why don't you? Why don't you? Uh, why don't we hold 39 in abeyance to see if it gets admitted okay. through the witness? Confirmed by Eric Christensen in his deposition. That's the one we used. It was confirmed by Eric Christensen in his deposition. What? Uh, exhibit 39. He was uh, directing me to. I said, "Is this the point where you were at the moment of the crash?" And he said, "Yes." And I, I said, "Okay, I'll draw a circle." And he confirmed that the circle with his initials is what what he did. I guess I'll have to see what how the evidence comes out because him saying. Things said at a deposition don't necessarily mean they're going to be said here, and it's what's said here on the record that matters. So, forty-three is not one of the exhibits they want to admit. Only for illustrative purposes. I'll use it in closing argument. But there's a title on there that now appears that was not authorized by the court. Executive functioning has been put at the top. That's nowhere on the document that yeah, it is. That's the page before. It's in the last column the, to the right. Is this added to the? All we did was we took the middle out, like you su suggested. And, and added the words executive functioning. Were they added or were they part of the original? Yeah, uh, let me show you. <coughs> we have. Uh, Jody, can you ask the bailiff to let us know what all Your Honor, I have my copy, uh, which is kind of marked up, but executive function is on the far right side in very small type, but they've put a title on the entire thing. If, if I could approach Judge. What was the original exhibit Page number? 19 of Goldstein's uh, report. Okay. Come on in. Come on over. Let me show you this. There it is right there. I mean, I think it's fine for a closing argument. It's, it's just... Uh, a, t a tool to use during closing argument. Okay. So. Can he say at least I put the title on it? Well, it's here. It, it's in the. This is what we got. <coughs> right. Right. Well, Just clarify that 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 the words at the top are your heading, Mr. Sykes. Say again, please. Just clarify. I mean, the jury may remember that uh, that chart. So just say, well, I put these words up here so that it would well, be clear. It's from here, though. So this, the words under executive function are not these words. This is Harry's results are detailed. We, we took that out. It says Harry's responses. So we took that out. It's all out. I know, but I'm saying that the title isn't immediately before this document. It sounds like the judge says all, all, when he uses it, he has to say, I put this title. Okay. Is that okay? <coughs> That was my ruling. Thank you. Yes. Pardon? Yes. Your Honor, there's an outstanding order. Which we have a copy of if you're ready to move on to a new topic. Are there any other of the plaintiff's exhibits that there are any issues with? 1 through 40 or 44? Minus 33. 
So if referenced, if not referenced in the whole tri trial thus far, they shouldn't go in. So because they haven't rested, you'll have to you'll have to identify the ones that were not referenced then. So the court, okay, because it's been they've been moved for admission. I think it, I think it may be confusing to the jury if exhibits are, were haven't been referenced during the trial, and then all of a sudden they show up as exhibits. So right, I think it's a valid objection. I just need to know which ones you're identifying. Okay, and since they haven't rested, I can't answer that. Oh, okay, your honor, we'll just we'll take. You want to talk to it? Does counsel really want me to go through each medical record and authenticate that? No, but if an entire exhibit has not been referenced in this trial, I don't want it. And it sounds like the judge doesn't want it. What that means is that we have to waste court time going through each one and ask Terry, is this your record? Yes. Is this your record? Yes. I mean, I don't know why we can't stipulate to that. I don't either. I mean, either that or if, 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 you, if your proffer is Mr. Sanderson would, I mean, can you just have Mr. Sanderson click off all the, can you just go through them all real quickly with him? Can, but I mean, it just doesn't take 10 minutes. Yeah. Or could we do a lump sum, one through? I think you can do it lump sum, if you can. I mean, it's not really an authentication that's being asked for. It's just some reference to the jury as to what it, what it is. I mean, we agreed before the trial to not call witnesses and that everything is deemed authenticated that comes from the VA, et cetera. That's and I don't know why we're backtracking on that honorable stipulation at this point. I in the stand trial. by my honorable stipulation. I just want to be, Steve, I just need to be clear on what it is that you need well, to be the, done. For instance, uh, I'm echoing what the judge said, which it would be confusing to the jury if a r record is never uh, referenced in the trial and is suddenly in the jury room with them. Yes. The, the experts reviewed all of the medical records, Your Honor, and they've testified as to that. And that's what's contained in the exhibits. So they, they were referenced, they weren't referenced page by page or date by date, but they were given copies of all of the records. It's, they've testified to that, it's in the reports. I'll tell you what, Honor, Your Honor, because we, we do want to start on time. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it, as long as they do it for ours. Of course. That's fine. Okay. So one, plaintiffs one through 32, 34 through 40, and 40. Um, well, let me, let me just restate that. So plaintiffs one through 32 are received. Plaintiffs 34 through 38 are received. Plaintiffs 40 is received and plaintiffs 44 is received. So that excludes the Fong records, 33, and it excludes uh, the, the uh, exhibit 39, which, is, which may be introduced later. Does that sound correct? And uh, 43, I can only use it during... 43 is a demonstrative exhibit that you could use during closing. Portions of 33 and 34 yeah, the 33 is already out. They've, they've uh, withdrawn 33. Are there fMRI references in 34 also? I don't believe so. I mean, there may be references to the fact that Dr. Fong did an fMRI, but it doesn't have Dr. Fong's fMRI um, evaluation, I don't believe. Okay, so the court will receive plaintiffs 1 through 32, 34 through 38, 40 and 44 as exhibits. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. All right, turning now to this proposed order. Um, I haven't read the proposed order. Is there, an, is there an issue with the proposed order or an objection to it? On the animations? It's our understanding that the court directed us to wait until trial to see what the evidence shows, and then we can object just before they're admitted. The animations are admitted. 
but we do find them objectionable now, and we don't want to waive that objection and have them just pop up on the screen. So we're yeah, uh, that's true. The order. Let me take a look at the order real quickly. And if I may, Your Honor, I prepared it as I understand from, as I recall, from your instruction after the evidentiary hearing. Sure. I have a physical copy if you want one. No, I've got it here. Thank you. Are there any objections to the proposed order, um, which doesn't address the issues that you just raised, Mr. Bueller? In other words, they're not going to flash the animations up before they're admitted. There has to be a sponsoring witness. Call that being part of the decision. Page three, top four lines. Yeah, I, re I re listened to it this morning before we started, and I didn't hear that part in there. Oh, okay. In my well, oral then, ruling. Then that's my mistake. Yeah. And I, I'll probably add a little bit more. What I'll be adding is, um, if I can find my notes. He also specified in the hearing what the uh, witness, the defense would have to do, to, the sponsoring witness would have to testify before it would be admitted. So I, I may edit this. And it was more detailed than what this, this is what I would include something on these lines. Uh, there must be sufficient evidence to support the defense claim that an animation accurately reflects a witness testimony and it may include uncontested facts um, that yeah, but the ultimate test the court will apply is does the animation accurate, accurately reflect the witness's testimony so it doesn't have to it's not meant to prove what happened it's proved as a demonstrative of a witness's testimony Just mentioned, but it should be in the order. So I'll, I will I consider that. I'll take a look at it. But yeah, this, this I made some notes this morning. I went, went back and listened to the WebEx hearing on it. And, um, I will insert. Is the jury all assembled? Okay, the jury's not quite all assembled yet, so let's take a short recess while we wait for the jury to be completely assembled. I do have one more issue, but uh, it's not a big one. Okay, so we produced a poor quality screenshot of um, the text right after when one said I, that guy kind of hurt me, and we have a high quality now, and so. We'll give them a copy. Thank you. And then also, um, I'd like to have a jury instruction conference tomorrow. Um, I need you to tell me when, if it'd be better to have it at lunch or at the end of the day tomorrow. So think about that, talk amongst yourselves, and get back to me. Thank you.
you might need to deal with that jury instruction issue if they're coming out right now. Which jury instruction issue? Thank you. Sorry to be vague. With the newly disclosed comments section, if they're going to use that with Terry, then I would like the instruction read that this came through defense counsel. Your Honor, just to let me advise defense counsel of this and the clerk that we are going to call Craig Ramone for five minutes to do the confirmation of the comments, Exhibit 44. Okay. And can I see the stipulated statement, the instruction that the court will be giving the jury concerning Exhibit 44? We don't have that drafted or printed out, but it was the neutral statement that Norman mentioned. I need specific language if there's an agreement. Otherwise, I'll just do my own. Yeah. What you said orally, you know, 15 minutes ago was fine. What would you be requesting? What's in your filing? Well, I think Your Honor mentioned that you would keep it neutral and just mention. Should I consider your arguments, but I'll have to go through the language and make a decision. Right. So should we handwrite it? We won't be able to print something out since we last met, you know, 15 minutes ago. Well, he handed you the paragraph we want. Right. Same as what I've got here? Yeah, except for the last sentence. Well, the last part of the last sentence. We're previously unavailable to either party. I think the simplest way is just Exhibit 44 was found by a third party, and both parties are agreeing that this is an authentic copy of what was found. And then Craig Rohn, who we're going to call right now, will go through that and confirm his comments. We'll write it up in about three minutes if you want us to do that, Judge, if I can. I think I've got enough. I can probably craft something right here. And if you want to be heard, I'm willing to talk. I think I know all your arguments. Thank you. So I think what I'm going to do is I will read something on the fly, and I'm going to ask that the parties in counsel not embellish any of the facts concerning what I'm about to read to the jury. Okay? Ms. Rohn, do you agree? Okay. We're ready for the jury.
Good morning, members of the jury. I pray that your traveling in this morning was safe and uh, everyone got here okay. Um, the, the weather outside is still winter, I guess. Well, um, there is a new piece of evidence in this case. I'm going to tell you about that. <clears throat> a viewer that's been following this trial out of the courtroom and familiar with finding archived website links investigated the link referenced on Defendant's Exhibit 102. That's the Mr. Sanderson email to his daughters on the day of the accident. There's a, there's a link at the bottom of that page. Well, this viewer, through their efforts and expertise, through, through that, we now have a copy of what was contained in that link. And you will receive it. It is going to be an exhibit. It's Plaintiff's Exhibit 44 and Defendant's Exhibit 102. Plaintiff's Exhibit 44 and Defendant's Exhibit 102. And the parties do agree that this new exhibit is authentic. Plaintiff, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Plaintiff Terry Sanderson calls uh, re or recalls Craig Ramon. Mr. Ramon, you'll need to be sworn in again as a witness. It's a new day. Right up here, sir. Uh, hello. Um, do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give in the matter before the court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Ramon. Hey, good morning. Uh, I've handed you uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 44. Have you had a chance to review that before? Yes. And this uh, is are the comments and postings on uh, meetup meetup.com. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, this was the uh, website that you used to meet up with the other skiers on the day of the crash, correct? Yes. And uh, first I'd like to turn you to page two of Exhibit 44, Plaintiff's Exhibit 44. And on the lower left, you see the color photograph of the woman smiling? Yes. Is that the ski patroller? that uh, you met on the day of the crash? I'm, 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 I'm guessing that it is. Okay. Do you have it on page two? Uh, oh, yes, that's, yes, I believe that's her. The, that's Whitney Smith that you oh, met that day? Yes. Show it. Oh, show it, sorry. You see on the lower left of uh, exhibit uh, 44, page 2? Yes. Okay. And you made a few postings on, on this meetup.com website, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm going to read some of the, your postings on that day, and uh, so I'm going to reference some of the pages. Could you turn to page four of nine? The page numbers are on the bottom right. So, do you see page four of nine? Four yeah, yes. Nine. Okay. first comment on uh, page four I'm just going to read it to you and ask you to confirm that this is what you uh, posted um, but before we start that you'll see it says 
2,588 days ago. Yes, I see that. And this was probably before the ski crash, uh, but on the same day, correct? It's, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it was probably, um, it was, it was right around, oh, uh, oh which, which one you're talking about, I'm sorry. The uh, one in the middle of the page. Um, I'll just, yeah, just give Deer Valley your pass. Yes, that's, okay, so that's true. You, you, you wrote or typed in that day. Just give Deer Valley your pass. They have your photo. It will be a great day. I will be on the hill at 9.30. That's uh, your first posting that day, you believe? Uh, yes. Okay, and then at the bottom of the page four, you have another post. Well, maybe, um, well, let's see. I guess that one's uh, a different one, maybe. Let's see. Well, maybe that's a different day. Uh, I'm going to move to the, the next one. The uh, Let's go to page. Uh, six of nine. Can you go there? Okay, I'm going to read just what we, uh, you typed in there in the middle. Um, it says, Scott, Terry was not doing the man thing. Terry had a bad hit to the head. You do not have the ski patrol take you down the hill if you have a pain in your ass. Is that what you typed that day? Yes, it is. This was the day of the crash. Uh, this was a few days after. Okay. Then at the bottom of that, page six, and we're gonna continue to seven. It has your name, and then it continues on to page seven. I'm going to read you what uh, page 7 says. Scott, the thing you did not see was Terry was knocked out cold. Bad hit to the head. Not, sh not too sure if Terry has broken ribs. I did see the hit. Terry did not know his name. I asked Terry what his name was, and he did not know. Scott, it scared the hell out of me. Is, is that what you talked about? True. And that was on or around the uh, day of the crash, or after the crash? That was a little bit after, a few days after the crash. Okay. <clears throat> then at the bottom of page 7, you have another comment. Do you see that? Yeah, yes, I do. And uh, you typed, Scott, thanks for the humor. I got it when you were trying to make light of the whole thing. You guys did not see what I did see. No need to say you're sorry. You typed that, correct? Yes, I did. Then the final page, page eight of nine. And under your name it says, you cannot make this up. Gwyneth took out Terry last week. Last Saturday, her son broke his arm skiing at Park City. Gwyneth was staying at the Montage. She took her plane out of Million Air Airport. I wish I did know so many people. What makes me mad is that Gwyneth took out Terry and just took off. Is that what you typed that? Yes, is it that is. That was the week after the crash? Yes, it is. Okay, and uh, I, except for the uh, you know, irrelevant stuff at the end on page nine, uh, that's all I have. Terry T in Exhibit 44, plaintiff's exhibit. Terry T is mentioned. Do you remember? Um, I'm not sure who Barry T is.
Could it be Terry Sanderson? Yeah. Um, Why don't you look at the very T comments and see if it. Re re question right now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and ask your next question. Yeah. Um, Craig, would you go to page two of this exhibit 44? Okay. On the left, it says Very T, event organizer. Do you yes. see that? Yes, I do. And also, two over, it says Kurt L, event organizer four shared groups. You see that? Yes, I do. Was Kurt L. at the uh, meetup group at Deer Valley on the day of the crash? Yeah, Kurt was the one who organized that day. Okay. Go, go back to the left and uh, look at Very T. Are you able to recognize the photo um, above it, Very T? It looks like, looks like Terry, and Terry was the one who organized the, uh, the, the meetup groups up at Alta. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Mr. Bueller. Mr. Egan? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Ramon, good to see you again. I have a couple questions from the defense. Um, so the first would be, at the start of this page, and I haven't used this uh, Elmo projector before, so give me a second. Do you see? Do you see that that uh, uh, on page two? Got it. Thank you. I have to press focus. Okay, there you are. So you see that there's some photos there at the bottom of the page. Yes. And do you recognize the the photo there of the ski patroller? Yes. And was that Whitney Smith? I believe so. The ski patroller who responded to Mr. Sanderson on the hill. Yes. And uh, and cared for him during the urgent care or the first aid clinic visit that he had there on the ski ski hill. Yes. And uh, I do not see any videos there. W were there any, to your memory, GoPro or other videos posted on this web page? No. And then. Um, and, and I believe uh, you're unaware of any GoPro footage at all. Is that correct? Yes. And then if you go to page, let's match it up with mine here, page 7. Um, actually, your name is cut off at the top there. So if you look back at page 6. Can you see that it shows your name and then goes on to page seven where there's at the very top there a note that you wrote. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And in that note, you write, Terry did not know his name. I asked Terry what his name was and he did not know. But I believe you've told the jury last week that he did remember his name. It was, he had to really think hard about it. It took like four or five seconds for him to to remember his name. But that's not what you wrote here. You wrote here, Terry did not know his name. When I first asked him, he, he didn't know his name. He had to really think about it. I asked Terry what his name was, and he did not know. Yeah, he, he, when I asked him, he, he didn't, didn't know his name, and then he, he just took some time to kind of just think about it, and then he, you know, after about four or five seconds, he just said, 
very. Okay. So what you wrote here is not what you told the jury last week. Is that fair to say? Um, could you please repeat that? Just uh, he, here in your note, you do not say that he did later remember his name. You just say he didn't remember it all. And as I understand it, that was different than what you told the jury last re week. Is that correct? Yes. When I when I when I was when I basically was was talking about about this, I didn't go into much detail. You know, on on this, I was just making a point that he was having a hard time knowing what his name was. Okay. So let's go to this last page. Page. Well, I guess. There's a kind of blank page at the end, but page eight, the last page with your comments on it. Do you see up there at the top another one of your comments? Uh, can you just expand that? Okay. Yeah, that is hard to see. I'm learning old technology. I appreciate this. Thank you. Okay, so um, in this comment that uh, you wrote, correct, this, this top comment is yours, Mr. Ramon? Yes, it is. Okay, and in this comment you wrote, Gwyneth took out Terry last week. Last Saturday, her son broke his arm skiing at Park City. How did you know that? There's a lady I know that works at Alta, An or, I mean, works at Snowbird and Deer Valley. She works up at the Montage, or Deer Valley. And, um, and she told me. Okay. And then Gwyneth was staying at the montage. How did you know that? That's what she told me. And why were you talking to her about Gwyneth? Uh, she just, she, she knew what happened, and then she told me that what happened. Sorry, she, that's she, not she, clear to me. So she, she, she knew she, what happened? She, she, she knew that, uh, that Gwyneth took out, took out Terry, and so then when I saw her, she told me what, what happened. I didn't ask her about it. She just told me what, that, that that's what happened. Well, she wasn't there at the collision, right? No, she just worked up, up at the hotel. So how would she have any knowledge of it? I have no idea. She took her plane out of Millionaire Airport. How did you know about Miss Gwyneth, or Miss Paltrow's travels? Uh, one of my best friends, he works at a Millionaire. And that's where a lot of the, the private jets, the charter jets, that's where they fly into that, that part of the airport. It sounds to me like you were talking to a lot of people about Gwyneth Paltrow during this time. Is that correct? No, my best, my best friend, he knew what happened, and he's the one who told me. So you didn't tell these people what happened, even though you were the one at the collision site? Yeah, I, I told my friend what happened, yes. OK. So you were telling people about this this accident. Yes, I've told people about it. And then they were telling you things they knew about Miss Paltrow, that at least they claimed to know about Miss Paltrow? Yes. But they could be mistaken, is that correct? Yes. So if Miss Paltrow's son didn't in fact break his arm while skiing, you wouldn't dispute that, you wouldn't have any Re way to dispute that, correct? I have no idea. I, that's just what I was told. Um, let me go back. I just have, I think, one more question for you. So if you were to look at page, let's go to page 7. Those comments that I believe you've connected to Terry Sanderson, uh, those ones in the middle of the page, you, you can read them um, to yourself. But my question is, given that you've described him as being knocked out cold in other comments here, um, I, I wanted to ask you whether you found Terry to be articulate in his posts and comments on this page uh, following his injury. 
Sustained as to vagueness, if you could point out something. Okay. So um, maybe it's better to go. The, these are kind of difficult because they don't have dates on each comment, correct? They just show, for example, uh, let's go to this one. This one at the bottom, you see on Very Terry's uh, or Very T's comment, it says 2,584 days ago, correct? Yes, I see that. Okay, and. James, that's from Saturday, by the way. Okay, yeah, I don't know that. So I'm asking Mr. Ramon, do, do you know when these comments were made? Is this on the day of the accident when he says you orga organized a perfect day? I don't see where it says you organized a perfect I don't see where it's where does it say that, that you organized a perfect day? Uh, it's the on page six, the, th the third comment down. Approach, please. Mr. Ramon, this comment I'm pointing to you, uh, pointing you to on page six, says it's under very T. Yes, Kurt, you organized a perfect day uh, for skiing. Thank you. That's true, Scott. I still have my wheels. It was nice to get to know you a bit today. Do you know whether that was written on the day of the accident? I'm not sure if it was or not. Would it surprise you that... Uh, Mr. Sanderson was writing articulate notes like this after being knocked out and unconscious for two minutes? Uh, it doesn't sound that articulate to me, but... Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Mr. Bueller? Fred, can you look at uh, page six again? Okay. <clears throat> and in the middle under very T, uh, do you see that where it says, yes, Kurt, you organized a perfect day? Yes, I do. And then um, look at the number of days it is. Is it 2,584? Yes, it is. And then your comment below that. It says 2,583 days ago. Yes. So those comments were made on different days. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any follow-up, Mr. Egan? Okay. You may step down, Mr. Ramon. Okay, thank you. You still remain subject to the orders of the court until the case is over or you're released. So thank you. Thank you. What should I do with this? Leave it right there. 
Plan, if you may call your next witness. Thank you for coming. Plan is called. Mr. Terry Sanderson. Swear that the, that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do, absolutely. Thank you. Have a seat. Good morning, sir. Comfortable and speak into the mic, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Could you state and spell your name for the record, please? Yes. My name is uh, Terry, T E R R Y, Howard, H O W A R D, Sanderson, S A N D E R S O N. Thank you. Now, Terry, this is the fifth day of trial. We started last Tuesday. Um, you haven't. You weren't here much last week, were you? Not at all. In the court, in the courtroom, were you in the courthouse? Yes, definitely. Terry, did you want to be here the last four days, last week, inside the courtroom? I love spending time with my daughters and have them hear what they had to say, but in this case, I didn't want to be here because I wanted them to speak totally freely and without the discomfort of being in my presence if they had something to say. Is that why you weren't here? Absolutely, yes. We're going to cut to the chase on a lot of things because I made counsel a promise that I would have you in less than an hour. Wow. And so we're, I'm going to be true to my word here. Um, it's 10 o'clock. I will have, we'll, we'll be done before 11. Okay. I want to talk about skiing. Tell the jury about your ski experience. What type of skier were you? At that time, or do you want some background? I, we don't need a whole lot of background. Okay. Back in 2016, what type of skier were you? I was advanced and immediate. There was no places I would go except um, serious bumps, um, narrow, narrow little gulches, and um, um, I didn't do any, any big jumps. So uh, other than that, I would go just about anywhere. Okay. How often would you ski? Two to three times per week. Okay. For how many years? Well, I started... 37 years ago, it was a winter sport for my family. We lived at high elevation. Okay. And in all of your years, other than the ski collision with Ms. Paltrow, have you ever been in another ski accident? 
Never. Never. Have you ever skied with the ski patrol? As a matter of fact, I had the good fortune. I learned to ski from a family that owned a ski resort. They were, they were relation. And they would come out to Snowbird and they were, I think, it was a whole family run operation with eight children and so they, they were ski patrollers and they were instructors. And I had the very best of company every winter for a week when the kids were out of school. And then I had the good fortune of having a Lions Club friend, Scott, who's still a dear friend, that lives up in Spokane, and he was a ski patroller for Targi. And he said, Terry, come up with me, you know, on this weekend. And, and I said, I'll slow you down. And he said, you know what, uh, just follow me and do what I do. And that's what I did. And I had the good fortune of spending a lot of time with Scott and seeing and observing what ski patrols do and how they calm people down and reassure them they're going to be okay. So. I really appreciated that and okay. experience. So it sounds like you've skied at Snowbird, skied at Targi. Had you ever skied at Deer Valley on the day of the collision? No, the, no. That was your first time ever skiing it at Deer was, Valley? It was, it was. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about that day. A um, couple of preliminary things. I, I asked Miss Paltrow on Friday how tall she was. How tall are you? I. I think I'm now 5'5". Five, five. Okay. And what was your weight at the time of the, the collision? Well, in the VA, you don't take anything off. You, whatever you walk in with, your coats, heavy coats in wintertime, boots, um, wallets. I phone. give that excuse to when I say <laughs> <laughs> how, so, how, how much did you weigh about? Fully dressed. I was or undressed, probably 63, 62 pounds. 163, 162. Okay. All right. So, we've, the, the jury's heard about meetup groups. What is a meetup group? A meetup group was just a lifesaver for me being new to this area. Um, hard to accumulate friends. And um, so when a fellow that I was on a hike with, a, a new fellow, said, have you heard of meetup? And I hadn't. So he says, look it up and sign up. And I did, and it was a wonderful organization of groups of people where you had a shared interest, uh, whether it was dancing or concerts or skiing. And so I signed up and joined some groups and it was really a life changer. Okay, so my understanding is the day of this ski collision, you were with kind of a group of people in the meetup group, is that fair? That's right. All right. Did the group have a plan? I mean, were you the organizer of that meetup group that day? No, I was not. I asked Kurt to take that over because I planned on being gone that day, and Kirk organized that. Okay. It sounds like, obviously, you weren't gone that day. You ended up being able to make it. I came back a little early from wherever I was and, and just said, oh, I'm, I'm going to go ski today. And um, I happened to see on the list that day also was a lady that I had met when I first moved here, and she happened to be a ski instructor at Canyons, and but she had been at Deer Valley as well. And so I called and said, Debbie, I got, I'm gonna go. I, I'll, I'll pick you up. So I picked her up at Kimball Junction on the way and went there with her and dropped her off with the skis. And we met the group and I asked Kirk if it'd be okay if she let our group out because she's very familiar with Deer Valley. And so um, she said yes and gave us the rules of the road. Would you like to hear that? So the meetup group, you guys kind of ski all together. Ish. Well, and this skiing meetup group is unusual. It's like herding cats. You've got those of just want to go, and, and, and they kind of know who one another is, and so they they go ahead and, and group up, and, and sometimes I wind up skiing with the uh, beginners and getting them started and making them comfortable. And uh, so they don't stay together well. We meet, usually we'll say, let's meet at Alps at 1.30, and so that's what we do. Okay, so you mentioned we set forth the rules of the road for that day. What were the rules of the road that day? Well, the only rules of the road, we are pretty familiar with the rules of the road, so uh, we don't go over that at the time, but Debbie just said, we're going to start down, band down Bandana because that's how we'll get to the Blacks, a really good skiing, so our group knew that's where we're headed. And she said, whatever you do on Bandana, do not go down the middle of the run. Why it's not? packed and crowded with people. She said, go down the edges. She said, it'll be clear. And so when I came over the edge of the hill, 
there were heads bobbing in the middle. It was just compacted with little heads and big tall heads and, and I just diagonaled. I went straight over to the right edge of that run. And is that where you stayed uh, prior to the collision? I did. I stayed there the whole time because and it was wide open. So you were over to the right side to avoid the people. Did it have anything to do with your vision? There's been a lot of discussion about your, your right eye problem. Yes. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But skiing on the right side of the, the, uh, the run, did that have anything to do with your right eye? Yeah, maybe that's one of the things, yes. Okay. We'll talk about your vision in just a couple minutes, but sure. I want to focus on the collision right now. Craig Ramon, he just testified. Oh, yes. You saw did. him. He, he also testified last week. How well did you know Craig at the time um, back Febu February 2016? Um, he was one of maybe an average of 15 people, 10 or 15 people that would come, so I shared his company. Uh, during those times and um, I knew him only as being an amazing skier strong strong skier and and knew that and I appreciated the fact he tended to like to follow the group and uh, be behind as the protector because he brought a lady that was a person I knew that was his neighbor so he would bring her up and ski behind her as a protector so good guy good guy did you guys hang out a lot before this you know, collision um, of course, at lunch, we spent time together, and there may be an, a couple of other occasions where we met with him, but usually there was somebody else there um, along with us. Okay. So not I don't remember being exclusive with him. All right. So, Terry, take the jury through what happened in this ski collision. Take it from, say, getting off of the lift. Yes, happy to do that. Um, it was really a very nice day for skiing and I was really looking forward to it. And of course, Tirelli has amazing groomed runs. Found that out right away. And um, so, um, I'm starting from the, when I get off? When, when you got off of the ski lift. Gotcha. So, I was on a chair with um, probably four people. I think uh, Joanne, Debbie, um, Craig and there could have been another person besides myself and we had already met and discussed going down the right side of that run or going down the sides and so I came over the top of the hill and saw that and headed for the right side and I'll pick it up there and everyone just kind of dispersed some more to the right and more to the left and I remember looking and seeing no one and there generally beginner runs people are f afraid of the off piste of the off groomers and so they stay away from that area where the pile of snow is piled up and uh, off piste can be a rough ride if you have to divert and run out in there some skiers can't make it through there easy it's a lot of bumps so I start I went right down the run and started just making nice soft turns and um, staying within that boundary it could have been as much as five yards wide but it might have been more like five or six feet. I don't, can't, ima can't imagine, I can't remember. Lots of room. And so I'm just skiing easy and paying attention and um, all of a sudden in front of me is two big signs. I've never seen that big of slow down signs. It seemed like they were four by eight, like a four by eight sheet of plywood size high with great big letters, slow down. I went, whoa. And I'm looking around, and the crowd's about the same as me, and speed-wise. So, so I just, you pay attention to the sign? I did. Okay. And I backed off of whatever I was doing. And then another big sign, like 10 feet away, the same eight by 4 by 8 sheet up there. Big letters. Well, they're serious. Must be lots of merging trails down here. So um, I just backed off. And again, the skiers were on my left. We were all about the same speed. And um, um, I could see down where the edge of the run went, it curved around, a tree line came out a little bit, and it little run came, turned, curled around. And I could see about half of the, I don't know if it's a much montage or the empire, could about half of that beautiful building. And, and um, I, it was wide open. There was nothing, nothing in front of me. 
And so um, I came around that corner and it was, it takes my breath away to think I, this is hard because I, I don't like going through this scene. I, I just remember everything was great and then I heard something I've never heard at a ski resort and that was a blood curdling scream. Just, I can't do it. It was, and then, boom. And it was like somebody was out of control and gonna hit a tree and was gonna die. And that's what I had until I was hit. That's what was going on in your mind. Over overruled. That's what's going on in, in your mind when you hear that scream. At, that was instantaneous. Oh my gosh, somebody's out of control. And they're really seriously out of control. Not time for a hockey stop. I didn't go think about that, but most people could avoid that, I think. The good skiers. That's okay. And, I, and I'll move on. Okay. So, so you he. You... All right, I think he's overruled. He's overruled. Okay, thank you. So you hear this scream. Yes. What happens next? You know, I got hit in my back so hard, and it, I, I'm right at my shoulder blades, and it felt like, and was perfectly centered, and the, the fists and the poles were right there at the bottom of my shoulder blades. Serious, serious smack. Never been hit that hard, and I'm flying. I'm absolutely flying. Now, you're not airborne. Well, it. All I saw was a whole lot of snow, and I didn't see the sky. But I was flying in that sense. I had no control. And I remember this thinking, okay, you really got to hang on. And then I thought about the crowd on the left, and I thought, I don't know who's wanted over there, and I do not want to get them mixed up in here. And I've heard, you know, um, that maybe that's not decided about how my ribs really got hurt. I absolutely lurched with what little I could off of my skis a little bit more to the right to keep, to make sure nobody over here got involved on my left side. And then it was like the ground's coming up, nobody in front of me, just me going to the ground and you're falling far further than 90 degrees like you'd fall on a floor. You, you, you got that extra and so it's quite a ways to hit the ground. and. I just said, okay, you got to protect your face, you know, and your head, and that's the last thing I remember. It didn't happen. I did glance over and saw, just just out of the corner of my eye, I could see, not glance over, but I could see somebody going by, and I'm going, okay, they're, they're safe. Last thing I remember, everything's black. Did black. the person who struck you land on top of you? I wouldn't know that. I absolutely would not know that. I was just surprised I had no upper body strength enough to be able to catch myself. I had no idea. And she... Do you remember hitting your head on the ground? No, that part, no, nope, that's all gone. I just remember it, my arms collapsing and that's the last thing I remember. What's the next thing you remember? I'm getting an adrenaline rush here, I guess, living this again. Just being here in present too. Uh, and let me just stop you really quick. You said you're getting an adrenaline rush. Is this something that you enjoy? Uh, adrenaline rush? Not this no. kind. <laughs> yeah. Not now. Okay. Okay. All right. So what's the first thing that you remember? Or the next thing that you remember after well, you're yes. on the ground? Um, the first remember is everything is still black, like I'm unconscious. And, but it's like my subconscious is going into protection mode, like, you better pay attention here and listen to what's being said to you. And all I could recognize was that someone was really angry at me. And it was a man, and it didn't come out clear in the beginning. I couldn't really hear what he was saying, but I just knew he was mad, and he was right, right above me, right close to me. And I'm feeling a little afraid, and I tried to move, and I could not move a limb. I couldn't move my head. I couldn't move my body. Nothing was responding. Just this message I was getting. And the next thing, 
it became, became a little more clear and I heard him say, do you realize, you realize that you were skiing under the rules, you hit somebody, you hurt somebody. And it just insistent that I was the bad guy. And that's why I said, this has got to be a husband or boyfriend It's really mad at me. And I sound did, like a big... Did you know who he was? I had no idea. No idea. Okay. It was just a very angry person trying to um, bully me into believing something that I didn't think could happen was I heard a woman's voice, right? Again, couldn't move. And about the third time he went through that, and it's getting louder, and it's, I started to understand what he was saying, and he was really insistent that I was doing something wrong and hit somebody. And I remember in desperation, because I couldn't move anything, I tried to, I couldn't fight, I couldn't flight. Who's, who's going to try? And I tried moving something, and I could move my skis a little bit. I could just feel, just pull up my knee, I could just slide my skis a little bit. And, and, and that's an important point. My skis are still on. They're still on. And I'm, I'm thinking I gotta placate this guy. He's really mad. If he decided he wanted to jump on me right now, I, he could finish me off. I was, so I remember, I remember saying, Okay, now you're, you're, Twice. Whisper, you're whispering. I know that, I am, because maybe, that's what I heard. Nothing was coming out. My lips were moving. My tongue was moving. There was nothing coming out of my mouth, and my heart rate went up again. Okay. okay? It looked like what you were mouthing was, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. And, and I was just going, I can't believe it. I thought, try again. I'm sorry. Nothing was coming out. And to me, I heard nothing. When you kind of mumbled, whispered, whatever you want to call it, I'm sorry, was that you apologizing for causing the accident? No, absolutely not. I was trying to placate this man in the only defensive manner that I could. Okay. You've talked about the man who was, who was yelling at you. Ms. Paltrow last week talked about and admitted that she was kind of cussing you out as well. Do you remember any conversation that you had or anything that she said to you? Absolutely not. There was one voice that my brain was focused on Thank God, I guess, uh, and and that was self-protection, I guess. I only heard a male voice, a mad, angry male voice. I heard nothing. Maybe that happened before I came to that point in consciousness. Were you still on the ground at this time? Still on the ground, absolutely, face down okay. on how the did, ground. How did you end up getting up? Well, that's a story too, but um, basically um, I heard Craig saying, Terry, are you okay? Now this is Craig Ramone. Well, at that point, I didn't identify his voice. I, you know, I just things were a little strange yet, and and I heard Terry, are you okay? And um, and about the third time it hit me, somebody wants to is here to help me. I didn't at that point, except an angry man was there, and I I said, oh my gosh, and I went through. And I, I looked up and I could see Craig standing there above me, eight or 10 feet. And on his immediate left, my right, was a man in an all green outfit and with a helmet on and ski goggles and, you know, looked good. And, um, and I thought, oh, he's here to help me, right? He looks like he's from Deer Valley. And so um, I, I was going through the things answering his question about that with my thoughts now back to my what my injuries I'm Craig is saying are you okay and I said oh my my ribs are so sore there's just this really deep throbbing purple pain here and and then I said um, my vision is swimming with sparks and they were unusual sparks I'm going is that my retina is that my eyes and it wasn't a retinal detachment a retinal hole or anything and I'm going, that's my brain. I'm thinking, those sparks on my brain. And all this time you're still on the ground? I'm still, I'm actually, yeah, the next point is that after I tell me about my ears going, 
I'm, my ears are buzzing. Oh, and my, I said my brain is like it's on Novocaine. And, and then I realized, oh, I'm not seeing, oh, I, you know what, I missed a spot. And that's where I looked up and couldn't see them and got frightened about that. And I realized, going, oh my, what's going on? And then I went like this and go, oh, I was happy, I could see. So I missed that part. That happened before I started telling what all is wrong with me, answering his question. And then Craig said to me, as I remember, of course, I'm, my brains are a little bit stretched out of place. And, and I, I, re, I remember um, him saying, do you know who you are? And what I thought I said was, oh my gosh, I can feel this pathway in my brain. It's going around and trying to figure out who I am. And yes, I know I'm Terry. And then he said, um, do you know where you are? And I said, I know I'm skiing, but I don't know where I am. And that's when the man in green took off. He was, I was kind of noticing that he really wasn't interested in what I had to say. He wasn't asking questions. He was standing there rather stoically, head not moving, goggles on, just resting on his poles and his skis and was sort of disinterested. But when he skied off, my heart sank because I really thought he was the one person that was there to help me. And, and I, I, I'm laying on the ground with my head downhill and I couldn't see where he went so I was really Terry how did you get up the question is how I got up and that might have been the question in the beginning but That's right how did you get up you know I realized that I was getting cold and um, snow was packed in around me I was starting to get a little shivery uh, uh, maybe from a little shockish maybe and and I started, I gotta go, I gotta get my skis downhill. And I started sliding my skis around and my legs around. I think Craig must have been shell-shocked about this guy leaving too, I don't know but what he thought. But I remember getting my skis around and it's so painful every time you have to contract your... Terry. Thank you. How did you get up? Thank you, that is one of my habits, I just focus. After I got halfway around, a man showed up in front of me and I thought he came from the right and I don't remember if he said one word to me he just reached down and grabbed me and jerked me up on my feet which I was not ready to be up on my feet my head's swimming I'm in pain I'm worried about falling down again and breaking a rib puncturing along he gets me up and I'm on the edge of the run so it's bumpy it's hard to get my skis under me and I'm stomping down the snow and trying to get them in a spot and got my got my poles wedged in and I think I've got it in stability and he's gone and this time I could see him I could watch him go all the way down the hill and I'm up I'm standing up with am I feeling safe no people are going by you know and I'm thinking Man, I do not want to get hit again my understanding is that you and Craig tried to ski down a little ways, but then didn't quite make it too far. Is that accurate? Yeah, he said, you think you can ski? And I'm thinking, if I, the option is getting left up here, I will try anything. I got to get off of here. So yes, uh, he said, follow me. And I did. And I don't know how I was skiing. I don't think I was edging. I think I was probably snow plowing. And he finally turned around and said, Terry, Terry, stop. You've forgotten how to ski. He, and of course, it was just, we were trapped. And he said, I got to find help. Your Honor, there is some hearsay here. Eventually, Craig got help, yes? Yeah, he said, I got to find help. And so he disappeared. And I just put my head down and prayed that I wouldn't get smacked into again. I felt pretty vulnerable. And he disappeared. What happened when help arrived? You know, um, Whitney um, showed up, and I was so grateful to see someone. And now, is I, that Whitney Smith? Yes, I, that's her name. Mm -hmm. And the jury has seen pictures, and we're going to put another picture up in just a couple minutes. Is she the one in a, in a red jacket? 
that there's a picture of in this case? Do you know? Yes, as a matter of yes, that's okay. her. Mm -hmm. All right. So did she take you down on the, tr the toboggan, or how did you get down? She did. Um, um, she said, um, are, you, are you okay kind of thing, and I don't know, not so good. I don't remember the conversation. It was a little easy stuff. And so I um, got in, and I remember Whitney saying to me, now, you got to remember these things because I'm going to ask you again later. And she told me that she was from Michigan, moved five years before, uh, and had started on the ski patrol here five years before. She loved her job. Her name was Whitney, and that she had a horse named Titan that she wore in the years off. So she told me to remember those things. I'm going, this is a brain test. She's wanting to check if my brain's okay. And from that point on, I quit worrying about myself. I quit worrying about my injuries. It was just like, I'm going to remember this. I do not want to have any brain injuries. And I locked onto that and, and nothing else. And later on, she did ask me, and I could repeat it back to her exactly as she told me. And uh, oh, as she won the women's downhill in the ski patrol of women's competition. Sounds like you still remember some of I, these details. It just, I was so determined to hang on to that fact, those facts, yes. All right. Once you got down, what type of medical attention did you receive? Still at the ski resort. Yeah, well, Whitney is not a paramedic. She's not an EMT. Um, I, I didn't really expect her to have advanced knowledge about neurological testing and pupil testing and cranial nerve testing. She did. She did a great job of doing exactly what she's supposed to do just to be at that triage level to decide what kind of care I needed. Okay, so what type of care did you get? What type of medical treatment did you get oh, no when medical. you got down to the bottom? No medical treatment. Okay. Am I missing something? Did, did you get checked out at the Instacare or anybody? Oh, after, after yes. we left there. Yes, um, I asked Debbie, I said, where can I go and get checked? And, see what they say. And she said, well, let's stop at the Instacare on the way, it's on the way. So I'd never been there before, but that's where we stopped and went in there. Okay. All right. So you got checked out. When did you learn that it was Gwyneth Paltrow that you were in the collision with? It was, it was brought up, I think, that the, the people that came in uh, to the room to check on me that were part of my group would they check in and check out once and and um, which is what I tell them go ski and go enjoy yourself and um, and so um, it, it came up and it probably was Craig who said I heard him say it was going to Paul Joe and to me it's like I'm not into celebrity worship so um, I didn't care at that point did you think it was cool to collide with a celebrity? Absolutely not. That is not who I am, no. Did you ever write that? Ever tell anybody that? I don't think it came out in those words, but I, I don't remember that. But I, I think I was trying to communicate to my kids, and the reason was because I got calls from friends that knew my kids that heard I got crushed on, at the ski resort. And so I... I I thought I gotta, I gotta let my kids know I'm okay. That was my main point. I don't want them to worry about me. I'm okay, and so I just, I started it out, and May said, "I'm famous" or something. Okay, and we're gonna pull that out. Could you pull up Thank you. Exhibit 111, please? Yes, Defense Exhibit 111. We're gonna call it the "I'm famous" email. <laughs> Sometimes old technology like the Elmo works better than the new technology, doesn't it?
plug it in? Oh, we're gonna plug it in. Yeah. All right. And Terry, you could come down if you need to. Or Does it show on your screen there? Um, yeah, but I'm not the B&I doctor. I'm not wearing fashion because I broke the pair of glasses I bought and couldn't find the old pair, so now I'm... Okay. All right, so I want to go through this. Um, Defense Exhibit 111. Do you see, first of all, there are two posts. The first looks like... On the bottom is the first at uh, 8 o'clock p.m., yeah. and then the, the response was at 9.32 p.m. Do you see that? I do. All right. The message reads, and I'm just, just tell me if I read it right, from you to Jenny, Polly, and Shay. Those are your three daughters? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Okay. And the subject said, I'm famous. Do you see that? I do. Why did you write, I'm famous? You know, again, my head was scrambled. All I was trying to do is desperately communicate with my kids before they heard from somebody else I got crushed. So um, I didn't pick my words well, um, not at all how I felt. And I really was trying to add a little levity to a serious situation and it, it backfired. Little did I know that this is where to be. Um, so you write, I'm famous. And then here's what happened from my friend and eyewitness. And then there's the link. The link. The link. We now know what the link shows. Okay, sorry, I thought you were going to the GoPro. I'll withdraw my comment. I'm just talking about the link. Yes. Okay, so we now know what the link is. Yes. Correct? The link is? You'll get a clear picture. It's the picture of Whitney Smith. Oh, it's right there. Fantastic. Thank okay. you. It's that. And then that leads to later comments back and forth between you and Craig. Yes. In that, under that picture, can you read what it says? Um, yes. Um, Whitney kept me entertained while probing you me. You want to speak in the mic? Oh, yes. Um, Whitney kept me entertained while probing me with questions to evaluate my senses. A dedicated outdoor person and horse lover from Michigan. She also took me down in the toboggan by herself and won the DV Women's Downhill Race Contest. A sweetheart. I was grateful for her. Are those the things, first of all, did you write that under her picture? You know, I don't know what time it was added. Carlene was hurrying back from St. George, and depending, I don't know, um, she helped me a lot um, verbalize things because things weren't making sense at all in all right. communication, and she may have helped and participated in that. I don't know. Those details, are those the details that Whitney wanted you to memorize as you were taking down the toboggan? Yep. All right, can you go back up to the emails? All right, so you send that out to your three daughters. I yes? did, yes. Okay. And Shay, who testified last week, she responded to you with the top post, correct? Yes. All right, can you read what it says? I can. Actually, let's put the subject, read what the subject says. It says, I'm famous at what cost, question mark. Do you know why she wrote that? <laughs> well, that it, I, do, do you I, know? I think she may have called me, did she, um, right after this? And, um, and so. Speculation. Right. Sustained. Do you remember? Um, I'm pretty certain that she checked in on me and made a phone call 
and um, what um, what did do you remember what you told her during the phone call? Yeah, I had a chance to talk about my symptoms exactly. I think, and and that I I said I said you know as many people that were on that slope that day, maybe a couple hundred within that vicinity. There has to be a, a GoPro um, picture or video. If it's a helmet mount, they're going to look over just like Craig did, right? And they're going to go catch it. They hear a holler, they're going to catch it. I'm going, I just know there's one out there. We've got to find that. That is the evidence we need. And um, so, Terry? She misinterpreted. Did you have a GoPro? Absolutely. I do have one, yes, but I did not have it on that day. Do you know of anybody in your ski group that had a GoPro? No. Have you ever seen a GoPro video of this accident? Absolutely not. No. I would have loved to have it. It was what we needed. All right. Okay. We can take that off. Thank you. Let's talk about your injuries. What injuries, to your understanding, did you sustain in this collision? At this point? Right now. Right what, now. What, at, your understanding as to what, what happened, happened to Terry in this collision? At this point, I know that I had at least at least four broken ribs. Um, I sus sustained a concussion, um, and um, that's the two main factors, I think, and then later on I had some right leg and still do, right leg and anomalies, movement, it just has its own idea and thinking where it needs to be, opposed to what I'm thinking. Okay. Let's talk about how your ribs, how your brain injury, how that has affected you, okay? Have things in your life changed? I'm like living another life now. Okay. And let's focus on, we'll kind of go step by step, different, different things. Physical wise, how, how have you changed physically since the accident? Well, I can't ski anymore. I was told that if I did and had another crash, that I could wind up full time, full time in a nursing home. The odds of that's very high. So and, no more skiing. Well, and I, I tried, I tried not to go back, and, and I did ski a few more times by myself just to see if I still could. I had this ungodly-looking fluorescent red outfit I bought, a MIPS helmet to protect my brain better, and I thought I can do this. I really, this is my love and joy. I meet friends, I make friends, I stay with them the whole year. They're, it's a year-round activity. And it's a life, lifelong activity. And so I, I tried, and I felt like I was skiing through landmines, just ridiculous. Looked ridiculous, all bright fluorescent red. Wasn't thinking very well. And then, and then I'd, I'd have to stop every 30 yards and look back behind me to make sure no one was right behind me. Saw a reaction. And um, um, gradually gave it up just three, four times, and I think I was done. Okay. Before we go into more activities, what about physically? Do you have pains, aches, pains, problems? Your physical being, how are you? Um, I'm, I'm a much more careful person. Um, I don't take any risks and more brain damage. And I'm not sure I understand your question sure. exactly. Have you had any kinds of balance issues or headaches? Um, of course, initially, that was just, I, I, my life was living in an orange chair, sitting there initially, and sleep for 12 hours and then sit for half an hour and tell Carlene, I gotta, I gotta go back to bed. But to be fair, it's not like that anymore. No, it's not, no. I, I had, no, anymore, no, it's not. Let's talk about mentally. How, how have you seen yourself change mentally? What are some things that you've noticed or difficulties that you've had mentally? 
many things I don't have the words nor the intelligence or training to explain. You have lots of words. I do. <laughs> I admit. It's just, this has been a bizarre part of this process is I never feel like I've explained enough. There's, I, it's like big gaps. I go, I got to start from the beginning and everyone may recognize that by going through and building a case and they don't know what I'm talking about until I get to the subject. So it's, everything is backwards. I'm building from the little things and, and then saying, oh, I'm talking about apples. They're going, I had no idea. Upside down and backwards. Communication just feels like I, I can't connect. And, um, and so I keep trying, desperately trying. And, and um, yeah, personality changes is not something I, I just know it's different. Things are weird. You ever get lost? Oh my gosh, that was among the first signs when I tried to get out and work on the green team. And um, the, I, wait, whoa, whoa, what's the green team? What, the, what are well, you talking I, about? I volunteer for lots of groups, um, probably a couple hundred years, hours a year at least, I would think. And green team is one of those a significant, a large group of heavy, heavy lifters who pick up um, plastic and aluminum and recycle after concerts and USANA was the main one even though we've done Liberty Park and it's a group of maybe 15 people and we stay up until one o'clock in the morning picking that up up there and recycled the last year I worked 2015 23 tons and it's not just walking 16,000 steps on what I saw and it's bending and stooping and lifting and picking up and dragging a bag and it's hard work but really really bonding with a lot of people and doing that so that's what that is so I try going up there and I and usually I carpool and that day I didn't I'm usually the driver and so I parked and went and did our thing and it's maybe 12 30 1 o'clock and went back to the car and headed home I'm going the wrong direction I'm going what's going on I've done this dozens of times I was lost. Now just to clarify, this is since the, the ski crash, right? Oh yes. Okay. And my instincts are always knowing where north is. It's really been good having grown up in the mountains. It just was instinctual. At night, I had no instincts anymore anyway. And so I headed just instinctually where I thought I was supposed to be and wound up north or south or somewhere else and that happened a second time. Had and that ever happened to you before this ski collision? I've never been so reliable, relying, needing uh, maps. And so um, I, I'm pretty sure I've lost visual memory because it doesn't, knowing those turns and the houses where you turn, the streets you turn at, that feels like, and I know a little bit about that, that feels like a deficit I have, that, that doesn't, I don't retain that anymore. I can be there a dozen times and I still have to use maps to make sure I get there. Really odd. Okay. What about emotional, Terry? How are your relationships with your family and friends since the ski accident? You know, um, my interaction with my family has been more difficult. And um, I, I think I, of course, I'm desperately to be close to my family and my girls, but something's wrong in my essence and what I what I bring to the table with them and communication is not as smooth and and um, um, it's it's been more difficult no question and they've they've told me they've noticed some changes yeah now I didn't know you before jury didn't know you before what kind of relationships did you have with your girls before this crash my goals are always angels. I'm their protector. <sighs> Some things happened to them I'm testifying that I heard about it. It hurts to see them in that place as their protector. I rode home with them and sort of sobbing, so I get caught up. Do you love your girls? Oh my gosh. There's More been some discussion about um, your relationship with Jenny and that it's not always optimal. 
from your perspective, what is your relationship like with Jenny? And how has it been even before this accident? Yeah, Jenny, Jenny and I probably don't communicate as well as I do with my other two daughters. Not probably, definitely we don't. We just have a hard time um, in that process and I will not give up. I try to push to keep that, those lines open, but there's been times when there's been long breaches in our conversation. And um, yeah, I, I feel like her protector more than anybody does. So it's hard, been harder for me to transition from being a parent to being an adult, an equal adult. I just feel like I need to intervene more on her behalf and help her. This has been hard. Let's talk about Carlene. We heard her testify last week. Um, she's a catch. Why'd you let her go? In my choice, I wouldn't have, but I had it. After eight months, I had to tell her to leave. I said, I'm not asking her, I'm telling you, you gotta leave. And I. Why'd you tell her to leave? I knew she didn't buy into this. She didn't buy in to me not being the same person and coming coming into a relationship and and I said I, I'm not sure I'm going to get to back to normal again and I don't want you to feel like you're that I'm a crippled vet and you're going to stick it out with me because I know you would half a brain or whatever I know you would but don't do it you need your life you run right now and it was a sad time for both of us I know and she's in a great relationship with Bill now and that was the purpose. And I think better than what I would have brought, honestly. It's hard to admit that, but it's true. Council, this is a good place to take a break. Sure. Okay, we'll take a short recess. Why don't you stand now and then you're welcome to step down during the break. Council, would you approach the bench, please?
Publish the deposition and then bring up on this the highlighted sentence and answer because it's really slowed things down. And I, uh, from my deposition with Mr. Sanderson, I I suspect there's going to be that kind of slowness too, and I'd rather just bring it up. Any issues with that? Yes, Your Honor. We don't think it's proper. Uh, we'd rather do it the normal way, which is. Uh, they read the deposition, um, but they don't show it. I think I'll permit it on because this is a party, uh, and under Rule 32, it can be oh, used for any purpose. I thought he meant for the other witnesses. Too. And as long as you know the, the the section that you're using for impeachment, Mr. Owens, is the only section that's appearing up there. Okay, that's the James issue. Sorry. We'll do it. All right. Yes, we're okay with that. I, I thought he was talking about some of the other witnesses that we're preparing. You see, Gus. No, we, we, had, we thought we'd find out if Carrie Oaks was going to be offered. We could bring in the jury. Pardon? We could bring in the jury. Okay. Let's call let's them in. Get moving. Mm -hmm. I've, commit, I've committed to get this done quickly. Yes, uh, yes, you did. Your Honor, we have copies of the hard copies of the depositions. There were actually, it was three sittings. And can we go put them up there? Yes. One, two, three, and give you a copy? Yes. Do you mind? This, this is Peter. Yes. These are for the court. If you're putting it up on the screen, I mean, for the witness, they may not need to actually go into this. Uh, that may save you some time. But, but put them there just in case the witness needs them. Ms. Van Orman? Yes, thank you. We've had trouble with that chair. Oh. It wasn't you who broke it. Yeah, I've got one side higher than the other, but I'll... that's what it does. I don't oh. okay. yeah. That's the leaning side. But everything else functions well on it. Tell you what, just leave it. We'll we'll, we'll work move around on. it. Move on, yes. Okay, all right. So let's get back to some of the things that you've noticed. Um, we've heard from others, but I want to hear from you. Yes. Um, have you had any type of anger issues since the collision that that you've noticed? There's no question. I have a much wider range of yeah temperament than I had before. Much wider. What about your social life? Do you, before before the ski accident, what kind of things did you do? You know, I, I look back in the last couple of years, in fact, I did that, and I just realized I was in the groove of my life at that stage. I had a lady in my life that I dearly loved, and um, we just did everything together and spent I believe it was two years together, and had cleaned up our lives and physically great shape. Both of us liked to hike and walk and travel, and really were enjoying our lives. And we spent some time in St. George, where she's located, and I spent some time here. It was wonderful, and we cleaned up the businesses of 
homes and combining homes and parents' homes and and we had she as I hope everybody noticed she is an amazing woman and so I had a great deal of connection with her. And, and so since the car or the car, excuse me, uh, the ski accident. Yes. Do you still go and do fun things and have that zest for life? I've been self-imposed 90% staying in the house. A recluse, self-imposed recluse. Just not feeling as fun, not feeling as engaged in other things, Not just don't have that same spark I had and don't feel the same about when I go to places. Um, you still travel though. You know, I have traveled because... What? Let's, put it, let, let's talk about travel for a minute. Yes. Be before the ski collision, did you do a lot of travel? A lot of travel. It happened to be something that Carlene liked to do, and so we, we traveled a lot. Went on the only cruise that I was ever on um, before the crash, and yes, we had, and we had more plans. Did you ever travel alone before the ski accident? I did. I did travel alone in a few places, yes. What about since the ski collision? Have you still traveled? I have traveled, and as part of the problem, I'm just easily confused about things. Um, so I usually request having somebody else along, also because of this funny aberrant foot thing, wanting to go its own way. I don't feel as safe, and then also, um, yeah, things would happen, like I put their wrong name, I'd get their name spelled wrong, and important flight tickets, and, and the birth date, which I should know. So it was, it was difficult, and I really wanted someone to go with me. I didn't feel as secure in traveling alone. Have you traveled alone since the ski accident? I have not. I had one time when... Um, a, f a friend, one friend, there's actually two, but I had one friend when we had planned a trip to Europe, a physician's assistant and um, a, a, my yoga instructor. And she decided right before the trip, um, Terry, I don't like you anymore. I don't know what's different. You're a different person. I don't like you anymore. And how, canceled her. How'd that make you feel? It was like, I'd known her as long, and one other one as well, as long as I've lived here, almost five years, I'm guessing, at that time. And it's like personality, like that's something that develops from the time you're a child. How, what do you do about a personality issue? Something's changed. I'm, I don't know, more aggressive. And you know what? That lady will not answer her phone or text, and I... Uh, well, we're not going to say her name on, on this no, being broadcast, are not. so we we're, are not gonna, not. we're not going to She's a lovely lady. Yes, she is. Have, have your other friendships been affected as well? Yes. Um, another lady that I knew for quite some time, a sweetheart also of a woman, um, we just got off kilter a little bit. Well, after Carlene, after I told Carlene she had to run, um, it was a few weeks later, I couldn't realize how lonely I was. Yes, I should have taken more time to absorb that, but I was so lonely because we were together all the time. So I reached out to her and we spent a couple of things, to, activities together and I couldn't believe the words that came out of her mouth. She said, Terry? This is hearsay. It, it is, it is hearsay, so we can't, you can't testify as to what she said, but how oh. did it make you feel? Well, it made me feel like, what's wrong with me, and how do I fix my personality? How do I fix it? I'm a different person. It's a pretty complex issue. And I lose self-confidence. The person I am, I'm going, what happened? Terry, are you trying to improve yourself? I've been in denial. I've been in denial about my issue. I refuse to believe I have brain issues. I've just done everything I can. I knew I had a critical window. 
to restore stuff. And I did everything I was told and everything I could find out about trying to get those neurons reconfigured in a good way. And I haven't found it's helped, so I'm still in denial. I keep thinking there's got to be something. Are you trying to improve yourself? Yes, I don't want to have brain issues. I'm trying to prove I don't have it. Everything I do, I'm trying to prove I don't have that wrong with me. There's been a lot of discussions about how Terry was before this ski collision. Um, And could you put up Defense Exhibit 23, please? And I'm actually going to move for the admission of the entire Defense Exhibit 23. I'm assuming there's no objection. Does any of this need to be redacted? Uh, let me just state that my understanding was that Ms. Van Orman was going to be done at 11. And I'm then almost it changed. Done. Right now she's moving for d- uh, Defense Exhibit 23. Any objection? No. Okay, so it's received. As to the redaction concern, I, I do believe at least some parts of us maybe need that, but it looks like we're not showing those. Are you showing his address, for instance? Um, but, well. At the bottom of that, do you have that exhibit in front of you? I think I do, yes. Yes, I think I do. All right. There's the address. address. Yep, thank you. Do you see where it says chief complaint down at the bottom? Yes, I do, yes. It says regular visit? Yes. Was this a regular visit? that you were attending with, um, with, with your provider? Um, it, it could be, I, I, I don't know. I usually saw her once a year or once every six months. So if that's what it says, I believe that's. Okay, and just for reference, Terry, I know you weren't here, but this is the I'm getting old exhibit, the I'm getting old visit. Could you go to the next page, please? All, all of Defense 23. I have nothing in front of me now. It, it's coming. Don't worry. Oh. All right. So this is the second page of that exhibit. Talks about 69-year-old male with HTN, HLD. We're not going to go through all of those <laughs> yeah. things. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just got over a, a URI. Do you know what a URI is? I do. What yeah. is it? Upper respiratory infection. Okay. So you just got over that yesterday, you think, at least according to this record. No cough, just runny nose, um, and upper respiratory symptoms. This is going to be his test for the cough, had not had a persistent cough, et cetera. Weight gain, thinks eating out too much. Were you eating out too much? (laughs) Yes. Um, Carlene and I chose to eat out instead of cook. Okay, and not getting enough exercise. Yes. Think you're, thinks you've gotten old all of a sudden. Terry, what does that mean? Did you tell your doctor that? You know, um, I relate it to the URI. If someone who's just gotten over a viral or bacterial infection, either one, over two weeks with a cough and just feeling worn out, I wouldn't doubt I wouldn't say something like that. Most and in fact, would. it says, does not think depressed, mood is good, just not doing the things you used to, but also thinks you're going to start skiing again and re- reinstate your gym membership. Did you have a plan? Yes, I absolutely did have a plan. All right. And st- that, that's all I need for that. Um, talk about planning, and I, and I meant to ask you about this before we, we move on. Um, do, you ha- do you know what executive functioning means? Yes, I'm well, familiar with that term actually from what, before. What's your understanding of what it means? It's the ability to coordinate your actions through your life, to be able to put things together, make decisions about them, get things done, and be efficient and effective, and be able to multitask and um, um, be effective, be and efficient and effective. Ex- to move 
move along. So Terry, you were talking about executive functioning. You kind of gave a, a, what that means to you. It looked like to me from exhibit 23, you were able to make a plan in your life and kind of follow through with that. Have you been able to do that since the ski accident? The examples of not being able to do that are one of my collections I keep track of, of all the things I want to do and can't do. and there's. Thousands. There's at least 12, I guess I should say 1,200 or 1,500 items on my to-do list. When I had, I look back to 2016, it repeats every day, whatever changes I make. I look back to 2016 and there were half a dozen, dozen back there, which is Stephen Covey's rule, right? That's what you get done. You mark them as priorities and get them done. It's just now continuous stuff I don't get done and I can't tackle because I can't figure it out. It's just goofy. I, the things that I could do, I was really handy. My dad was a handyman. And I learned and I have the tools. I have an example. You know what? I would love to hear the example, but I have made a promise. Go for so it. I want to shift gears. Let's do it. At some point um, after the ski accident, some time passed and there was a press conference that was held. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. I wasn't involved in that. I wasn't even your lawyer at the time. Was the press conference your idea? Absolutely not. Do you know why the press conference was held? Your Honor, that's... Is he waiving his attorney-client privilege? Because if he is, I'm going to drive a bus through that. What's the, what's the objection, counsel? He just violated his own attorney-client privilege, whose idea it was. I Objections overruled as to relevance. What is your understanding as to why a press conference was held? We understood and we agreed how important it would be. And I hold on. I don't want you okay, to discuss talk about anything that you you talked about with your counsel. Thank you. Okay. Did you have an understanding why a press conference was held? Yes. I knew that it was very important to have a video of that particular activity. It would just be convincing and would settle this beyond all doubt. Like a GoPro. Exactly, like a GoPro. But all the other cameras up there, there had to be somebody. And that's what I knew. In fact, I even looked recently and put up a notice at Deer Valley if anybody had a copy. After that press conference, did any GoPro videos surface? No, none. Has, have, have they ever? No, never. Terry, did you cause the ski collision with Ms. <clears throat> Paltrow? Absolutely not. I swear to my God and my family and my other father in heaven, it's like, no, no, I did not. Why did you bring this lawsuit? strike like religious oaths here S sustained and why did you bring the jury this? should disregard the last part of the last response why did you bring this lawsuit you know I I realized after a period of time that no one believed how serious my injuries were 
just because I did wasn't out and interacting continuously didn't mean there was something any wrong with me. I really, really wanted an opportunity. I knew there was damages. And then there was lots of insults added to that singular incident. Lots of insults along the way, dozen of other times where everything went contrary to my value system. And I just went, you know what? My daddy would say, if you got the truth, you bring the truth, don't let anybody back you down. And that's what I felt I needed to do. And I'm here to prove that truth, only the, with facts. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Van Orman. <laughs> Mr. Owens. So I caught a cold. So I'm kind of keeping my distance from people. Let's see, where's that little microphone that moves? Yeah, just on the table. Right. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Sorry, I'm going to be wiping my nose a little. And with this climate and dry air, I might have a bloody nose. Mm. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's talk about a few things. We're not going to get done with you today because uh, we have witnesses this afternoon, but I think we can go till noon. Is that all right with you? Yes, sure. Whatever you like. <coughs> Did you ever say to me, I wrote, I'm famous because it's cool that I had a collision with a celebrity. Was that your thinking at the time? And you said yes. Do you deny it? I, not if you have it on record, no. I don't deny it. I don't remember it. But well, I let's go to page 15. Can you bring that up? Move to publish the deposition. Which your I, Honor, he said he doesn't deny it, so why are we publishing? Because he earlier denied it. I'll, I'll overrule the, obje or the objection and permit that portion of the deposition to be published. May I ask when this happened? Sure. Like one hour ago, two hours ago, you told this jury, I've never thought it was cool that I had a collision with a celebrity. Do you recall that? Yeah, I, yes, I guess I did say that, absolutely. And that's not a true statement, is it? You have, you have said this in your deposition, true? Honestly, I don't ever remember saying it. Bring it up but, whenever you but can. I hey. don't just I don't doubt you. I misspeak a lot. Okay, this is page fifteen, line five through eight. So the words I'm famous, this is my question, seem to say I think it's cool that I had a collision with a celebrity. Was that your thinking at the time? And your answer was yes, I guess, yes. Now let's go to your weight. You testified today that you were 163 and 5'5", five five. true? Yes, I did. And uh, do you agree that at your deposition you told me you were 175 to 180 and 5'8"? Yes or no? Um, yes or no? Qualified, a qualified yes. No, I don't want to qualify. I can't did you tell me that? Can like I said, how much do you weigh? And you said 175, 80. How much did you weigh? And then you said 5, 8. How high are you? How tall are you? Three inches different, right? I just found that out. I didn't realize. I've had Sir, people telling me that. You honestly. told this jury that at the time of the accident, you were 163 <clears> and 5'5". <throat> five, five. Did you not, like two hours ago? I did, yes. Yes. But you told me in your deposition years ago that you were 170 to 180 and 5'8". 
true? How many years ago did we do this? Three I've years lost, ago. I've lost a lot of weight. I'm down to my yes. usual weight. You know we're interested not now in your weight today. We're interested in your weight on the day. Thank you. I knew where that was going. Do you going. agree you were 5'8"? Yes. Have you shrunk three uh, inches? I couldn't believe it either. I, w I wanted to argue because I think I'm 5'8 yet. You, have, you do have degenerative back disease I and those, those discs are I've getting been, squeezed. Is that why? I have to say yes. I've always been... Five eight and a half, and I knew I shrunk a half an inch, but three. Wow. So Mr. Sanderson, we're trying in council. Let's not speak on top Thank of you. one another, Thank so you. that we have a clear, clean record. You're right. Yes, Your Honor. When uh, we talked about you being unconscious, and do you agree that someone who's unconscious doesn't have a stopwatch to figure out how long they were actually unconscious? I agree. That's true. Everything you've learned was from Craig. After after the collision no yeah that's over vague and uh, that's uh i'll withdraw it because i i agree that's not everything it's not everything so right much. right as far as level of uh, length of unconsciousness do you agree that uh you you weren't stop watching yourself i have no idea yeah and yet you you did tell people it varied over time first a few seconds then five minutes then 10 minutes you did that, right? I, Do you disagree? Y yes, it did vary. Do, and w why did you do that? Why would you say, I don't know, then it's a few seconds, then it's five minutes, and then you told your psychiatrist at the VA it was up to 10 minutes long. Why did you change? I had no idea, and I was searching. I, I really had no idea, and I was trying to answer. I sometimes make that mistake of guessing, but I really didn't know. And it was to try to get the attention of the doctor. Do you remember telling me that? I don't. I, I, don't, I don't know how to. Let's put. find it. What's the date? Let's go to page 95. <clears throat> Which deposition, one, two, or three? One. They're, they're all cumulative, so the page will tell you that. Page 95, starting at uh, line 7. When you first tell your health care providers a few seconds, and then later it turned into five minutes, and then later it turned into 10 minutes, do you know that you gave varying answers to people? And then whenever you can pull it up, page Page 95, Yes. the witness says, and then can we go to the middle paragraph? Yes, I do. And that was referencing the fact I personally did not know. I was a witness to, I was not a witness to how long I was unconscious. And so somebody told me it was two seconds and somebody said it was 10 seconds. 10 minutes. And so I was, I didn't know. It was hard for me to say. And then, next paragraph. It depends on my visit. If I want to make a deal out of it, and that was the reason for my visit, then I might say for 10 minutes. I might pick the worst. That's kind of how we are. We go to the doctor's attention we, excuse me, we go to get the doctor's attention about a specific thing. And it wasn't at that point how long I was unconscious was not a point of relevance for me. That's your testimony, correct? I'm even confused by those statements, so. I'm yes or no? Uh, yes, it is. By the way, when we took your deposition, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of formality to it, too. You're placed under oath just like the one you were put on today. Yeah. And uh, your counsel's present, and you've been able to, you were able to talk to them before. Yes? And I think I had, what, yes. 11 hours or so of deposition? I can't really hear you, sir, but uh, my, my question is, you had your advice of your counsel there. Yes. And uh, I asked at the beginning of the deposition, is there any reason why you can't give me your best testimony today? And you said yes. no, correct? Yes. 
And uh, I even told you, I think, that if you testify differently at your deposition, then uh, you'd, you would in front of this jury, I would call it to their attention. Do you recall this? Yes. And you took an oath and you, you then had the opportunity to make any changes to your deposition transcript. Is that true? Um, yes. And did you? No, I don't remember making any changes. I think I made two with you. Um, I said two corrections and, and that I remembered. Okay. You and, didn't, and you you didn't make them. some and uh, counsel told you, let's, let's not submit those? I haven't looked at these depositions at all. Not at all. Do you dispute that, uh, well, I heard you call Eric Christensen, a Deer Valley instructor for 40 years, a bully. Did you say that? I did say that, yes. And that he was yelling at your face. Yes. I figured out. And I didn't we'll, actually know that until. And we'll meet that at, we'll meet him at one o'clock. Uh, Deer Valley's known, or at least puts itself out there, doesn't it, as like the most customer friendly they could possibly be. Do you agree? I agree. Were your skis on or off at the end of the collision, do you know? Absolutely, they were on. Okay, Absolutely. so you do remember some things after. Yes. Okay. And uh, Craig, you. By the way, you said you weren't here for your daughters, but you haven't been here for several de several statements, right? Several. Yes. It was more than just like I don't want to make my daughters uncomfortable. You haven't been here for many. I didn't. Yeah. And uh, Sam Goldstein said part of the reason is you don't take criticism well. Do you agree with that statement? I always. I always want to be a better person, and I thought I, I thought I, I even tell my kids if I'm doing something wrong, tell me. I want to be better. All right. So, do you agree or disagree with this statement? Uh, Mr. Sanderson does not take criticism well. Hard for me to measure that. I've not been around other humans as much as I have been in the past, so it's hard for me to measure that. Honestly, I don't. Do you agree that when Whitney? Uh, came with the toboggan. Mm -hmm. She asked you what happened, and you said, "I don't know." Do you agree with that statement? Um, I, if if that's on the record, I don't disagree with it. I don't remember that particular part of our interaction. I just remember she said something to me, and it's the first question, right? Ski patroller comes up. By the way, you've hurt, hurt yourself before skiing. True. Never but, needing, never needing help, right? Get before this up. incident, though, you injured your knee. I had when I first learned to ski that first year. All right, Beaver. Mm -hmm. So, you don't dispute that the first thing Whitney asked you is like, "How are you?" And what happened? Do you agree? Those are like the first two questions. I have no recollection of those questions. I don't. I would think she would reach out to me, but. I don't did you ever complain to Deer Valley about Eric Christensen, like I was treated like a bully? I had a lot of time to think about it. Yes or no? I don't know if I did. I wasn't, I think when I contacted Deer Valley, I, I was just so, after I wanted to find out who hit me and I wanted to copy the records and I didn't bring it up. Yeah, you never once wrote to Deer Valley like, hey, your, your uh, ski instructor is a total SOB to me. He treated me poorly. That's correct. I didn't bring it up because I did not want to cause some anger from them. I wanted to copy and find out who hit me. But seven years later, you're here saying he was terrible to me, just terrible. Uh, Ramon, Craig Ramon said words to the effect that um, Christensen said to Ramon, your buddy took out Gwyneth Paltrow. Did you hear those words? I did. You I personally heard them with your, so now I want to be clear because I'm not trying to confuse you. Did you hear them when you were on the ski no. slope? 
Uh, okay. And Ramon did not do anything to try to set the record straight at that point. Do you know anything about that? About who hit me? Correct. When we got down into the into at the that medical point care. was yeah. my question yeah. on the mountain. Yeah. On the mountain, but in the shed, I was. Okay. You said your skis were on after the collision. Do you recall your head being downhill or yeah. uphill? Absolutely downhill. I was going down, and absolutely. So several witnesses say the opposite, and you it's disagree? I disagree, absolutely, because I couldn't get up. And where was Gwyneth's head, Gwyneth's head when she came to arrest? Head have, down, head I, up? I have no idea. As far as I know, she didn't exist. Because you didn't see anything? I was out. I had no idea. Everything else is what I heard. Did you tell Eric Christensen, according to his report, that she appeared right in front of me? Yes or no? No. No. So he just Never. made that up? Must have. Deer because Valley just uh, uh, falsified a record. Is that your opinion? I never would have said that. I knew where it came from. You know you sued Deer Valley in this claim, true? Yes, yes. Objection, Your Honor, relevance? Sustained. And we're not dealing with any of that today. True? We're not dealing with... The, the Objection, relevance, move to strike. Sustained. The, the question is stricken and the jury should disregard. So, Your Honor, I just want to be able to ask if, if you're willing, is you're not suing Deer Valley today. Your Honor, objection, third objection now, move to strike again. Sustained, stricken, okay. disregard, please. I hear you saying you were going, you were flying through the air after she hit you. Did you say those words? Yes today? Or, yes or no? Today? Today. Today I did. With regard to um, relationships prior, you had two divorces, true? I did, yes. And then uh, was it about 10 years of just dating various different other women? I guess I wouldn't know exactly. Wouldn't be unreasonable, maybe. Well, I'm just saying if the incident occurred in 2016, when was your second divorce? About 30, 10 years earlier. Years ago. I'm thinking 30 years ago, I'm thinking. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, uh, it's nice that Carlene, you had found a nice partner, but uh, you were not engaged. Is that true? We were not. And she was we actually living hundreds of miles away from you? We went back and forth. It's three hours, four hours maybe, the most. A couple hundred miles, I think, isn't it? I don't know. St. George. We'll let it. We'll move on. Thank you. Do you recall saying uh, that you agreed that saying I'm famous was a crazy thing to say? Agree? Absolutely, it's not me. It's just, I don't buy into that. But it was you, right? Just to right. be clear. When you say it wasn't me, it, it was in fact you. It's the other personality that's inhabiting my body right now. And you blame Gwyneth Paltrow for that? Do you recall having a kind of a stroke event like 10 years or so before the incident? Yeah, but that diagnosis has been changed. But it's an ischemic retinal occlusion? Probably due to a migraine. And you lost your right eye in that? I lost some vision in that eye, yes. And uh, that was one of the reasons you, re you retired? One of many. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in terms of your anger. Uh, do you agree you sought therapy for anger management about 10 years ago? I don't. Or 15 years ago. I guess 06, about the time of your uh, second divorce. Because if you I deny it, we're going to pull it up. I don't remember that purpose, but it, yes, I okay. 
was I seeing a shrink or? So you can't ask me questions, unfortunately. Sorry, thank you. All I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have you say yes or no, and then we go to documents if we need to. So do you agree that you were seeing a therapist at the VA for anger management about 10 years, even before the incident? Only, I honestly don't remember it, but if you say so, I, I, I believe you. Yeah, I can't testify. Uh, so if you I dispute it, then we go to the record. I and don't look at these records. I have it. 5,000 pages. So you don't dispute it? I don't. Okay. And did you tell Shay that there was a GoPro recording? Absolutely not. Do you recall at the exact time of this event, <clears throat> going down the hill, you were sort of crossing over to the right. Does that sound accurate? No. You were always on the right? Yes. Okay, Christensen is going to testify this, uh, uh, this afternoon, so we'll talk about that. And um, do you agree in the five seconds or so before the collision, there was a female skier, kind of beginner-ish, on your left? Yes. And do you agree that you actually tilted your head to the left to sort of confirm that you weren't going to hit her, that she would be okay. After the accident? Five seconds before the before, accident. Before, no. Did you so testify ever? I, I saw her. What I, re, what I, I don't know. What so, I remember is I always saw her. She was a little uncomfortable, and I gave her a little more room, just kind of what you do. And did Passing you, on your right? And did you hit? Did you turn because of your uh, right eye is blind? No. Did you turn toward her? No reason to. Look, you did not. No. Okay, we'll pull that up in uh, probably at our next visit. You texted about Whitney, the toboggan person. How how happy you were with her, true? I did, yes. Give her and, full credit. And we both read it. It's pretty articulate, pretty detailed, right? It is. You knew you were being subjected to a brain test, like a memory test. Well, I'm not. Okay, go ahead. Right? Didn't didn't you tell us that when she said, "I want you to remember some things"? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, you knew you were you were being subject to a brain oh, memory yeah, I test. Was, I've never focused so hard. And you came through with flying colors, right? I did. You knew them all? I did. Remember President Trump said they gave me five things to remember and I got them all. Do you remember this? I don't, I don't pay attention. I'm sustained. You called her a sweetheart and that she entertained you. And that was all really within a half hour of the incident, a half hour of the collision, is that true? I don't remember the time frame. Uh, Carlene may have been there by then, I don't know. She was helpful. But it was at the base where the toboggan went down to. Yes. That was, uh, that wasn't, well, tell me, is that at the bottom of Deer Valley or is that a mid-level mid -level, clinic? I think, I think it was mid-level. All right. And is, there, so is there a picture of you two in a wheelchair smiling? Do you remember that picture? I haven't seen it. Ever? I don't remember seeing it, no. Shay mentioned it, that there was a picture of you, and maybe it was at the Instacare. Do you remember anyone, any, any picture of you in the Instacare in a wheelchair smiling? No, I don't. Okay, and I asked you about it, and you said, I just smiled because they told me. Uh, if somebody says smile. Someone said smile, and you smiled. I don't Does remember. Does this ring a bell from your deposition? It does not. I. Okay. But that's. So you took a picture of Whitney, right? I did. Composed that very nice email with all the details, and then you sent it to your group. Probably, I don't say I composed it. I it, Car could have had Carlene's help. She may have been there then. And that's, well, you did it though, right? You, you came up with those exact words. Carlene didn't do that. I may have helped her. Well, she doesn't know she grew up in Michigan, that she's uh, exactly. won the 
Deer Valley Collision or the Deer Valley Grand whatever <laughs> race, right? That's right. All right. She doesn't know that. Do you think Carlene was present at the Deer Valley Clinic? I, I know she, no, she wasn't at the Deer Valley Clinic. No, absolutely oh, not. Okay. No. It was when, I, when we got I may home. Have misunderstood she you. was on her way. Do you remember Carlene didn't buy into this? Was that your quotes in terms of your, uh, did you say those words just like an hour or two ago? Carly didn't buy into what, Mr. Owens? Do you remember saying those words? She wasn't buying into this? What was the question? It was uh, why your relationship with her deteriorated after the collision. I, I misspoke. I absolutely, absolutely, okay. I'm not sure I understand the to be, be clear on that issue, and I realize I'm jumping around, but I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Did you, um, with regard to Carlene, it sounds like you shut it down. You shut the relationship down. Is that true? I made a very strong statement that she was going to be better off without me, yes. And you told her that? Yes. So Carlene was here a couple days ago and said, I, I, he never told me. Did you tell her? I, I had no idea I why. I told her what I said. What I said. What I what I thought I said was, Carlene, I you got to run. I don't want you stuck with me. And I know you would stay by me. I know she would. So, your next then you started calling your daughters. It sounds like even before the I'm famous thing. Is that true? I don't remember that, honestly. Uh, Shay said she took a call from you about six something. Okay. So, so about six hours later. Okay. Have you ever read her depositions? No. By the way, or Jenny's? No. I told him I wouldn't. Okay. And they had even expressed like, hey dad, we're, we're kind of concerned because we got to talk about you and how you were growing up and things, and we're, we're kind of concerned that it will hurt your feelings. Do you recall this? I didn't know why, but they knew, I don't remember them telling me that. I just, I decided that before. All right, so we got, you're at the clinic. You take a picture, this is at this, on, on the Deer Valley Hill. You take a picture of Ramon and one of the other skiers, and they're all smiles. Did you know that? Um, boy, that's a we little can, bit. A little bit. I do kind of remember can that. Uh -huh. Can you bring up the picture of Ramon? I do. Sure. Yeah, I believe that did happen. And uh, I don't remember them being smiling smiles. Okay, we'll we'll people. pull it up here. Okay. And do you have the number D? I'm going to find it. One second. D87. D87 moved to admit. I think it was. It is not no objection. Go ahead. D87 received. Do you remember, and I can give you a hard binder if you want. It looks like the monitor's working. Uh, do you recognize that you took this picture? I recognize the picture, and I probably did take it. Yeah. All right. Smile, you know. <clears throat> when you went uh, to The Instacare, uh, do you have a personal memory of that? I really don't. I, 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 didn't, I don't remember if I had an x-ray. Like, okay, I think the physician assistant's coming tomorrow, but he wrote no, no signs of confusion. Oh. Uh, do you dispute that? No, no I don't, wasn't there, I, not him. Do you agree that in your post-collision talk with Shay about six hours after the incident, you told her, I'm okay. That would be me. I, my yes. parents didn't find out I was divorced until the last day. I don't want to put them through that misery. 
I don't share my information. All right, so let me, I think that's a yes, but I'm gonna re-ask it because we need to get it clear. At six o'clock, just hours, six hours after the collision, did you tell your daughter Shay, I'm okay? Yes? Yes. Asked and answered. Thank you. Overruled. And then on the hill, on the hill itself, with the accident having occurred just in the prior minutes, do you agree that someone asked you, are you okay? That is absolutely beyond a doubt wrong. No one spoke to me when I was needing help. No one stopped, no one. So your testimony is Eric Christensen just sat there and looked at an unconscious man for several minutes. Is that your testimony? Yes, he never said one word to me that I recall. I, maybe when he got me up. So R Ramon, although he did uh, try to change his deposition, did say that at one point you said, I'm okay. Do you dispute it? I dispute it. Now I never to dispute felt okay. it, you have to know everything you said, right? Like I know everything I said and I didn't say it. Are you saying you have a perfect <laughs> memory of what you said on that hill just after the collision? Yes or no? I knew. That's not argumentative. That's not argumentative. O overruled. Yes or no? Um, Say yes or no, please. Question again, please. Yes. Do you agree that uh, you do not have a perfect memory of what you s told others after the, in, in the one, two minutes, three minutes after the collision? Or do you have a perfect memory? Well, that word is so ultimate, perfect. No, right. An answer would be no, it's not perfect. Okay. So it's possible you said, for instance, Eric Christensen is going to testify, first witness this afternoon, that you told him, I'm okay. Do you dispute it? I dispute it. Okay. I never felt safe and like anybody was there to help me. And then I he, would not have said it. He's about to testify that not only he was there, but a ski patroller duo came over. One of them came over and said, do you guys need any help or words to that effect? And that you consulted with R Ramon and then said, no. Do you dispute it? I absolutely would have said no. I never said safe. So I don't want to say what I would have said. I want to know if you remember. I, do you remember that? No, you, okay. I don't remember. In fact, asked. you don't even remember that ski patrollers came by. True? No, I do not remember that. Yeah. Ever. We talked about your right eye, but your left eye also has uh, some some severe vision loss. Is that true? No. Uh, I see 20-20 in that eye. Did you have a cataract in that eye? I did. And that cataract's been removed yes. since the ski collision? Yes. Uh, there's a report on February 4, 2015, that his vision in his left eye is decreasing blind in right eye. Was your left eye decreasing one year before the ski collision? Increasing in visual acuity or Sorry. in prescription? Decreasing. Was your left eye decreasing? Yes, getting less need for prescription, but not the visual acuity. Now, in addition to your stroke, you also had a, uh, your heart was not perfect. Do you agree? Before the ski collision? Perfect, of course I couldn't agree with the word perfect, no. Palpitation, you had palpitations, agreed? I had them most of my life. Yeah, most how many life. years? 40 years probably. And what's the lay term for palpitation? Is it just an um, it's un called, um, unusual it's, beat? It's, it's just a little out of sync that happens when I'm really tired or if I've been on the treadmill too long or running too long and hard, then, then it will get 
a little funny syncope. It's called PCVs. So it, your, your beads off, is that fair to say? Yeah, but it's nothing yeah. I notice. It doesn't change. Okay. And, but you are on two different uh, high blood pressure medications. Does that sound right? Yes. And that's because one didn't, one wasn't adequate. You needed both. Well, kitchen relevance. We're going to his. I can explain if you want, Your Honor. But this this event yeah, later changed witness, his later life. witnesses that to which this forms part of their opinion. Sure, his overall health. Yes. There's no claim that his um, his heartbeat or anything was affected by this accident. Your Honor, he says this has utterly changed his life. Yeah, just just a minute. Council, would you approach, please? Noon recess at this time and return at 1.30. Thank you. May be seated. So, counsel, it, it, cons consistent with the motion in limine ruling that the court gave at the uh, before trial, um, Mr. Sanderson, you can certainly step down. Uh, there, there's a there were, there were it was a laundry list of medical issues and uh, medical issues. If they're relevant, they absolutely should come in. If they're not relevant, they should not come in. So there will need to be, I mean, I need, I need from you an assurance that this is a conditional relevance uh, situation and, and that you will tie in the relevance later and not just a vague statement from an expert that this guy had a lot of health problems before. I mean, I need to know, uh, it needs to be tied in. 
So maybe you want to look at the reports or depositions uh, to make sure that whatever it is that you're examining this witness on will be tied in later by a medical expert uh, as to the relevance either before or after. I mean, either one of those would be relevant. James is sort of on the damages end, so I'll defer to him on the specifics. But we are talking, when they say, it's utterly ruined my life, that's, we're talking about the whole package. And aging is one of the primary, just normal aging is one of the primary issues for our experts. And so uh, we got to look at the whole package, not how about this heart thing and how about this prostate thing and how about this... Um, we're, we will argue, and our experts will back it, is that that's the reason he is kind of slowly deteriorating, progressive aging. Okay. So, so take a look at what the opinions will be, and if, they're, if you feel as though they're tied in, um, then you can go into those areas. Thank you. It seemed like there was one other issue. Okay, I just want to kind of put this on the the stand. So I had, I had seven witnesses lined up. I was supposed to take over the case this morning at 9 a.m. Many are out of state. Um, plaintiff's counsel, I don't dispute everyone's working hard, but it has significantly thrown off my witness list to the point that I'm actually having to cancel witnesses and so that we can read their transcripts. Um, and some people some of our experts in particular flying in out of state, I can testify during this small window. And um, I last, as of last night, they were gonna be done at 10, then it was 11, and uh, they still haven't rested. I, I, they were delayed today because of weather. True, I I'm, I'm, guess I'm not really blaming people, except for um, I still don't have the case. They're not ready to rest multiple assurances that they were going to rest on Friday. Thank you. Okay. And, and also for the record, the, the court didn't issue an order uh, concerning, you know, when one case when must be rested and one other uh, must be rested. It's, I, I've been leaving it up to counsel to work that out and I, from my perspective, it looks like uh, everyone's doing the best they can. Everyone's working hard, I don't dispute it, but it, it's hard when I have like kids flying in. Understand. You want any response to that, or should we just hold our peace? Why don't we take lunch? All right. <laughs> Be back at 1.30. And you're, you're getting a printout for the amount of trial time that's been used so far. Yes. As soon as we get to a working printer.
may be seated. <coughs> Calling Sanderson versus Paltrow. Looks like not quite everyone's present. As soon as you are ready for the jury, let me know. It's like we got a binder this thought I was up here. Yeah. Yeah. Ready for the jury counsel? All right. We're ready. Thank you and good afternoon. Mr. Sanderson, would you please take the retake the witness stand? Your, your Honor, we've made an agreement. Oh, okay. Sure. So because we have Deer Valley people lined up, um, I would like to continue my questioning of Mr. Uh, Sanderson, but at a different time. Okay. Very Thank good. You. And so who's the next witness? Eric Christensen. Mr. Christensen? If you could come right up here, sir. Hi. He's very sweet. Okay. Thanks. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Can I have a seat? 
Good afternoon, sir. Just right around here, and there's the chair. And the left hand armrest has been acting up again. Full name and spell all the words. M middle name also? Sure. Okay. My name is Eric Paul Christensen, E R I C P A U L C H R I S T I A N S E N. Um, let's introduce yourself. What city do you live in? I live in Camas. Okay. And uh, married kids? I have two children. They're both in their 30s. I have two grandchildren. And uh, skiing has been a big part of your life. Is that fair? It has been. I've been a ski instructor for 44 years, 39 of those at Deer Valley. And uh, rem I can think of what a ski instructor is, but just comment a little further on that, would you? What is a ski instructor? Once I came to Deer Valley, um, I went through both of my levels of certification. There's three now, but uh, uh, they've added one on the front end. Uh, but we're members of the Professional Ski Instructors of America. We happen to be in the Intermountain Division. We, um, I'm certified to ski to teach all levels, from you know young kids all the way through adults, from never ever's never been on skis through experts. Okay, I talked to your wife. She's been in the ski industry 50 years too. She actually receives her 50 year, uh, she, she just received her 50 year level three pin, yes. And, but during that time, she spent 32 years as a patroller at Park City Mountain Resort. She was a weekend patroller. You mentioned level three, uh, is three good? Yes, there, it used to be called associate and full and then they, uh, they changed it, they added a bronze pin at the front end, and so it went level one, level two, level three. And so the, old, the former full certified is now call, uh, called level three certified. Sir, I'm gonna ask James to uh, show you um, a 20 second animation. May I do that, Your Honor? Will you approach the bench? Sure.
So objection over overruled. Well, I, I'm holding it in abeyance right now until you show the witness the animation. So may James approach the witness. Sure. Or plaintiff's counsel needs to see what's being shown. You can come up here also. So, Mr. Christensen, James is going to run a 20 second animation for you. Okay. For the record, this is the six, number six. True. Of the animations. There's no sound. Tell, please tell me when it's over. Have you reviewed that? Yes. Okay. Uh, can I have plaintiff's counsel go back? Will that help you explain your testimony to the jury? Yes, it will. Will it help explain the position of the parties at the time of the accident? Yes. Does it help explain your recollections of the events? From, yes, it does. Is it substantially similar to your recollection of the events on the date in question? Yes, it is. So, Your Honor, I move to publish this animation to the jury as a demonstrative exhibit. Uh, plaintiff objects. The uh, demonstrative is not illustrative I, of the uh, um, witnesses uh, viewpoint and uh, if you wouldn't mind your honor I'd like to have another sidebar okay Okay, the motion is granted. The uh, animation number six will be received for demonstrative purposes. And if the jury will recall, jury instruction number 18 addresses evidence like this. Certain charts and summaries, in this case an animation, sometimes referred to as demonstrative exhibits, will be shown to you to help explain the evidence. However, these charts and summaries, and in this case an illustration or a uh, uh, animation, are not themselves evidence and you will not have them in the jury room with you when you deliberate. You may consider them to the extent that they correctly reflect the evidence. All right. Um, let's play the animation, and then okay. we're going to go back and talk about it. Is this from your viewpoint? This one would be from my viewpoint, yes. And let's be clear, this is not a GoPro video. No. This is a creation. It's not an actual video, correct? That is correct. All right. So this is from, is if you had a camera on your forehead at the time, uh, uh, does this sort of illustrate your testimony? It will. Okay. 
It's been admitted. Lex Foundation. Okay, let's play the video. All right, we're gonna take this kind of piece by piece. Let's go to the very beginning. Do you know the bandana run? Very well. How many times have you skied that? Well, um, the, I've been at Deer Valley for uh, 40 years, actually. Um, I would say that the bandana run has been there for about 30 of those. And it is the only or the access to go directly from Flagstaff Mountain to the Empire area. And uh, do you recognize this, for instance, this little cabin there on the left? Oh, yes. Uh, what is it, a private home? It's a private home. Do you recognize those? And I have a little laser here, if I'm doing this right. Do you see those buckets right there? Yeah, those are green foam tubes that cover up the snow making. Um, there's water and air or water and electric depending on what type of system they have. And uh, does that provide some landmark in where this collision occurred? It does. Okay. Was it essentially across from them? Uh, what do you where, mean? Where the collision occurred, was that sort of across from the snow equipment? Uh, it would be in that general area, yes. Okay. And then uh, there's some people here. So who's the orange, the guy in the orange? That would represent Moses. All right, so let's back up. Um, were you hired by Miss Paltrow to, Paltrow, excuse me, to uh, help Moses that day? Yes. And had you helped him before? This was the third time I had skied with him, uh, twice in the previous year and then this trip on this year. Would you lie for Gwyneth today? No. Um, are you testifying truthfully today? Yes, I am. By the way, you were called a bully this morning. Have you ever bullied a guest at Deer Valley? Deer Valley takes um, their guests very seriously. And if an instructor is confront, uh, you know, has a confrontation with a guest, uh, we don't last. Uh, we are supposed to be polite to everyone. And I was polite to Mr. Sanderson that day. And have you been polite to every guest in 40 years? I've never had a reason not to be. So, yes? Were yes. you a bully to Mr. Sanderson? I was not. Is that a ridiculous claim? I, th I feel that it is, yes. And you were personally named in this very Objection, lawsuit. Your Honor. Abstained as to relevance. Goes to credibility, I believe, Move to strike, Your Honor. Your Honor. I'll, I'll follow your order. Okay. Um, there's been an allegation just this morning that you stood by and yelled at an unconscious man for two or more minutes. Uh, did you? I, I'm asking him to comment on it. it it's, a it's a prefatory um, statement. It's fine. Overruled. Did you do that? I did not. Um, no one was ever unconscious during that period of time. Um, uh, where do you want me to start? Yes, it's a big story. Okay, okay. Who, who are these two people on the uh, animation? Those would represent Apple and um, also Carrie Oaks, another okay. instructor. All right, so they were a little head. Is that fair? They were in the proximity. I can't tell you for sure okay. exactly where they were, but we were all in the same proximity. And... Uh, do you actually recognize, recognizing this as an animation, but does it uh, illustrate well the geography of the actual run? It does. <clears throat> Do you know anything about like a f special photographer going up and actually contouring the, the, pro the run? Well, it is, a, uh, what I've been told, it is an actual photograph of the run. Uh, so and the uh, this was a clear day it and, was and that's uh, do you know whether this was the actual 
month and day, not the year, of the actual incident itself. Like this is literally the day, like February 26th. Right. I was told that the other day. Okay. I, you don't personally know that. No. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> the title of this image is uh, Christensen's POV, Point of View. And uh, let's let's run it and then James I'll ask you to stop at some point okay let's stop who is that that would represent mr. Sanderson all right why why is it you would look up to see someone like mr. Sanderson well when you're working with students especially if they're children you're always looking around it's very much like driving you you're aware of everything around you. Um, the one thing this animation does not show is I actually watched him make several turns down, and that's what caught my eye. And so uh, he, Mr. Sanderson has some very strong skiing skills because he was skiing edge to edge, rolling his skis. Uh, an intermediate skier skids much more, but he was skiing edge to edge, and he was making what we would refer to as GS giant slalom turns, which basically means that they're round and large and fairly fast. Okay, and comment on Moses' ability? Moses, it was, I think it was maybe his fourth time. I, he went to Big Bear one day, from what my understanding, and then he had skied a few days with me on one trip, a couple of days on a second trip, and this was his first day of this trip. So he did not have a lot of experience. He was nine years old, and so he was still in a wedge. And so we were skiing very slow. We were skiing on the side of the, of the run. And uh, comment on Gwyneth's uh, skill level. Gwyneth is a strong intermediate skier, and um, she was skiing skiers right while we were on skiers left. And um, one of the things that's interesting is that she was making short radius turns. Now, when we teach people how to be safe, one of the things that we do is we try to teach them to ski not right down the middle of the run because that's where all the traffic is, but um, if they can ski a shorter radius turn on the side, that means they're in a narrower corridor. It also means that they are out of the line of traffic and uphill skiers who are faster can watch and anticipate them and, and miss them. And that's what she was doing. She was actually skiing short radius turns on the skier's right, right next to the edge. I did jump beyond your background. So uh, when it's not ski season, what do you do for a living? I also teach at the Winter Sports School. It's a high school that was set up for winter athletes. And so uh, we start in April and about the second week of April and then graduation will be the week before Thanksgiving. And so the students get an academic education, but they also get five months off during the winter to work on their sport. Okay. I think I mentioned that your w wife is a level three instructor. Are you a level three instructor? Yes, I am. And is that the highest level? It is. And highest, mean, highest means most advanced? That is correct. Okay. All right, let's, let's run the video just a little bit more. Okay, let's stop. Who is, now, say again who all these people are, would you? Who's that on the, on the far end? On, on the far end, that would be uh, Miss Paltrow. Okay, and uh, let's go a little further. Now, let's stop. Okay. All right. Greg Ramon said when he heard a sound, he turned. Is that what you did? Well, of course, when I heard a scream, that's when I looked back. He's claimed to be the only eyewitness who essentially uh, heard and turned, but you also heard and turned, is that right? That is correct. And was Ramon immediately on the scene? He was not. Um, what happened was, I had been watching Mr. Sanderson ski down and because I was aware of my students on the side 
But as soon as he passed us, I looked back at Moses, and it was a mere moments after that that we heard the, uh, the scream. All right, so um, whenever you say a pronoun like he, okay, I, I'm going to actually yeah. ask you to okay. clarify who. Sorry about that. All right, so just say that last sentence again, would you, with using the name? Okay, so Mr. Sanderson was skiing down, making fairly large turns, and he had accumulated a fair amount of speed. Um, I watched him while I was watching my kids. I was paying attention to both. And as soon as he passed us, and uh, I wasn't concerned with him hitting us, then I turned back towards Moses. And he, but at that point, he was very close to Miss Paltrow. And uh, um, I looked away. I did not actually see the collision, but I heard her scream. And that's when I looked up. But Ramon was not on the scene for how many seconds? I would say at least 45 seconds. I mean, uh, Miss Paltrow was already up on her feet. Uh, we were getting Mr. Sanderson up on his feet. Um, he, was, he was very late to the scene. Okay. I would just assume that he was not as fast a skier as Mr. Sanderson was. All right, so let's be clear. Did you literally see the moment of impact? I did not. All right. Did you hear and turn I did hear and I turned and that by that time they're already moving on the ground and who's on top Miss Paltrow is on top all right and uh, let's finish running the video if you don't mind so is this you skiing over to them it is is this more or less what you saw pretty much they were below me so the first thing I did was I turned to Carrie and I said uh, asked her to take Moses, and I said, I'm going to go over to uh, see what happened. And at that point, I traversed across. They were below me, and so I didn't have to skate or anything. I just. Did, did you went hear uh, Miss Paltrow say anything? When I got Paltrow, there. Paltrow, like a Ms. pal. Paltrow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, when I got to the scene, uh, they were, she was talking and uh, a little bit upset. Um, they were both talking. The first thing I did was I took off my skis and I moved around on the, would have been uh, the right hand side. And she was, they both had their heads uphill. Both sets of skis were still on both she and, and Mr. Sanderson. And uh, their skis were below them. And they were basically lying pretty much on their backs. Okay. And, um, I think Ramon said that their heads were downhill. Do you agree or disagree? I disagree. And you even smiled. And why did you smile? Well, for one thing, he wasn't there at that time. But no, they were, you know, I don't know how to describe it with my arms, but, you know, they were on the slope and she was underneath and he was on top of her. And uh, he also, Ramon said that uh, Mr. Sanderson was a spread eagle pointing downhill. Did you observe that? I never observed that. You would have, you would have remembered that, wouldn't you have? Well, of course. Okay. And then uh, when you first came over then, I heard you say Gwyneth was upset. Yes. Uh, is that the first thing you heard out of their mouths? It's been long enough. <clears throat> excuse me. It's been long enough ago that I can't give you, you know, an exact, okay. you know, play by play of who said what when. I do know certain statements were made. Okay. okay. And uh, did you hear Mr. Sanderson say anything during the entire incident? Oh, of course. What were um, those things? Well, at the first, he was apologizing to her. You heard that with your I own did. ears? Yes, I did. And um, but the, when they started responding to my questions, the first thing I needed to do is get their skis off. It's very hard to get up um, on any slope with your skis on. Uh, a lot easier to take them off. But also, they were entwined with each other. I mean, they were kind of, you know, tangled up with each other. And so the 
the best thing to do was to get their skis off. That's the safest thing to do. And so she was on top. And hey, so I, I took, think you might have said at some point Gwyneth was underneath, but she was on top. That's your testimony. Did I? Yeah, I, she. I didn't oh, catch I'm it. I'm sorry. Did my, I get that backwards? My partner said you did. I didn't actually okay. catch that. Just be clear. Okay. Who was on top? She was on top. Okay. okay. Mr. Sanderson was on the slope lying down, and she was on top of, of him. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I and their skis were intermixed. That. And their skis were kind of tangled up with each other with their legs. Okay. First thing you did, I heard you say, you took removed her skis? Because she was on top. <laughs> it's the only way I could do it. Okay. And help her sort of separate? Right. I gave her my arm and helped her up. And then I immediately went and helped um, get, get Mr. Sanderson's skis off. And then I would have, I put my arm out and helped him up also. Did you just grab him and jerk him up onto his feet? Of course not. Would I mean, you do that? That would have hurt my back. <laughs> I'm too old to do things like that. No, I just simply gave him my arm to help him get up. You heard him say what words in terms of the apology? <sighs> he said, uh, when he, she was talking to him, he, he simply said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, but then he also made a statement about, she just appeared in front of me. Okay, you remember those words? Yes. What does that indicate to you in terms of who was the uphill skier? Well, what indicates that he was the uphill skier is that I witnessed him coming much faster than anybody else on the slope, coming down the hill, and I looked away mere moments before the impact. So that's number one, why he would be the uphill skier. Uh, the other thing is that it would be very difficult to be underneath her if he hadn't hit her from behind. And explain? Well, um, Objection, foundation. I don't know what that means. He didn't see it. I'll allow a okay. instructionist. Go ahead. What I oh. did. Oh, Just a second. Yeah. O overruled, I think. Okay. He was there, his yeah. perception. What I did see is everything leading up to it and the immediate aftermath. So I cannot speak to the actual collision, but I can speak to what I saw immediately before and the aftermath. Right, but I think you told me at one point, like if a soccer player takes out someone's mm -hmm. legs, uh, they're underneath. Yes, it would... It would be very similar to that. It's a situation where it would be almost impossible to be in front of Miss Paltrow and then end up underneath her. So I heard a few things. If, if we're trying to outline things, you heard from Mr. Uh, Sanderson's own mouth. Uh, she appeared right in front of me, yes? That is correct. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. He was not real talkative, to be honest with you. How about... Did you ask him, are you okay? I had to. That's The whole time I'm removing skis and, and getting ready to help them up, I'm asking, are you okay? Are you okay? So the answer, did was you ask him if he was okay? I did, and he was affirmative. He said yes. All right. And uh, did a ski patrol duo come by? They did. Um, it was a f uh, just a few minutes uh, later than that. Now, by this time, Mr. Ramon has arrived on the scene. And so um, two patrollers are just making a, a ski by, and one of them came up to us and said, do you, got, do you need any help? And Mr. Ramon, Mr. Sanderson, uh, spoke to each other. I was still kneeling on, on the snow, you know, getting their skis ready. And um, whatever they said, they turned uh, to the patroller and said, no, we don't need help. All right, so they talked to each other quietly out of your hearing? That is correct. And did you try to influence them, like, say no, say no? Of course not. Okay, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Yes, it is. And what did they say? Who spoke? Um, who declined help? I would assume it was Mr. Sanderson, but they looked directly at the patroller and refused help. All right. If they had said, I'm not okay, if Mr. Sanderson said, I am not okay, 
what happened? What that, would have happened? That would have changed the entire situation. People on a ski slope have minor bumps and things constantly. Um, Objection, speculation. Maybe you could rephrase the question as phrased it is, speculation. Well, what have you observed over 50, 40 some years? 44 years. Um, with, as to vagueness. with regard to uh, skier collisions. Okay. Objection. Sustained. Okay. What if, have you uh, yourself. I, I can answer the original question. So the judge sustained it, so I'm rephrasing my question. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering uh, have you personally come across skiers who have collided before? Yes. And just comment on what you've observed. If they are overruled. overruled, if they are uh, both in a situation where they each claim they are okay, typically the two skiers part ways and ski off. If anyone is hurt, now it's a total uh, different scenario, and patrol will have to be called. Um, statements will be taken. Uh, patrol will assess how much injury there is, whether they need to be taken out of a toboggan or whatever. Um, and so patrol takes over at that point, uh, and we become simply witnesses. All right. Um, was this important to you uh, to know the answer to that question, whether the skier from his own mouth felt he was okay? Well, of course, because if, they, if either skier had said, oh, I'm hurt, I need assistance, that would have changed everything. Okay. That well, would have, you know, made it so we would have all stayed on the scene. And uh, if Mr. Ramon and Mr. Sanderson had said to the ski patrol person, "We need assistance," would mm -hmm. that have changed anything? I would have been there the whole time. Yes. Okay. Gwyneth testified. Essentially, she said. Uh, you just skied into my effing back. All right. Uh, did Mr. Sanderson say anything like that? No, he did not. What did he say? She he, appeared right in front of me. He appeared. She appeared right in front of me. You didn't know that he had a blind eye at that time. No, I did not. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, I'm now going to have James show an additional, uh, just to the witness himself, an additional animation.
Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sander, excuse me, James is going to show you a, another um, animation. It's also about 20 seconds and also does not have sound. And this is going to be number one. And it's from what view, James? It's called Looking Uphill. It's the name. Looking Uphill. By the way, uh, I wanted to introduce the, the fact that Deer Valley's lawyer is here. Is that true? He's Far there. right. You're right. My right. I see him. And I don't represent you. Is that true? That is correct. Um, okay. Before we show this, maybe finish yes. laying your foundation. Let's, let's do that, please. So you've had a chance now to review what we're going to call video number one, okay? That is correct. Will that help you explain your testimony to the jury? It will. And will it help explain the positioning of the parties at the time of the accident? Yes. And if I interrupted you, go ahead. Objection. Move to strike. That's opinion evidence. Um, overruled. And so this animation will be received again for demonstrative purposes, not as evidence, but to illustrate this witness testimony. Does it help explain your recollection of the events? Yes. Is it substantially perfect, excuse me, substantially similar to your recommendation or recollection of the events on the date in question? It is very similar, yes. So uh, I will ask for permission now to publish this to the jury as a demonstrative exhibit. It will be stopped where I've indicated to Mr. Egan to stop it. Okay. Um, Do you see all these people identified? The woman on the left, top left. Did you observe her? Uh, Mr. Sanderson did, but I'm doing a little laser. Mm -hmm. Did you personally observe that person? I saw her, yes. She was viewed, uh, described by Mr. Sanderson as sort of a, a beginner, more beginner person that he did not want to hit. Uh, okay. What do you recall? I don't recall much because she was not an, uh, a skier that I was concerned with. Okay. She was on the other side of the run. Um, I did see her, but she was not skiing fast, so I really didn't pay much attention to her. And then on this side, is there a bit of a little cliff or ridge here on the well, skiers, it, right? It's not a cliff, but it is a drop-off. Right. Um, as most ski runs, they're created with bulldozers and machinery and to create a run and so there's always an edge from okay. the mad main uh, and, feature and do you recognize these are these the snow making equipment buckets on the right right it's basically utilities okay. uh, here it would be uh, one would contain water and one would contain compressed air and at the top of this run as a, on this exhibit is that the very top of the entire run of the bandana run, yes. You can see a lift up in the upper left-hand corner. Top that would be the ruby lift. That's like yeah. if you prove you're not a robot. I wouldn't have missed, I would have missed that actually. Okay. Okay. Then it says Paltrow. Is that brown? Uh, okay. Sanderson is identified in blue. Do you see that? Yes. Christensen, is that you kind of represented? Okay. Yes. Moses is in orange uh, under this you with me yes carrie oaks is she the instructor for apple that is correct all right uh, by the way plaintiffs asserted in their opening that Ms. Uh, paltrow was reckless and dangerous on this hill did you observe that 
Not at all. All right, let's run through this from start to end, or start till the crash. So we're going to stop right before the crash. Okay. Um, can we do it just a little longer to see where they're? Well, let's talk. Let's talk to you. So when you turned your head, we want to we want to fast forward over that. So uh, you tell us. There's there's Gwyneth and there's Sanderson. Uh, did you see a little bit more of this, or was this the end of what you saw? I saw a little bit more of this, and um, can we go slow motion until he says, "I want you to say stop." Uh, okay. Okay. The judge is the governing okay. person here, but uh, can we? You say stop when you no I, longer observe right. something. Is that okay, Your Honor? Thank you. Okay. Once he was below us. Okay, so he's now he's heading back. I would say right in there. Okay, you turned stop. away. And then um, at some point you looked, you came over, and so James, if there's a way to, uh, were they at a complete stop when you came over? Yes, they were. And so is there a way, James, to move this to when they were at a complete stop? He's going to put it back on here. Okay. All right. Uh, this is you on the right. Is that? That would be uh, correct. And then they've now collided. They're pretty close to the edge there. Would you agree? Yes, because as I walked around, I was actually standing below the lift. Or I mean, below the, the run slightly. And there's the buckets right there, right? Right. Those are the, are the tubes. And now, can we play the remainder? Thank you. And uh, Moses uh, is going to say he f essentially followed you over. Uh, did you have any and heard something? I'm just wondering. Okay. Um, so all I. The, the, your Honor should rule. Sustained. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Did you observe uh, Gwyneth uh, upset? Yes, she was upset. Comment on that, would you? When you're skiing, you don't expect to be um, taken out because that happens very fast. Uh, we cannot look behind you now. I have, I'm in the habit of always looking uphill because quite often my. Sustained. Okay, just um, let's be a little more precise on the question. Was Gwyneth upset? Gwyneth was upset. And yes. what did what did you observe? As I came across, uh, she was speaking to Mr. Sanderson. Um, once again, the first things I did was to ask if everyone was okay. Did, he, did she yell at him? I don't know that she yelled. I remember her, that she was speaking uh, quite sharply. And but I don't know that, that I would say she yelled. I, I can't recall that. In your experience, is it the, the person who hit that says, who hits the other that says, I'm sorry? Objection, overbroad. Over, over, uh, overruled. Go ahead. Who, who apologizes typically? Usually the person who uh, runs into the other person is the first to apologize. And who's mad? Objection. Who's uh, usually mad? Uh, excuse me, objection, that uh, <laughs> speculation, vague, overbroad. and overbroad. Over, overruled? So who's usually mad? Uh, usually a person that feels like they were uh, the victim okay. is upset. And 
have you seen collisions where there's a there's a dispute like you did it no you did it have you been there that happens from time to time was there any dispute between these two uh, among what you saw and heard from them mr sanderson never said you ran into me or did, anything of that nature so was there any dispute to investigate that like who's telling the truth not at that time and did ramon by the way did he ever come to you and say like hey I saw it, and she hit him. He did not. He never said a word to you, right? No. All right. Uh, let's go to the next. Uh, James is going to come show you another one. So we, I moved to admit this one, I believe. And it was as received. We reserve our objections, Your Honor. Yes. And James, do you mind? Thank you. City Council, would you just approach before you do that? now while they get ready for us. Thank you. We'll take five minutes.
the jury is assembling. May I make one brief statement? Sure. So there are a total of seven uh, animations. We, we wanted to get in six through him. Uh, Your Honor has mentioned concerns with repetition and we'll show one, as asked that we show just one more. Um, I will represent that he, he will establish foundation for all of them for the portions he saw. What I wouldn't want is because we have to hurry, we only do the three and then they object, the plaintiffs object to us getting in the other three to four. So I'm, I'm all for not repeating myself, but there are different views so I, I kind of moved to publish all of them. Okay. And I think I've made my ruling that at least, you know, each one of these, anim any animation is a demonstrative exhibit and it, it's illustrative of a witness's testimony, not of a case. Um, and right now we've had two come in for this witness. Well, it looks like we may get one more or one, a portion of it anyway. And all I can do is say that I'll take the other animations as they come, as demonstrative of a witness's testimony, if they are. Okay. I think we could move very quickly through them if they'll just agree that he'll say the exact same thing for each one of them, but which I don't think would be re repetitive. But uh, may I ask him to s that you've reviewed all of them and they all fit these five points? but we're only gonna address one? I mean, it's, re it's repetitious with this witness, so. Right, we're only gonna show one, but can I establish the foundation for each of, like the, the other four in mass? I, if, if there's an agreement to that effect, otherwise you'll have to go through the normal process. And I'm not hearing these people say. Not agreeing, not agreeing. All right. So I do feel like I'm. You can't. You can't do it. But they won't agree that if we did it, we could do it. <laughs> if if uh, people are following me. And it was it was raised pre-trial in an effort to smooth things out, and I think it has helped dramatically. Um, and I'm not. I haven't changed my ruling from what I did at pre-trial. So. I haven't changed my mind on it either. Okay, we're ready for the jury. Let me just clarify for the record, Mr. Owens, if you give me just a minute. The, um, the last animation, which was called the Looking Uphill Animation Number 1 Demonstrative Exhibit, was received for demonstrative purposes from 0 to 8, I believe that's 8 seconds, and then from 17 to 22. one more video okay by the way have you reviewed all seven videos I have yes and uh, as to we're only going to look at one but do they all help explain your testimony to the jury Objection over Ron Black's foundation your honor I, or, uh, Mr. Owens already ruled on that okay um, we're only going to talk now about uh, the overview view okay overhead thank you can Mr. Uh, Egan, show the witness that yes, please. animation. Thank you. This is also about 20 seconds. It's also no sound. Same spots. Again, same circuits. Yeah, it's not giving me a ticket. 
the same keep, spot. We'll keep track of the uh, seconds. Have you had an opportunity to review the animation uh, from the overhead viewpoint? Yes, I have. And just so you know, uh, since you did not see the accident itself, the moment of impact, we're, we're going to skip over that part. Okay. And so, like you did with the other one, we want you to tell us when to stop, when you stopped viewing something. Uh, will uh, the video, I should say the animation you just saw, will it help you explain your testimony to the jury? It the should, jury. yes. Overruled? Yes, it will. Will it help explain the position of the parties at the time of the accident? That is probably the most important part, yes. Does it help explain your recollection of the events? Yes, it does. Is it substantially similar to your recollection of the events on the date in question? It is. So move to publish uh, this to the jury as a demonstrative exhibit. Your Honor, same objections. Um, also, it lacks foundation because uh, he can't possibly know what the view from whatever 50 feet above is. It's uh, received for demonstrative purposes only, not as evidence, but as illustrative. Your Honor, once again, what number is this, please? Uh, thank you. Do you see the buckets in the top right? The snow yes. making buckets? Uh, does that help you in providing a landmark for where we are? It does. Now, you weren't flying over this in a helicopter looking down, right? That is correct. And uh, the animation isn't perfect. Do you agree? It's not as good as, as if we had had a drone looking down on the site? Yes. The animation shows everything almost in slow motion, uh -huh. and the events were much more uh, dynamic. Okay, fair enough. But as far as positioning, it's very good. All right, let's show the, uh, the video, and James is going to jump over. The, will you tell us when to stop? Okay, let's stop for a minute and just orient everyone. Okay, at the top in yellow is uh, Miss Oaks, the ski instructor. Is that true? Correct. Then Apple and Purple, that's uh, Gwyneth's daughter, true? Correct. Moses, Gwyneth's son, right? Correct. Then we're, you're just out of the screen, Christensen. I'm, yeah, I'm on the screen here. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, our screen's just a tad smaller. Lower. You're about okay. to come in. Okay. And then uh, Woman is uh, what's been viewed to as a kind of a more beginner skier. And you, you observed her? I observed her, but didn't pay a lot of attention to okay. her. Okay. And uh, Mr. Sanderson will talk about her, and then Ms. Ms. Paltrow. Okay, let's proceed. Okay, let's stop just for a minute. Mr. Sanderson is over here. Did you observe him making turns? Yes, I did. What kind of turns? They were large Could radius. Asked and answered. Overruled. They were large radius turns, um, edge to edge, quite dynamic. What's the word radius mean? Radius is from the center of what would be a circle to the outside of the circle, and that's the arc that your turn makes. So big or small? He was making fairly large radius turns. And what kind of turns? was Gwyneth making? She was making a shorter radius turn, so she was in a very narrow corridor, and he was, uh, we use the term carpet to carpet, which means that you ski from one side to the opposite side as you make your turns, and he was close to carpet to carpet using the entire run. And which is safer for the skier? Well, if you make a small t turn, you're out of the line of traffic. Uh, making large radius turns is fine, but you have to be aware of all of your surroundings and you have to be watching to make sure that uh, you're not coming into traffic. Okay, and when you're, uh, let's play a little more and will you tell us when to stop? You're seeing this on your own monitor. Mm -hmm. Stop when you stop seeing things. A little bit further. A little bit further, right, just a, okay. He's now below me, right there. and so I, that's when I 
turned away from him. And how many seconds is that on the, just for the record? Okay. So were Gwyneth's skis headed downhill when you last looked? Well, on a short radius turn, your skis are going back and forth, and, and she was making her turns very rhythmically. Yeah. Uh, she was in a pattern, you know, and a, a rhythm, I mean. And so, I mean, she's, her, her body was facing down the hill. And did, have you known her to be a reckless skier? Never. Or to ski out of control? No. Okay, and what you stopped us here, and I just want to be clear, was Mr. Sanderson's skis then moving toward her? That is correct. Now, is it possible Ms. San Mr. Sanderson moved ahead of her and then slowed down? I can't say for sure, but the, the amount of time that elapsed from the time that I looked away to the time of the collision, there was not much slowing. Uh, speculation, Lex Foundation moved to strike. Overruled. Okay. Go, go ahead. From the time that I looked away until I heard the scream was a very short period of time. By the way, no one said that, for instance, that Mr. Sanderson pulled in front of her and then came to a stop and then was hit, right? I No, no one has ever made okay. that claim. All right. And... Um, now we're going to jump ahead to uh, when they came to a stop. So we're taking this off the screen. seconds do we know is this through till they turn till we go yeah I gotta press play I think okay let's play the remainder okay uh, so there's Moses he's sort of stopped um, there are the buckets in the top right correct Yes. I'm calling him buckets. Did you call them snow making equipment? Well, we call them tubes. Tubes. Typically. Okay. They're big round tubes that just fit over everything. Because there's a standpipe, an sometimes an electrical outlet, sometimes it's a, a compressed air pipe that comes up. Right. It's just protection so people don't bump into it. All right. And let's, uh, let's just talk some more. Are there risks associated with skiing? There certainly are. On the back side of every ski pass you've ever seen, are, are those risks identified? They are. And what do they include? Uh, they say that skiing is a... Your Honor, the, this is, uh, we've already discussed this, this is, goes beyond the scope of his testimony and what's allowable. Uh, if you'd like, we can approach. I, I think it's fine, so I'm going to overrule the objection. Go ahead. Okay, well, the discussion about the inherent risks of skiing. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear that question yet. Well, he just said it. Well, he asked him what was printed on the back of a ticket. So, so overrule. Go ahead. Comment on the back of okay. every ski ticket you've ever seen. I think it's a, talking about liability of the ski area. It does state that there are risks involved, that there may be um, patches without snow, there may be rocks, there may be trees. Uh, there is a possibility of collision with stationary objects or, or other people. Um, and so there is a risk when you ski. And uh, so when Mr. Sanderson bought his pass. He understood that the risk of a collision with another skier that's Jackson printed Morris right, Foundation. right Sustained. on his ticket. Sustained. Are you aware it, it references the risk of collision with another skier as a as an inherent risk of skiing? 
It is, it is overruled. It is printed on the back of the of the ticket. Yes. And the pass holder accepts full responsibility for all risks associated with the activities. As we approach. Yes. Risks of skiing. So separate from the ski pass, okay. Uh, I, I do want you to just reference what what do you understand the risks of skiing to be? Well, you're dealing with a s activity that involves sliding on snow. It covers different conditions, different weather conditions, different types of times of the season. Conditions can change constantly. Um, you can have a front that can move through and it can go from a fairly nice day to a super windy day uh, with snow you know, blowing back and forth. So conditions are changing constantly. And part of what we try to do as ski instructors is to give people enough uh, skills that they can deal with all conditions. <sighs> And, and there are times when you have to go in. I mean, there's times where it's just too nasty outside and it's not comfortable and you will go in. But we want to help people be safe at all times. And, uh, but sometimes even though skiers are being careful, collisions do occur. Rejections, calls for opinion evidence, sustained. Comment on terrain. Uh, terrain varies as well. Terrain varies very much. Um, you would never want to take a low level, low level skier. Same objection, Your Honor. Overruled. You would never want to take a low level skier on something that is over their head where they would be frightened, unable to move, and make mistakes. Uh, we try to keep our terrain that we ski people on within their ability levels. And of course, if you're trying to teach, it's much easier to teach if they're comfortable on their terrain. If, it's, if they're only thinking about surviving that terrain, it makes a very unteachable time. Was, is a skier expected to uh, ski within their own abilities? They are. Does that include uh, physical abilities such as ability to see and hear? I would say that covers it. If you, if you have uh, certain disabilities, you would want to make sure that you compensated that by the way that you were skiing, the speed you were skiing, uh, how you were looking around, etc. From what you observed in your investigation after the accident, do you, do you believe Ms. Uh, Paltrow was skiing within her ability at the time of the collision? 
Construction Foundation calls for expert opinion. Sus so, sustained. Okay. Did did you try to put together whose fault this was? What happened was I Objection. Pardon? Yes or no? Did oh. You, did, you, did you try to figure out what yes. had happened? Yes, yes. And what did you do to do that? I observed how they were um, on the ground. I don't, expert opinion overruled. And okay. Your Honor, we're going to bring up his report right now, which has been pre-admitted. But go ahead. What was your okay. investigation? The first thing I did was observe how they were on the ground. And what did you observe? That uh, Mr. Sanderson was, his head was uphill, skis downhill. Uh, that Miss Paltrow. Your Honor, this is getting obstruction. Okay. Come on up. One of the points, uh, so is that over, overruled to be, okay. So uh, we're going to bring up that report. What did you observe on the issue of where the people were at the, when they came to a, clo uh, a stop? So Sanderson okay. versus Paltrow. Okay. When they came to a stop, they were very close to skiers right the edge of the, of the run. Uh, both were had their skis below them. Both had their skis still on their boots. There was no releasing of skis. Uh, their heads were uphill. Their feet were downhill. And Miss Paltrow was on top of Mr. Sanderson. And uh, what does that tell you? The fact that their skis were still on. It means that there was no heavy impact which would knock them over like side to side uh, there was no basically it means that they went down without any heavy impact on their on their ski boots if someone were to come and just kind of hit and literally project that person forward objection expert uh, opinion testimony so my question is not complete just a minute go ahead Okay, if someone were to come and hit a, a second skier and propel them uh, airborne, so they're flying, um, would they have ended up where they were when you saw them? Objection, speculation, um, sustained. Okay, okay. How, many, how many incidents like this have you uh, been present for? It, it would be impossible for me to say because after 44 years of being a ski instructor, most of that full time, you see a lot of different instances. Um, I w could not speculate on that. So I wouldn't cut, I didn't, I think I cut you off because I, I said, what did you do to try to figure out uh, uh, what happened? So when okay. you said, I, I look at where they land. I look at, go ahead then. I, I look at the positions of the body where they land. Uh, it would be very difficult to get in that position without somebody hitting from behind. Okay. Move to strike expert uh, or just opinion evidence. That's sustained. Not. Okay. So, um, what else do you look at other than well, where they land? The next thing I next thing I observed was what they were saying, and what um, of course uh, Miss Paltrow was saying that she had just been hit. She 
never saw it coming. She was surprised. Mr. Sanderson was made the statement that she just appeared in front of him. He was saying he was sorry. And that's basically the conclusions that I came to. Rejection. Move to strike. The conclusions are opinions that lack uh, foundation and that the, this witness is not uh, um, uh, able to, <laughs> not properly uh, designated. These are speaking objections, Your Honor. Would you please approach the bench? Let's go to your report. So this is called uh, D25A. Do you see this? I do. Did you prepare <clears throat> this that day? Yes. And uh, did you engage in a cover-up to try to hide Gwyneth's reckless skiing? Objection relevance. Overruled? No, I did not. Is that um, ridiculous and offensive? It's very much so. Um, part of what we're required to do is if there is an incident, um, if there's an injury, it's mandatory that everything that we uh, be written down in a report. And uh, on instances where there's a, a bump or, a, or something like that where there are no injuries, it's up to us to decide whether it is prudent to fill out the report. And I decided it was prudent that day. Okay. And uh, exact location of incident. You wrote what? I wrote skiers right bandana slight pitch before the flat on top. Okay. Is that an accurate statement? It is. Number of students. You said there was what? Um, there were six in group, two instructors. Okay. Now there's been some testimony that Brad, her then boyfriend, now husband, also had two kids out with separate instructors is that true that is correct and but they weren't in that group of six that was coming down bandana is that right that is correct all right students ability now was Gwyneth the student here or is Moses? well Moses was my student that I was skiing okay. with but Gwyneth was the person in the incident so okay. I wrote her name on the top there's some uh, suggestion that uh, immediately before this incident somehow Moses was going hey mommy look at me look at me did you observe that that did not happen and how do you know that because I was next to him okay um, so again any implication that she was distracted because she was looking across the hill to Moses you would dispute objection speculation Bleeding. Just clarifying Sus an important point. Bleeding. Well, plaintiff has raised an issue, and I want to know if your thought on it. The thought is that the plaintiff has asserted is that you, uh, right before the incident, Moses was saying, Mommy, Mommy, look at me. And you're your thought on that? Objection leading, lacks foundation, misstates prior testimony. Overruled the jury will have to remember the prior testimony. Go ahead. Okay. Did that happen? I never saw that happen. Okay. As we were skiing along, we were basically making our own turns. Miss Paltrow was skiing down, making very nice short radius turns. And we were separated by the width of the of the bandana run. I was skiing with nine-year-old son 
group was skiing down Bandana to lunch. Is that all true? That is correct. What was the student doing at the time of the incident? Um, the short turns down the fall line on skiers' right. By the way, had Gwyneth skied with you all morning with Moses? I think we took one initial run together and then we split up with uh, the intention of meeting at the top of, of Flagstaff Hill at a certain time to go to the lunch. All right. And had you and Moses already been on some ski runs without Gwyneth? Yes. And how many about? Probably in that uh, time span, of about four or five. Short turns down, fall line. Is that what that says, fall line? Yes, fall what is, line. What does that mean again? The fall line is if you were to take a round object like a ball, set it down, it's the path that it would follow, follow, follow down the hill. So it's basically the most correct downhill line. On skiers right, so the reference is where on the run? Correct, Next. skiers right would be, as you're facing down the hill, would be here, skiers left, of course, over here. Next portion. Chief complaint, would you read your answer? Mel Skier took her out from behind. I didn't see it, but heard her scream as she went down. I skied directly to her. The man was behind her. Uh, both were in discomfort. During lunch, uh, she uh, talked of being stiff and sore. All right, let's just talk about that. Uh, male skier took her out from behind why did you say that because of the positioning of their bodies on the ground but also he was i clearly observed him as the uphill skier now you can't uh, right on the skier responsibility code it says that the uphill skier has the responsibility to avoid the downhill skier because as we're skiing, our vision cannot see behind us. And that's the reason for the responsibility code. And since I s observed him moving very rapidly down the hill and only missed a few moments b before the contact, I can clearly say that he was the uphill skier. Did you determine one of them violated the, re the skier responsibility code? That would be my observation. Um, way beyond the scope of this witnesses. witnesses. He's not an expert witness. Overruled. And who, who, who did you believe violated the responsibility code and who complied with it? I would say that the up... As to that question. Okay. What did you find at the time with regard to the skier responsibility code? Sustained. Okay. May I consult with my counsel just one sec? All right, next statement here. First oh, of all, is this a true it? statement? Is what you said, were you speaking the truth when you prepared this report? Okay, uh, where were you in relationship to the student at the time of the incident? I was above the student. Okay. Um, did you witness the incident? I, had, I said no, because I did not see the impact. If not, how did you become aware of the incident? I saw the immediate aftermath. Okay. Was ski okay. patrol called or first aid visited? You, you marked what? I marked no because we did not call patrol because patrol came along very soon after that. And to the right there, what did you write? Name of patroller. Um, I did not catch the name. I wish that I had. but. Uh, once again, if there had been comments of, oh, I'm, I'm hurt, something's wrong, things like that, things would have changed very quickly. 
But what happened was um, I was in the process of helping Mr. Sanderson get his skis back on. Um, I, I had my skis off and both he and Mr. Ramon were there together. The patrollers came by and one of them came up to us and said, asked if they needed any assistance. Hearsay? Uh, this is what I... He, he is explaining a story. This is exactly what I observed. I guess for a limited purpose, not necessarily as to the truth of what this person said, but as to why he acted the way he did. So it's limited purpose evidence. Okay, thank okay. you. Keep going. Limit, okay, so the controller said. So the patroller asked if they needed assistance. Mr. Sanderson and Mr. Ramon spoke to each other. I was just kneeling on the snow. I was. I did not hear what they said, but they turned to the patroller and said, no, we're fine, or something to that effect. And so the two patrollers continued down the hill. And then it says, student returned to skiing. Uh, that's Ms. Paltrow, but comment, did, did you see uh, Mr. Sanderson then ski away? I was the last one to put on my skis. So they, Mr. Sanderson, Mr. Ramon, were already in their skis. I was the very last one to leave. And so I, I, I can't recall exactly how they skied off, but we basically either skied off together at the same time or they left slightly ahead of me. Okay, we're gonna look at the end of this report and move on here. Additional information, you wrote Carrie Oaks, correct? Right, she was the other instructor that was there. Additional comments. First thing, male skier stated. Ski stated. Oh, ski. Male ski skier stated. Should, is, should be male skier. Was that she appeared right in front of him, uh, him, thus admitting that he was the uphill skier. She never saw him because he came in from behind. It Was that your finding on that day? That was my finding, yes. So there's, a, I think, a comment that uh, because she was tipping you for your service uh, that you falsified your report. Is that true? That is ridiculous. Uh, it says this was reviewed by Liz Wright. Uh, is that your supervisor or what? She is a supervisor. Okay. Um, not my direct supervisor, but a supervisor at the ski school, yes. And that's your signature, bottom right? It is. And so the same day of the event, did you try to accurately represent everything? I did. Um, in my mind at that point, I thought that all issues had been resolved. I never expected it to um, come to this type of a situation. And so I was simply writing down briefly what happened. If I had realized that this would come to this type of a situation, I would have written much more and much more in detail. Uh, did I hear you say that you never observed the uh, Mr. Sanderson unconscious? Oh, absolutely not. And were you there within seconds? Uh, probably within oh, 10 to 15 seconds. I, the first thing that I did was I turned to Miss Oaks and said, you take Moses, I'm going to go over uh, and help out or something to that. And then um, it was kind of a flat traverse, and so I, I simply skied across, and I was there within maybe 10 seconds. Mr. Sanderson said you got in his face and uh, yelled at him. I did, did not. The tone of my voice would be very similar to what it is right now. They're about to get up and suggest that you were sort of in Gwyneth's agent in uh, making a cover up. Uh, Objection. Do you legal agree? opinion? I'm going to have them comment on it. Why don't you leave it for redirect? Okay. That is my cue to sit down. Okay. Thank you for your time. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Mr. Bueller. No thanks. Just for the record, that second. Or that 
third animation went from zero to eight and then from 16 to 22. Mr. Christensen, do you recall your deposition of October 27, 2020? Yes, I do. <clears throat> In your deposition, you mentioned that uh, um, Terry Sanderson, he was underneath her, and she was talking about discomfort. She was shocked. She was somewhat hurt. Is that correct? She was in discomfort, that is true. Was she hurt? There's a dif difference between being hurt and injured. And so anytime that you have a, a, some type of a incident, you're gonna be hurt to some degree, but that doesn't mean that you're injured. You just testified that uh, Miss Carrie Oaks was instructed by you to take the kids down on the left side, correct? I didn't tell her, I just told her to take Moses. I didn't tell her where to go. Okay. Um, Ms. Oak said she went over to the crash scene and was assisting you with the two uh, people in the crash. <laughs> no. Uh, she, at one point, she had the kids follow her and they went down the hill and they came uh, by us a little bit, but she did not assist, no. Did she stop by you? No. Did she uh, also say that uh, one of the kids said, Mommy, watch us ski? That, that would have happened at the very top of the hill, not, while, not uh, at the time of the incident. Yeah, but before, just before. Not, no, it didn't happen while it was just before the incident. It would have well, happened let's say at the within top. 10 seconds. No. Well, how long would it take to go from, when you say the top of the hill, do you mean when you get off the chairlift? Yeah, as you get off the chairlift, you have to push yourself a little bit to the top of the bandana run, and it would have been in that area. So it would have been, you know, a minute or so ahead. So the, the viewpoint of those animations, those demonstrative, you know, like a cartoon, it was, uh, would, would, was that where Miss Oaks would have heard one of the children say, Mommy, watch us ski? It would have been before we started to, to get to that point. Well, how do you know that? You testified that it didn't happen. What I'm saying is it didn't happen during that time. Okay, so you, you, do, uh, you agree then that the, one of the children said, Mommy, watch us ski. I cannot speak to that. All I know is it didn't happen while we were skiing down the hill. Could it, I mean, it could have happened with uh, Miss Oak. She could have heard it. Maybe she did. Miss Paltrow, I mean, why would the kids say that? If, but for, they wanted her, her, their mother to hear them and watch them ski. At the time of the incident, there was nothing said. We were busy making our own turns. But, but just before the incident, there was a, some seconds that elapsed, maybe... 10, 15, that's when Ms. Paltrow would have heard one of her children say, Mommy, watch us ski. I never observed hearing that. Okay. You never saw the ski crash, right? I didn't see the impact. No, I did not. Um, you said uh, she screamed before the crash, right? Well, I heard her scream, which would possibly be when he, the contact was made. Could the scream have occurred before the contact? No. You have no basis of knowing that because you didn't see it. <laughs> Miss Paltrow doesn't go down the hill screaming. There would be no reason for her to scream, just to scream. That's your speculation, because you didn't see it right? I did not see the point of impact, no.
You've heard of photographic memory, right? I've heard of eidetic memory, yes. I don't know if this is a word, but it sounds like you have a videographic memory. You've got a view of everything in front of you and to the side and behind, and it lasts for several minutes. Mr. Bueller, when an incident like this occurs, it is very much in your mind, and you remember the things very clearly. Now, this was about your third time instructing for Miss Paltrow's family on her third vacation for her. Isn't that true? That is correct. And isn't it true that uh, you got so close to the family, maybe not close friends, but close enough that you sent Moses, her son, some handmade pottery that you made? I didn't send them. I gave them to him on their last day. On this trip? Not on this trip, but I'm not sure, to be honest with you. The trip before? I, I think two trips I gave him some things. Did you give out candy to the kids? No. Did you ever tell Craig Ramon your buddy just took out Gwyneth Paltrow? I don't recall that. Do you recall telling Miss Paltrow's name to Terry Sanderson or? I don't recall. It, I, it may have come up, but I don't recall. With Miss Paltrow skiing away and her group skiing away, you were the last one at the crash site with Terry Sanderson and Craig Ramon, right? I did stay with them until they were up and on their skis. That is correct. They being Miss Paltrow. No, that they being Mr. Sanderson, Mr. Ramon. Well, Mr. Ramon wasn't on the. He didn't take off his skis, or he wasn't on the ground. No, he he never took off his skis that I. Uh, but Mr. Sanderson had his skis off because I took them off, and so um, uh, I was helping him put his skis back on. And that that was what was going on when the patrol came by. You never got the name of the patrol. True? That is true. Once you, again. Did you, uh, did you uh, report this to the ski patrol at any time? If people say they are not hurt. I know. We, I, I just wanted but to. No, it. I did not report it because I, once we, again, we heard your patrol came comment. and uh, he refused. The plaintiff's counsel is interrupting the witness. Okay. Point well taken, counsel. Did you finish your response? Uh, my response is that they were offered help from patrol and they refused. Other witnesses say that the uh, body positions that Miss Paltrow and you say where she's on top of Terry Sanderson, they, they testified that the positions were different than that. Do you know that? It doesn't matter what they say. I can only tell you what I saw and what I observed. You've talked about the importance of filling out a incident report accurately, right? Yes. You mentioned that Miss Paltrow said she was, or indicated, or looked like she was sore, may have been hurt, or was hurt, according to your deposition, right? Uh, that's what she told me during lunch, yes. Okay. And you filled out your report later? At the end of the day, yes. But in your report, you never got the names of Terry Sanderson, right? I did not. You never got the name of the only eyewitness we know of, Craig Ramon, right? I did not because once again, when people say, I'm fine, I'm sorry, um, and when I ask them if they're, if they're hurt, they say no. You know, um, they went their way, we went our way. Do 
know Gwyneth Paltrow says she got up by herself? I, all I can say is I helped everybody get their skis off, and she may have gone up by herself. Um, I may have helped her with an arm. She said her skis weren't off, I believe. You know that? And they never came off. Well, no, they never came off during the, the incident. I removed them so that they could get untangled. And just backing up, uh, right after you heard the scream, you didn't see the collision. You, you, you skied over. And you yelled at Terry Sanderson. What did you do? What did you do? True? Uh, that is not true. You don't yell at all in your life? I did not yell. First of all, I was trying to observe what was happening. And I took my, off my skis. I came around to try to untangle them. I did not yell at Mr. Sanderson. Do you ever teach group lessons? I do. And do sometimes the students spread out? At Deer Valley, uh, private rotation instructors teach max fours, which means there's no more than four people in your group. So I do teach those. As far as spreading out, uh, you try to keep your group as close together as possible, but there are tasks that where they may go down one at a time and things like that. Well, if a student goes far away, don't you yell at that student to come get, get back in line? Don't you have to holler at them? I don't yell. I don't have How a... How they hear you then? We ski down to them. Well, then this, the other students go another direction. You never use your, raise your voice at Deer Valley? Is that your policy? If I raise my voice, I lose my voice very quickly. I can't yell. Um, you know, as far as talking to students, you, could, uh, you try to maintain a class situation where we will stop at certain places, we'll gather together. We try to always gather at the edge of the run so we're out of the line of traffic. Um, but no, I don't go around yelling all over the, the resort. I didn't say that. I just said, do you ever yell once to add a student who might be too far away from your group and you want them to come back? No, they can't come back. If they're below you, you have to go to them. They're not going to uh, come up the hill. You can't say, hey, come back over here, Bill. Oh, I might. If they're just across the run, I will say things like that. But I'm not yelling. You're whispering? or No, I'm talking, talking in the normal voice. But if, you know, if there's a lift machinery or that there's noise or something, you never raise your voice at all while you're ski instructing? This is getting a little silly, don't you think? I don't know. You're the one that says you never yell while you're ski instructing. I find that hard to believe. Uh, so you didn't see the yeah. crash, but you saw injury and soreness, mm -hmm. and you didn't get the plaintiff's name, even though Ms. Paltrow may have been hurt. Doesn't that seem like a violation of what you're supposed to do as a ski instructor at Deer Valley? What I was relying on was the comments of both parties. And both parties said that they were okay. Um, as far as Mr. Sanderson being injured, he had a wonderful opportunity to tell patrol, I am hurt, I need help. And, but instead, he refused help and had patrol continue on their way. Those are the, with, when things like that happen, I made the decision that he was okay, and so once I had his skis on, I put my skis on and I left. You know, within maybe three minutes of you leaving the crash scene, Mr. Sanderson was talking to a ski patroller who actually wrote a report and mm -hmm. said he had sore ribs and disorientation. Well, second, there's, yes. there's an objection. Um, overruled. Asking if the witness knew. Okay. Uh, that may have happened then, but he did not report that to me. And that was after I had asked him. And once again, patrol had asked him. The mystery patrol that you don't know the name of, right? I do not know the name, but they know who it is from the log. Basically, they have a log where they write down 
when they go out to make a, a ski around. So um, they do know who that individual is. But once again, if you're a ski patroller and you come up on an, uh, someone and you say, do you need help? And they say they do not, and you ski on, three or four years later, it's very unlikely that they will remember that incident. I wouldn't. Correct. But you just said that the, um, the incident that you report, which is Terry Sanderson waved off the ski patrol, mm -hmm. is in a, in a log, the ski patroller's log? No, their rotation of who, who would be going down would be in the log. Okay, but there's no... Uh, the, the, there's no report of this in the ski, uh, ski patroller's log that you just reported is in there. That's because they stopped and he did not um, ask for assistance. And so there's no reason that they would walk, uh, go down and ride in a log, stopped and talked to this person, they didn't need help. So, so you're saying then your testimony from about one minute ago is incorrect, that it's in the, there's should be a, a log report of Terry Sanderson waving off. No, that's not what I said. I th that's what I thought you said. I that may be what you thought I said. What I said was that when skier, Ski Patrol goes out and takes a run and just observes things, they put in a log that when they leave and make that run. So, um, the, they do know who was on the hill at that time. So are you speculating about this? The skier's log? That it no. should show this? this um, you know you can, this. You can talk to Steve Graff when he um, testifies because he's the one that told us that they pretty well know who it is. But once again, if somebody, if somebody stops and talks to somebody for just a few moments, and then skis off, they're not gonna remember that four or five years later because it was such a minor incident. They stop and talk to people constantly, and unless there's an incident where they have to respond, it's not gonna be something that they keep in their memory. Right, but the four broken ribs, severely broken ribs, my client Terry Sanderson had, they're the kind that make it hard to breathe let alone talk and I'm not, well and you're speculating that he was not injured no, correct no I'm not speculating I'm saying that he never said he was injured there's a difference because he couldn't speak no he was speaking I, I have no knowledge of that because I don't know the man I don't know how he speaks normally kind of applies to me that you're speculating or it's not necessarily true. If the uh, patrol log had information about who was skiing down at the time of this crash, we don't have that information. Remember, these... I don't think there's any question right now. Yeah. Okay. Move to sustained. 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 Was Brad Falchuk at the scene of the crash? He was slightly downhill. I don't know, 20 to 30 yards possibly. That's slightly 20 to 30 yards? He was ahead of us. Did you say, I mean, is that your testimony, 20 or 30 yards approximately? I'm, I'd be speculating at this point, but I know that he was ahead of us. Well, you knew that Craig Ramon was... Maybe 60, 80 yards, maybe out of the picture. No, I, I didn't say that. I said that he was, time-wise, it took him about 45 seconds to get to us. I never said anything about distance. Uh, what if 
Greg Ramon was right behind you, and you couldn't. You don't have eyes behind your head, do you? I do know that when I responded and came over, I took off my skis. I was helping both parties. I was um, over the edge, just slightly on skiers' right. I could see the whole uh, ski area, uh, uh, ski run in front of me. Uh, Mr. Ramon didn't show up for approximately 45 seconds. So all I am saying is that he was a, uh, it took him longer to come down the run. I have no idea how far up the hill he was, but he was not close enough to be right on the scene. So the animation where it depicts Mr. Ramon way up the hill is based on not your testimony. I never saw Mr. Ramon on the animation, did I? I don't, are you looking to counsel to answer for you? I don't, I don't remember seeing Mr. Ramon on the animation. So that part of the animation is fiction. It's not supported by your opinion. I do not know where Mr. Ramon was, no. Um, that's all for right now, unless, oh wait. If uh, Brad Falchuk said he was first on the scene, is that true? I think that mistakes his testimony, Your Honor, so object to the form of the question. Overruled. Okay. I would say that I was the first one on the scene. That's all for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bueller. Mr. Owens. this? Yes. Yes. Okay. As long as the other side has seen it. Oh, you're giving, are these my copies? Yes. Okay. Binder, and may I put this, give sure. this to the witness? Yes. Take a look at that. I, I had a terrible copy of this before, but Defense 110, uh, are texts between you and uh, Gwyneth. Do you recognize them? Yes, they're on my phone. They're better, they're better quality on your phone than my photographing Gwyneth's phone. Uh, are these true and accurate documents? Yes, they are. And so they're 110 A and B, and let's just go through them really quick. Friday, February 26th, that's the day of the event, true? Um, the accident? Yes. We went? Yes. And are you uh, the dark color on the right or the lighter color on the left? No, I'm the one that's in, in dark color. We went down bandana. Why are you saying that to Gwyneth? Okay. Um, okay. Yes, we went down bandana. Okay, cool. We should take north side up. You said yes. We are going to north side again. Feel free to do your own thing. You wrote what? We are uh, we are ruby lift. Okay, that's at 1036. We have new skis. This is 205 you, right? We have new skis. We've gone down Ontario and we're back to smiles. She wrote yay. Mhm. Mm and then 229, Moses wants to know if you are skiing, still skiing and where. You wrote that to my client? Yes. And she wrote, and a little further down, James, I came in. That guy sort of hurt me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to get a massage at three. Gigi is here if he wants to come in. Was that a true and accurate statement? Yes, yes. By the way, so separate from this, Carrie Oaks, um, uh, she has some memories. Are, are, would you defer to her on what she remembers? Um, I know that she uh, could testify about Mr. Sanderson's turns because we both observed him making 
fast um, white turns down the hill. And Brad Falchuk has some memories, and he's going to... Uh, uh, would you defer to his memories? I, I don't really know Brad at all, so and I've never talked to him really, so I can't say anything to that. Yeah, I'm just saying... Um, but, yeah. like, were you focused on what Carrie was doing and what Brad Falchuk was doing, or mm -hmm. were you focused on the two people who had a collision? I was actually focused on Moses, but part of focusing on Moses is being aware of everything around me. Okay. Those are all my questions, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Sure. Let's take a short break now. You are right now, but same instruction as before. You're welcome to step down. Of the witness and for our witness who's about to come, can we just get a sense for how many minutes left? Five or less. So I had a very narrow redirect, but uh, uh, proceed we will.
Mr. Christensen, you can come on up. The jury's on their way in. Could you verify that they are? Your Honor, I'm sorry. No more questions for uh, Eric, um, Eric Christensen. Okay. Uh, you can. He doesn't have to stay up there. Did you have any redirect? Uh, no. I mean, there'd be a small possibility we'd call him later in the week if something new comes up. But. Okay. I'll just excuse you in front of the jury then. Okay. Next witness in the courtroom. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Thank you. So, Mr. Christensen, there's no, there are no more questions for you from the lawyers, so you're excused for today, but you may be called back. Thank you. Thank you. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You can have a seat. Good afternoon. Yes. And maybe once you get up to the microphone, if you could state your full name and spell it. Thank you. Whitney Smith, W-H-I-T-N-E-Y, S-M-I-T-H. Whitney, thank you for being here. And um, we will try to get through you quickly. We're at the end of the day, and we want to uh, make sure that um, we're respectful of your time here. We, again, appreciate you coming. Um, let's begin by asking you where you're from. Um, I'm from Michigan. And have you ever met Gwyneth Paltrow? No. Have you ever met Terry Sanderson? I have. How did you meet him? I met him at Deer Valley, um, I believe it was in 2016. And what was the nature of that interaction? Um, I responded to an incident on the bandana run where he was injured. Okay, and do you have memories of that day and that those events? I do. Okay, and as I understand it, you also created a report about that? Yes. Okay, and we'll look at that report. But you, you were in, uh, I think, uh, the capacity of a ski patrol person when you came upon him or when you were called to the scene, is that correct? Correct. And... Um, can you give the jury just a sense of your experience and training that got you to that point that you could be a ski patrol person? Sure. Um, I At that point, I had my EMT basic, um, which is our level. And I've been, I think that was my second year patrolling. So we had some medical training. And um, we set up ropes, pads, boundaries, everything around the mountain and respond to incidents. Do you have any EMT training? I do, yes. I'm an emergency medical technician. OK. Yeah. And can you give the jury just a sense of what that means? Sure. Um, it's sort of basic first aid that we're able to render there on the slopes, um, deal with any kind of life threats, um, and then our main deal with ski patrol is stabilize the patient and remove them from a cold environment down to somewhere where we can reassess. Okay. And did you have that training at the time of the accident? I did. Okay. I uh, how many years had you been an EMT before then, do you recall? I think it was about two years at that point. So you had seen other accidents like that, or you had come upon other accidents with that EMT training to respond? I had responded to several, more than several incidents at that point. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any <laughs> rough estimate as to how many? I, no, I don't. Sorry. That, that's fine. Um, Let's let's go with your memories first, and then we'll go to your report real briefly. What what do you recall 
uh, caused you to go to that scene where Mr. Sanderson had called you? I don't have a specific recollection of the radio call, but I know that Flagstaff Mountain, which was where Bandana is, was called and notified that there was potentially an incident on Bandana, and then I was sent to respond to that. And what was your understanding at the time of what the uh, incident was that needed a response? Um, I wasn't sure at that point what it was. It just came in as um, probably, we call it a possible 1050, a possible incident in the location. Got it. And then what do you remember seeing when you got to that point? Sure. When I came up, um, I saw Mr. Sanderson standing on the side of the run. You know, there's a mountain host present who I believe was the one made the radio call and a friend was there. Um, And then I skied up and began talking with them. Okay. And what's your role? What are the things that you typically do when you respond to an incident like this? Sure. So as as I come into a scene, I'm already doing a bit of a scene size up. Um, sometimes there's clues, right? If there had been like skis up the run and someone's way down, I mean, you can tell something happened. So a size up to maybe get a feel for what's going on. And then I go in and I usually introduce myself, ask them their name, um, and just sort of, hey, what's happened? What's going on today? And then from there, do you have any pain or anything like that? Was there was it your understanding that there had been a collision? Um, not offhand, but once I had gotten there, when I asked what had happened, they said there was a collision. And who reported that to you? Uh, Mr. Sanderson. And what did he tell you? I don't recall specifically. I think when I asked, like, hey, what happened, they just said there was a collision up higher. And then they had skied down and decided that they couldn't keep skiing down and needed assistance. Got it. So you got to this a site that was different from the collision site? Yes. Okay. And um, do you remember uh, hearing anything from Mr. Ramon, the friend that was there? Um, while I was doing my assessment, I don't remember specific words, but I know that he had mentioned a couple of times that there was a collision beforehand and who may have been involved. Did he ever tell you that he had witnessed the collision? No, he was mostly talking to Mr. Sanderson, and I was kind of overhearing while I was assessing. Okay. And um, what were what was your assessment in terms of the physical the potential for physical injury? Um, so as I was talking with him, I was um, asking him if he had pain. I do recall he was talking about um, some right sided rib pain, so he went through and made sure breathing and whatnot was okay. Um, and then he said he was able to answer all my questions appropriately, um, but did seem a bit rattled. Okay. Do you remember him complaining about anything? related to his brain or his head? I, I don't recall. Did you observe him to have any cognitive disability or limitations? Per my assessment, he was um, alert and oriented by four, which is part of our assessment there, which means he's at least four out of four. Okay, and explain that to the jury, the four by four idea. Yeah, um, so it's to see if you're oriented um, to person, place, time, and event. So I'll ask, you know, do they know who they are? Do they know what day it is? Um, event, do they know what happened, and then, um, personal assignment. Mm-hmm. and uh, I usually give them sort of a general, like, politics question, like, who's the president? If they can answer <laughs> that, then they're usually doing that. Got it. So you're just trying to test that they're cognitively aware mm-hmm. and able to speak to you, communicate with you. Yes. And you do that every time as a matter of course, just any time you are on a scene and you assessing can, a person. Yeah, you can typically just kind of throw those in for conversation and get a feel of how someone is copying. So you, you feel confident that you did that? I did do that. Um, did you do anything to assess the rib pain at that point? Um, I don't recall specifically doing that. I can tell you how I would do that, so I'm, I can tell with, you with confidence if that's what I wrote in my report, that is what I did. Okay. Um, and speaking of the report, what's the reason that you actually wrote out a report in this case? When we go on an incident with someone who has um, an injury, we just fill out paperwork for everyone's liability and future needs. Okay. Just trying to get down what the facts that were reported to you and that you observed. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so you assessed Mr. Sanderson on the hill mm-hmm. uh, and... At that point, did he know who hit him? Um, no, he never said who hit him. He just was like, yes, I was in a collision. Did he so, know what had happened? He, aside from saying, um, I believe, according to my paperwork, he said he was hit from behind. 
Um, so that was what he told me in a collision, but beyond that, he didn't have much in the way of specifics. Okay. Um, and then what about uh, Mr. Ramon, Ramon? Did he report to you any details about what he had seen? He um, mentioned a couple times that the skier involved had been Ms. Paltrow, um, but beyond that, there were no specifics of like how it happened. And do you know how he knew it was Ms. Paltrow? Um, I, I do not. I, I hazarded a guess that he had seen, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> was it a little surprising that a name that you knew, like a, a celebrity name, had come up? Sure. I, it wasn't what I expected for the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And um, was Mr. Ramon believable to you? Um, he wasn't. I wasn't talking a whole ton directly to him because um, I was busy. I wanted to assess my patient and make sure that he was in a good in a good way and didn't need anything super immediate. So I do recall when um, it had been brought up that there was a collision that I had asked if the other party was okay because I wanted to make sure there wasn't another injured person floating around somewhere. So. I see. Um, but you didn't have your own conversation with Mr. Ramon about what he had seen? No. And what about, uh, did you hear anything about someone being unconscious, or Mr. Sanderson being unconscious for a few minutes? No, I didn't get that reported. That would have up to the seriousness of that call for me really fast. Yeah, so uh, that's my next question. If you had heard Mr. Sanderson was unconscious for two minutes or you know, a, a, a long time, um, what would you have done? Um, that would have been, if, if you're reporting a loss of consciousness, typically you get to leave the resort in an ambulance. That's kind of where that goes. Um, even if you're mentating correctly for me there, if I hear you were out cold on the snow for two minutes, I'm going to call an ambulance and let you refuse them directly. And um, what about loss of consciousness for a shorter period of time than that, even five seconds? Sure. It's kind of any, any loss of consciousness. If someone said, hey, this person was out, I'm going to start looking at that. Okay, and you feel confident that you did not hear about anything like that? I don't recall ever hearing that, no. Um, and uh, I think I asked you this, but just to make sure, uh, did Mr. Ramon tell you how he believed that, uh, what led him to believe that Ms. Uh, Poucher had been the other person in the collision? I No, aside from saying the name, he didn't expound. Okay, so then once you've... Um, done that assessment have we covered that assessment I should ask mm -hmm. that on the hill I'm, I'm sorry could you repeat the question yeah have we covered what you did in that assessment what you remember in that assessment on the hill um yes I mean there's a bit more to it probably okay, then, <laughs> please tell the jury <laughs> yes I don't okay. want to cut you off sure there's uh it's a head to toe right it's not just if you tell me your ribs hurt I'm absolutely going to look at that but they can distract from other things so it's a it's a head to toe assessment to make sure that there's nothing sneaky happening elsewhere um, and then I would have like palpated the ribs, have them breathe in, make sure that's all going properly. Got so. it. Okay. And uh, what were your findings after that head to toe assessment? Sure. Um, the majority was that rib pain. Um, he wasn't having trouble breathing, so I was comfortable with that. Um, but he definitely had something going on in that vicinity. Okay. Got it. Then, uh, as I understand it, I think Mr. Chet Anderson has spoken to this that. Uh, he was taken on a toboggan, is that right? Correct, yeah. I um, packaged him in the sled and took him down to our first aid area. Okay, and what happened after that? Um, we would have gone into first aid and um, I think sort of reassess once we're in a place where, okay, pull your jacket off, pull your helmet off. Does anything else hurt now that it's been a few minutes? Um, and then from there, I do recall I spent a fair amount of time waiting for um, his friend to bring the car around. So we, we chatted for a bit. And when you say a bit, you know, uh, an estimate of how long that actually Estimated happened? Estimated around two hours. Okay, and how long was the assessment on the hill? It was probably 10 minutes. That's a rough estimate, but 10, okay. 10 to 15 before we were packaged and moving. So you spent a lot more time with him in the first aid I did. clinic? Yeah. It, sorry, is that I, I did, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. It's okay. And, um, and is that typical that you would stay with a patient for two hours? It's um, a bit abnormal. We do try and get back up into rotation, but also um, Gervais customer service says that we stay with the patient until the end, make sure, you know, A to B, they're on their way and are in a good spot. And it's also just good medical care to not say see you, bye. <laughs> right, right. So. Uh, that makes sense. And was there uh, any reason, aside from waiting for this car, that you needed to stay with him uh, for two hours? 
I wanted to keep assessing and make sure that he didn't trend uh, downward in any of his symptoms, which he did not. So that was the main reason was just to make sure he got on his way. Okay. So uh, was there any indication early in the first aid visit, the reassessment down at, at the uh, bottom of the hill, uh, that he would need two hours of care from you? Uh, no. Okay. And why do you say that? Um, his he wasn't you know trending downward. His his symptoms were staying the same with his root pain um, and sort of that rattled kind of feeling that I would noted on the hill seemed to be dissipating. We were able to converse pretty well. Okay, and um, was there any time during all of that uh, afternoon that you spent with Mr. Sanderson that you uh, saw evidence of a, a head injury or a brain injury? Um, no, I, as time went on, I said this guy is A and O4, so I felt comfortable releasing him private vehicle. And was that A and O4, is that what you just said? Yes. <laughs> okay, and again, that means that he was alert to those four different categories you mentioned earlier. Correct. Uh, and I, th I think he earlier tes told the jury that you gave him some things to remember. Yes. Do you yeah, recall that's, that? There's a, a handful of sort of head assessments you can do, and that's one of them. I'll usually give somebody three words and then sort of periodically throughout the same time, I'll ask him to repeat that for me. Right. And was one of them your horse's name? Um, no, that's not usually one I use. Oh, okay. I use uh, Blue Snow 24 oh. without fail the whole time I've patrolled. Okay. Okay. So. And um, um, let's see. So uh, you were doing various tests to make sure that he was uh, fully alert and uh, his cognitive facilities were intact. Is that correct? Correct. And you found no concern. He was, he was, yeah, he was not trending downward. He was solid. But did you encourage him to go get further care at all? I did, yeah. And I what said, was that for? He had the rib pain, and I told him if any other concerns came up, then you should talk to whoever sees you at the clinic. Okay, got it. So let's go to your report. Um, well, actually, uh, let's finish the day. So you, you finished with him once he got a ride, and you knew that he was okay, mm -hmm. that he had someone to take him. Uh, I, what did you do after that? Um, I would have rotated back to the top. I don't have a specific memory of that, but I would have rotated back to the top of a mountain and checked in. Okay, got it. And then uh, uh, did you talk to anybody else during the day after you had been with Mr. Sanderson about what had happened? Sure. When I came in for the evening, um, our he was then our patrol director, Steve Graff. I just sort of mentioned, like, oh, hey, it's kind of a interesting sidebar Somebody said they saw Ms. Paltrow on the slopes today may have had something to do with my incident. And it was sort of just a three-minute conversation. And then... <laughs> and what was... Did, uh, was there any discussion about the injuries, or was it just the fact that it was Ms. Paltrow involved? Just, just the fact that, that maybe she was involved. I see. And you obviously were not there. I think it's, you've made it clear. You weren't there at the actual collision. You didn't see what happened, correct? Correct. And you never saw Ms. Paltrow that day? I did not. You didn't talk to her? No. Okay. okay I'm going to uh, put your report on the screen here. Um, it will also come up on that screen. Okay. Uh, I believe it has already been published to the jury. This is Defense 24A. Is that correct? Yes, and it's also Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see, this is. I'm using a different cord here up, up here that I haven't been using back at my table, and it's not working. Let's re plug it in. Let's go back. To, we know that this this one works. Just pull it up here. Should be good. Okay. 
Okay, there we go. Sorry for that wait. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so is this your report? It is. And when did you create it? Um, the date on it is the 26th of February, 2016. So that's, that's when I would have done it. Okay, do you remember what time in the day? I don't specifically recall, but it does say 12 p.m. on there. Okay, got it. And uh, I'm just going to go through a few parts of it here. So if we pull up the, the first part, oh, I'm actually, I apologize. We need to redact this. I'm on, um, uh, yeah, should I redact that first part? I apologize. I had it redacted on here and it just deleted. Okay. So, my apologies. Okay. So, uh, I just want to point out a couple things. So, here on the right side, there's a weight and a height. Do you see that? Yes. And do you just get that from a report from the patient? I typically just ask, yes. Okay, got it. Fill and it then out. here it says collision, and you say yes, correct? Yes. And then here it says with, and it says unknown, other party not present. What did you, why did you write that? Uh, because they, Mr. Sanderson wasn't sure about who the person involved with the collision was, and they weren't there for me to find out. Got it. And then if we go to this next section here, there's a mention of num uh, similar injury or illness, and it says yes. Yes. You see that? And then it says year 2010. Do you recall what that was re regarding? I don't recall the specific um, mention of what happened in 2010, but that relates directly to what I check lower down in the form as the injury. So it would have been for the ribs. Okay, got it. Yeah, let's go to that. So down here where you talk about the injury, it's a section that's called possible injury, correct? Here correct. on the side? Yes. And you checked fracture, I see. There's a X there, correct? Yes. And strain and sprain, what were those connected to? To the ribs, yes. Okay. We, don't, we do not diagnose, so that's why it's possible. So Got it. And then there's also a note of, uh, or a box uh, relating to concussion, and then head over here. Those are not checked, correct? Correct. And uh, would you have checked those if you were concerned about possible concussion? I would have. And then a head injury as well? Correct. And then this section over here, it says other, and then if I'm reading your handwriting correctly, it says ribs? ribs yes. Okay, got it. Uh, and then it says right over here, and is that related to the ribs? The right side, yes. Okay, so uh, this document is a, an accurate representation of the injuries that you thought he possibly sustained on that day? Correct. Okay. And this also mentions that first aid was re rendered both at injury site, you had an assessment, correct? Yes. And then also in the aid area, you reassessed. Correct. correct. And you've already explained those two assessments, right? Yes. Okay. There's one part that I um, redacted that I want to pull up, so give me a second. Um, Okay, so this section here says corrective lenses required, and it says yes. Do you see that? Oh, whoops. It, it's gone, sorry. Yep, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there <laughs> Go it is. Ahead. Go ahead. Correct. Yeah. Corrective lenses required. Yes. Yes. And then it says worn, and you check no, correct? Correct. And why would you have done that? Um, if someone, I'll ask them the corrective lenses question if they do need them. If they tell me yes and I don't visibly see glasses, I'll ask if they have contacts in. And if they tell me no, then. I'll check now. Okay, got it. The second page of your report is Defendant's Exhibit 24B, and I think we've already published this, correct? No objections? No, we have Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, which is the exact same document. Similar, right. Okay, okay. thanks. And then uh, here I just wanted to point out there's various uh, places where you get to kind of describe a little more detail, correct? Yes. And here's a section where you get to talk about what you did. 
and it says assessment. Do you see that? Yes. And then mild disorientation. What did you mean by that? So I put assessment, and then those would be my findings on that assessment. Um, his mild disorientation when I was there was the, um, the lack of specificity for what had happened during the collision. He was able to tell me that there was a collision and not much beyond that or who um, was involved, and then the rib pain that we found. Okay, so that mild disorientation, and when you wrote it, you didn't mean that to indicate any cognitive problems or concern for concussion, anything like that? I think it did originally spike my concern for a head injury because he wasn't able to tell me how he fell. Um, but then as time went on, I became less concerned about that, as I noted later. Right. Uh, and are you referring to the reassessment that says disintor- disorientation lessened? Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, I also note on this page that uh, there's a section down here that says witness, and there's you know contact information, identify, uh, identifying information you could have put here, but you didn't put anything. Is that correct? Correct. And why didn't you put anything? Um, no one seemed to be a direct witness to what happened. Okay. If Mr. Ramon had told you, I saw this and here's what happened, you would have put his name here? Yes. Okay. And at the bottom, you can't see it that well with what I called out, but is that your signature at the bottom? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whoops. So, sorry about that. Um, if you go here, right at the bottom, it says, I carefully read the above statement and it is true and accurate. Yes. And then that's your signature that's after that? That's my signature, correct. Okay, and you stand by that signature? I do. Okay. Um, let's go back to 24A real quickly because there's one part I want to hit uh, that I missed. Uh, actually, I need more than that. There's this section that says, injured description of incident. And it says, was hit from behind, correct? Correct. And uh, am I reading this correctly that this was Mr. Sanderson who... Uh, Mr. Sanderson's description because he was the injured? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Typically, I, I ask the injured party what happened, and then I'll write down exactly what they tell me. Got it. Okay. Um, there's also an addendum to your report, right? There is. And can you tell the jury why you made an addendum to your report? Sure. Um, our, and I forget who exactly made the request, but um, it was just requested that I fill out an extra form with anything else I might have remembered. Okay, and this is Defendant's Exhibit 25B, and I think it has been published. No objection, correct? Uh, no objection. It's also part of Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. Great. Okay, so is this the additional comments that you made? It is. Okay, and uh, there's a date down at the bottom, I know, that's 3-18-2016, which is obviously after the accident, correct? Correct. And so, um, again, wh why did you do this a few weeks later? Sure. To my knowledge, um, it had come to note that maybe Ms. Paltrow had been present on the mountain and with all the um, different, I guess, different information coming through the office. I wasn't privileged to that. Um, they thought that maybe they would want some more information for that, so they asked me to write it down. Okay, so was there, a, was there a question in your mind initially about whether Ms. Paltrow actually was involved? No, it wasn't something I was really thinking about. Okay, so you weren't sure w whether what Mr. Ramon said was true? Yes, I was just focused on patient care at right. that point. Okay, and if we go to the actual uh, comments here, let's do your first paragraph. Do you mind reading it for us? Sure. I recall that upon arriving on scene on Bandana at the bridge, I found the patient, Terry, standing on the right side of the run in his skis. The mountain host that had radioed patrol was above doing traffic control. A friend of Terry's was also present, a large man, blue jacket, black pants, dark hair, hereby referred to as large male friend. Terry said that he was uncertain what had happened. LMF told Terry that a woman had struck him from behind, knocking him down. LMF stated he had believed that the woman had been Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay, so there's this note. I think you've already described this, but I want to make sure I understand. Terry said that he was uncertain what had happened. He, he actually told you that? Correct. Okay. And then LMF, who uh, you understand is Craig Ramon, is that right? Yes. And told Terry that a woman had struck him from behind, knocking him down. So 
that was something you heard Ramon tell Terry? Yes. He didn't tell you that? No. Okay. Let's go to the next section here. Do you mind reading it for us? I asked if anyone had spoken to the woman. Can I call him Craig? And this is that all right? All right. Sure. I mean, you know who it is. That <laughs> Craig you said he had asked her if she was all right. He said she had told him she was fine and skied away. During assessment, transport, and time in first aid, Craig continued to say that the woman involved in the collision was Gwyneth Paltrow. So you remember that he, he kept uh, bringing up this point of Miss Paltrow's involvement. I do. And you don't know how he knew it was her? No, I don't. Okay. And then I think uh, the last section, which I guess is a couple paragraphs. Sorry, I cut, cut that off. Um, so at Empire First Aid, we were met by three others from Terry Skeen Group. Do you remember that? I do. And who were those? Um, according to this, it was a blonde woman, a man, and Debbie. Okay, and you didn't have any interaction with them, or did you? Um, I don't specifically recall it. I do know they came into first aid to like check on their friend, but that's the extent of my recollection there. Okay, and did they stay with Terry the whole time he was there? Um, no, after, and I don't know how long, um, everybody went back out skiing and one went to go get the car. Okay, and left Terry with you alone. Correct. Okay. Uh, and then there's another sentence here that seems like the similar things you've said before. I recall LMF or Craig reiterating to the group his identification of the woman to have been Gwyneth Paltrow. Do you see that? I do. And when you write his identification of the woman, does that mean that it was your understanding that he personally identified the person as Miss Paltrow? That was, yes. I guess I probably made the assumption that it was a sight thing, and that's what okay. he had come up with. Okay. And then uh, eventually Debbie, uh, who had left to retrieve the car, came back and picked him up. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And then at the bottom you identify LMF as correct. It, it came back to me, yes. Okay. When you say it came back, you, you couldn't is. remember his name at the start, but then later remembered it? Correct. Okay. As you were writing out and bringing these memories back? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so is it fair to say that his ribs, or let me ask, I'll ask it this way, were his ribs his chief complaint? Yes. And he did not offer any indication to you of a head injury? No. Oh, whoops. Sorry. I have just one last thing I want to look at, and then I think we're done. So dizziness, loss of balance, did you observe anything like that? No, I was monitoring for those things and didn't see them. Bl blurred vision? No. Ringing in the ears? No. Sensitivity to light? No. Sensitivity to sound? No. Mood changes? Not that I observed. Was he dazed or confused? No. Um, did he talk about a headache? No. Nausea? No. Vomiting? No. Fatigue? Uh, not, I don't know if I asked him about that one. <laughs> okay, okay. So not that I recall there. Okay, got it. Any speech problems? Not that I noticed. And. The jury has seen a picture of you before. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to inform you. <laughs> uh, we have been talking about you already. Okay. And do you remember Mr. Sanderson taking a picture? I do. Of you? I, I, yes. During that first day? Yes, while we were at Empire First Aid. Yeah, and um, did you know at any time, was he on his phone and making a post about that picture? I'm not sure. I, I don't recall. Did you help him put together a post at all? No. Did you check his eyes carefully? I did, yes. We um, assess for basically pupil reactivity if when you shine a light, if they're constricting and then dilating back out again. Okay, and you remember doing that? His were equal and reactive. Okay, and that, what does that tell you if they're equal and reactive? Um, it's just another test to see if potentially there is a brain bleed mostly. Okay, got it. Um, I think that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Mr. Bueller. I think the uh, plaintiff's or defendant's exhibit of your report is 
a little bit clearer. The one we have is a little less clear on page three. What was that uh, exhibit number for defendant? Uh, which part of it? The first page. The, the exhibit is it a separate exhibit? Yeah, 26. It's around so 25, 24A is the first page of the incident. The B, C? Yeah, they're slightly out of order. The supplemental report is 25B? Yeah, if that's, okay. what, if that's what you're looking for. Okay. <clears throat> uh, are you are you qualified to diagnose uh, TBI or brain injury? No, I do not diagnose. You noted on your report that um, there was uh, under assessment. The first thing you wrote was mild disorientation, correct? Correct. And then and rib pain right side, correct? Correct. And then uh, transport via toboggan to EFA. That's Empire First Aid. It is. And then reassessment disorientation lessened but the disorientation was still uh, apparent at the first aid station right not by the time mr. Sanderson left no but before when he got there at the first aid station he had mild disorientation I do not recall that being down there okay and um, you did not believe um, Craig Ramon the large male friend LMF when he told you or told in your presence that it was Gwyneth Paltrow who had hit Terry from behind? It seemed like sort of an unbelievable statement at the time. You know, like uh, that man appeared on the scene, that strange? Similar. Okay. Um, and uh, it was uh, the supervisor that asked you to write that report that you hand wrote um, three weeks later, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, was Terry Sanderson very appreciative of your uh, assistance that day? Yes, I remember him being very kind. Yeah, do you understand he still is very appreciative of what you did? I'm glad. Glad I could help him. Okay. Um, you said he was rattled on the hill. Yes. What is rattle? Uh, well, does rattled mean disorientation? That is my version of it, yes. That is how I would present that. So is um, rattled or disorientation, is that a possible sign of a concussion? Not in the way that I was presenting it, but I can see how it could come off that way. Is it possible it could, he could have had a concussion because he was rattled and disoriented? It's my tests, we were coming out with no, but again, I don't diagnose, so down the line, someone else could come up with something different. Someone who's qualified to diagnose a concussion? Correct. Okay, and you're not uh, qualified to diagnose a concussion. I do not diagnose. <clears throat> okay. You encouraged Terry Sanderson to go to the clinic, correct? I did. And you, <clears throat> let's see. So your main goal was to stabilize him and focus on him. You, you did not investigate the collision matters, even though Craig Ramon said it was Gwyneth Paltrow who hit him from behind. I did not chase that down, no. You did not believe Craig Ramon? When I come up on a collision that one party has gone from, I'm not going to go try and find that person. It's pretty impossible. Unless it's someone's famous. It could be, but it's sort of a hearsay thing at that point. Just give me a moment, please. Thank you, Ms. Smith. That's all I have. Hold it one second. Thank you. I just have one more. Sure. Ms. Smith, uh, there was a question about you being asked to write those additional comments. Do you recall that? I do. Uh, Did you write those with any intention of covering up anything that you, you knew about this accident? No. Or covering for Miss Paltrow because she's a celebrity? No. Okay, thanks. Mr. Bueller?
just the opposite question. When you wrote those comments, you were trying to reveal that uh, Ms. Paltrow was involved in this. At least her name was mentioned, right? I was just writing down what I recalled. Okay. Thank you. That's all you're on. Okay. You're excused, but you may need to be called back again. Okay. So please don't uh, discuss the case with anyone and don't watch the proceedings. Okay. Thank you. He's out there, so we'll have to go grab him. Sure. Good afternoon, Mr. Graff. If you could walk right up here and be sworn in as a witness. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. And then take a seat in the witness stand and then begin by, I guess, positioning the microphone and then uh, stating and spelling your name. I'm Steve Graff, uh, G-R-A-F-F. -F. Thank you. Your Honor, as we walked in, the witness told me that he is thirsty. Do you mind if I give him a drink? Yeah, please do. Thank you. I got it, I got it. All right, Mr. Graff. Um, Thank you for being here. We don't have much time, so you'll be quick. Um, uh, I first want to ask you whether you know about uh, a man named Mr. Sanderson, Terry Sanderson. I do. And how do you know about him? I know he was involved in a ski accident at Deer Valley in February of 16, and he has subsequently filed suit against originally Deer Valley and Gwyneth Paltrow. And um, how do you know about this? Well, I know about the accident, beginning the day of the accident, and have been involved in it off and on for the last six years. Okay, and in what capacity did you learn about this accident in terms of professional life? Well, my professional life, the day of the accident, um, I spoke with Whitney Smith about it at the end of the day, okay. uh, about the accident. And what did you learn from her? What was your understanding from your conversation with her? It was just end of the day work in the ski patrol room as the patrol comes in. I'm usually around that area so if they have questions about scheduling, just talk about the day, many of those type of things. And she was in um, the Empire First Aid room for an extra long period of time, so questioned about that. And she said, yeah, the crazy thing is there was somebody there that said that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was involved. Okay. Anything else that you understood from your interactions with her? That was the end of any interactions with that for a number of days. Okay. With, with end of the interactions with Miss Smith? Yes. And what was your role, your job at Deer Valley at that time? At that time, I was the ski patrol manager for Deer Valley. Okay. So you managed all of Ms. Smith and her colleagues, making sure that they're organized, running the various runs so that they can help people that may be in trouble. Is that a good sort of layperson's That's description? That's a pretty good description. If there were 70 ski patrollers, managed staffing six different mountains, a um, number of different ski patrol stations, first aid rooms, things of that nature on a daily basis. Okay. And um, so after that assessment, or sorry, shouldn't say assessment. I keep. I was saying that a bunch in the, with Miss Smith. Uh, the that interaction with Miss Smith. Uh, did you have any other involvement in um, trying to determine what had happened in this collision? Not that day. No. It wasn't until maybe a week to ten days later that uh, I saw a instructor comment form come in um, from Mr. Christiansen and. He had been with Gwyneth Paltrow that day, and he had listed that she was involved in a collision. And so 
I reached back out to Whitney and said, hey, there might be some validity to that. Do you mind giving us some more information on that? I see. Because at first, you, it wasn't clear that the claim about Ms. Paltrow was, in fact, true. Is that correct? No, it was reported to me as just somebody in the background saying, you know, beautiful blonde woman at Deer Valley must be Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay, got it. And um, did you do anything further to try and figure out if anybody else on the mountain, Deer Valley employees, knew anything about the collision? Not at that time, no. Okay. Um, did you do anything later? Yes. And when was that? Um, well, a lot of things happened. So chronologically, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just kind of quickly go through how these things transpired as far as I'm aware. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, week, 10 days after the accident, noticed that there was an instructor comment card, verified that Gwyneth was there, asked Whitney to to follow up on that, maybe a few more statements about what happened that day to add to her incident form. And then nothing for maybe a month or so, um, sometime you know, March, April, I believe, John Gay, the director of skier services, um, received a letter from Mr. Sanderson. Uh, and in the letter, if I remember correctly, he was concerned that the skier responsibility code wasn't being applied evenly uh, because of Ms. Paltrow's celebrity status. And he didn't mention in the letter to John, the director of skier services, that his employee yelled at him or anything like that uh, in that particular letter. There was another follow-up letter, similar content, weeks after that one. Uh, and then there was a request for the contact information for Ms. Paltrow. And when we first got that request, we complied how it typically goes, and it didn't go any differently in this case, is that we reached out to Ms. Paltrow and said, Mr. Sanderson has requested your information. We're giving it to him. We reached out to Mr. Sanderson, said here's Gwyneth information. We're giving it to her, as we would with any other case. Got it, I see. And um, what about any attempts to find, well, I should back up and ask you some foundational questions. In learning uh, about this incident, did you ever hear about any ski patrollers coming on the scene of the actual collision? Yeah, that was later that we started digging more into that. Um, we supplied that information. It wasn't until 2019, I believe, when we were served and we really started digging into what had happened and getting statements from people and you know, depositions and, and all of that. And through that process, uh, we dug a lot deeper into, I believe it was Christy Anson that said a ski patroller came by the, the scene while they were still there and everybody was present or mostly present. And so we looked into that and there were two potential uh, people that matched the description. I believe one of them was on Empire and one of them was on uh, Flagstaff. Bandana Ski Run connects both of them. So we reached out to both of those. They didn't recollect um, skiing by and asking anybody if they needed help. Um, but that's not unusual that, you know, on any given day, it's probably more unusual on a ski run that I don't ask somebody if they're okay. You know, it's just very common occurrence. You go, you see someone standing there, someone looking at a map, someone picking themselves up. It's very common to say, are you okay? And, Yep, everything's okay, and then moving on. And there's no, no documentation of that. It's just routine business. I see. And were there patrol logs that were connected with this? I think the jury's heard some description of logs that are kept about who's on which run in terms of the patrol people. Is that right? Yes, that's true. There's um, logs on every mountain, and not every run is logged, but if a ski patroller goes down a run, they come back. They're like, yep, I did bandana at 1124. And they would write that down and put their initials on that. Got it. Um, I believe I have those logs, which are Defendants Exhibit 26A and 
uh, through C, and I don't believe that we have published these, so I would ask for permission to publish these and admit them. And what, how are they been marked for identification? Defendants Exhibit 26A through C. Through C? Yes. Okay, any objection? Right, just a sec, Your Honor. Twenty six A through C defense exhibit is received. Okay, so I'll, I'll publish it. It should be on that screen uh, for you, Mr. Graff. Do you see it? Uh, I do now. Okay, is that the log we're talking about? Yes, this is uh, the Flagstaff Patrol log. This isn't the section I'm talking about. It's a two page log. Okay, so maybe this is it. This is the 20, log. 26 B. Is that Correct. the log or is, do I have to keep going? So this would be the run log. So you see where it says opening run, run check. Um, obviously, a lot more runs are done than that. Ski patrollers typically do more than a couple of runs a day. Uh, but they're trying to make sure that all the runs get checked. So. On this particular one, and as it pertains to this, we're looking for a bandana, and it's at the very top. And here at the top. Yep. I and see. It looks like uh, 1140, and then there's another time, and a couple of initials in there. Okay, got it. And then, just for the sake of completeness, then there's 26C. I don't know if that makes a difference here to you. Is that was that part of your? Uh, it was this record a part of your attempt to figure out who those patrollers were? Yes, this was part of us trying to get all the information we could about this. And this 26C document, does it offer anything additional? Um, if, I guess if you zoom, I can go, zoom I can in, go down out, to zoom out, yeah. So this is sweep, so that's after the accident, so it doesn't offer anything additional there. Um, the page that you showed previously mm -hmm. has okay. names of the people that were on the mountain that day. Is that this page? That's this page, correct. I see. So at the top there. At the top here, okay. Yep. So Caleb, Jess, Whitney, and Tom were there. Uh, Steve Campbell was the snowmobiler. And you... Oh, Remember sorry, correctly, I asked Tom specifically because I saw his initials in that log. But not only did I look at Flagstaff, but knowing that Bandana is a connecting run to Lady Morgan and Empire, we looked at those patrol patrollers as well and asked them if anybody on the mountain that day recalls saying, "Are you okay?" to some people on Bandana, and okay. we didn't get any. We didn't get any affirmative response to that. Given your experience with managing patrollers and responding to various incidents if there had been an incident where someone was unconscious for a long time would you expect to have heard about it yes most definitely and would you expect those patrollers to remember it if you asked them a number of years later yes and they did not they did not in this case okay um, Even if the person wasn't necessarily injured, but wanted a ride or had an equipment problem, or if there was anything other than no, I'm okay, it most likely would have ended up in this log. I see. And it does not. You've reviewed these and you don't, see any, you don't see any indication of any uh, such event? No. Okay. And um, okay. Do you know who Eric Christensen is? I think you mentioned him earlier. I do know who Eric Christensen is. And did you ever receive a report that he had yelled at Mr. Sanderson? I believe that was in one of the claims in the it, lawsuit, but never, never in our investigation. Okay, so you had heard about it in terms of claims in a lawsuit, but never aside from that? Never since, no. Got it. So there wasn't a... A patroller that said, "Hey, we need to um, respond to Mr. Christensen. He he's not treating our customers properly." Right. In our investigation of all of our employees that were involved or could have been involved, that that's never come up. That that question that no one ever said yes that there was yelling or even raised voices or. Anything. And if that had been reported, how do you respond to those things? How do you? Um, you know, investigate an incident like that, maybe discipline employees. Yeah, I've 
been a leader and manager of employees for nearly 30 years now and if any one of my employees verbally assaulted or guessed or yelled at them or behaved in any way that was inappropriate, we would definitely take action with that. And no action was taken against Mr. Christensen? No action was taken, no. And I understand, if, if I'm correct, you're no longer in that patrol manager position, is that right? That's right. I was the ski patrol manager and in 2017 I became the Mountain Op Director of Mountain Operations and in 2022, I'm the Vice President of Mountain Operations. Okay, so is it fair to say you're familiar with how Deer Valley responds to uh, employees that have, uh, you know, um, that misbehave or that engage in behavior that um, is um, uh, inappropriate towards guests? Yes, I'm aware of that. Okay. And then what about, in, you're, are you aware of how Deer Valley deals with celebrities on the ski slopes? I, I am aware of how Deer Valley deals with celebrities on the ski slopes. Um, and how, how is that? Do, do they treat them any differently than other people? No. <laughs> the, we don't, there's no reason for Deer Valley to really, Deer Valley as a company and broadly tell our employees about when celebrities are at Deer Valley. The only time in my 29 years or so at Deer Valley that I've known about celebrities is when we think there might be some disruption to our business, right? Like paparazzi or things of that nature. Um, I can only think of two instances in that time frame that there was a reason why we would want some of our employees to know about celebrities being on the mountain. You know, if it was you know heads of state or members of Congress or sitting presidents or past presidents, you know, with security details, we're usually informed of those things, but not celebrities. To your knowledge, did Deer Valley employees, executives, anyone involved with Deer Valley, do anything to cover up the facts of this case to protect Gwyneth Paltrow? Absolutely not. And were you even aware uh, that Ms. Paltrow was on the slopes that day? I wasn't aware of it until I read the instructor comments that just happened to mention that my student was Gwyneth Paltrow and was involved in a collision. And I recalled that, hey, Whitney was on an accident a week or so ago, and there was somebody there that said the same thing. So that's when it, those two pieces came together for me. And does Deer Valley have any position on what occurred in terms of the collision, who, who hit who? No, there's, um, with, the varying statements, there's different statements about what happened. And so we as a company don't have a position on who's at fault. Okay. That's all my questions. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Mr. Sykes? Judge, I've got more than seven minutes. You want out the jury go early tonight or Sorry. why don't you start? Start with okay. each one. Nice to see you, Mr. Sykes. We know each other from other cases, don't we? We know each other, yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is the log that was referred to a minute ago, 26A. Can you see it there? I do. Mm -hmm. uh, 19 or 9.58 a.m. Skier assist. What was that uh, next word? Can you read that? Uh, well, knowing that it was on Flagstaff Mountain, it's, I'm going to say it's Sidewinder. Okay. Sidewinder is a run there. Next one is 1036. Lost something boot. Is that right? 
It says lost boulder, bad boot. Yeah. It goes so back to what I was saying before. A skier before. has a bad boot on, was it bandana? That would be lost boulder, bad boot. Okay, lost boulder, a, a, a bad boot, and that gets logged in. Correct. Right? <coughs> um, and a, uh, a skier collision on bandana doesn't merit a login at, let's say, 11.55 a.m.? A collision doesn't even mention a, a, a get a, uh, a mention? Yeah, that goes back to what I said before, that if it was a equipment like bad boot or somebody needed an assist, like maybe they needed a ride down, it would get logged. But if the people said, I'm okay, it wouldn't. Okay, at 12.02, PM now. Uh, Whitney Smith it says Whitney there uh, is an, a possible 1050 is a collision, right? Possible 1050 is an accident. An accident, okay. And bandana, okay. And she notes skier collision, collision, disorientation. Correct. Now you investigate these things for Deer Valley. Is it your position? that maybe seven minutes, just seven minutes or so, after that collision, he's disoriented, but at the time of the collision, he's not disoriented. Is that your position? I, I don't have a position on that. Well, <coughs> take one. I mean, five to seven minutes later, Whitney Smith, who has no skin in the game except She's employed by you, okay? No, it's disorientation on her, on her report. And she noticed it later, by the way, as you noticed. Right. And you're trying to tell this jury that just seven minutes before this individual wasn't disoriented? Is there a question there? Yeah. What's the question? Is it, are you trying to tell the jury that seven minutes before Terry Sanderson wasn't disoriented when the other two guys stopped by? Your Honor, may we who didn't you? log it. I wasn't trying to tell the jury anything. Got a, a, a request. Yes. You may proceed, Mr. Sykes. Do you remember the question? No. Okay. Are you telling this jury of the good men and women of Summit County that maybe five to seven minutes after this collision, it's noted here, I assume by Whitney Smith, or someone noted it, that, that there was a collision and there was disorientation and that Five to seven minutes before that, there was no disorientation. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that. It, on this form at 12.04, Whitney said there was a skier collision and the person presented with disorientation. I don't know where you're getting the five to seven minutes earlier. What are you referring well, to? Well, the, 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 the accident was logged, and the crash was logged at 11.55. By who? Well, it's in, in one of the records. I think it was Eric Christensen, 11.55. You weren't aware of that? I, there's a time frame there. I know that at 12.02, Whitney was dispatched, and I don't see the screen anymore, but I believe it was 12.04 she was on scene. Well, uh, okay. So Chris Jansen said he was on scene. Yeah, that was right. 11.55. Five minutes before then, and he didn't yeah. notice disorientation. Yeah. All right, uh, and your, uh, uh, no, have you ever had a broken rib? Yes. It's pretty painful, isn't it? Incredibly. Very painful, incredibly yes. painful. Have you ever had four broken ribs? Four. No. Okay. Terry was diagnosed at the VA with four broken ribs the very next day. Okay. 
Now, is it reasonable, and, and you've had a long history in skiing with, and with Deer Valley, long, illustrious history, right? Yes. Okay. Do you think that a man who just had four broken ribs, four, okay, would tell a, a ski patrol guy who came by that he was okay? Is that reasonable to you? Yes, that's reasonable. I've, four that's, broken ribs. I've seen... I've seen that happen over okay. and over again. Over and over again, people with four broken ribs tell a ski patrol that they're okay. Maybe not with four broken ribs, but quite frequently people say they're okay. They want to be okay. Okay. Let me ask you, um, Pete, would you find the... Okay, now, you didn't see the crash, did you? No, I did not. Okay. And you have no personal knowledge of how serious it was? No, I don't. You're aware that uh, Terry Sanderson has a witness who's not even a close friend, just a meet-up buddy, that says that one of Paltrow hit him in the back. Aware of that? I'm aware of that. Yes. Okay. Does that count for anything in your opinion? It's part of all of this. Part right. of this investigation. Uh, <coughs> Deer Valley, however, takes no position one way or the other on how the collision occurred. No, there's differing opinions or statements on what happened. But that. Deer Valley takes no position. We don't take any position. No. And. <coughs> Uh, you don't give celebrities any advantage. No. These kinds. Okay, now, you aware that she paid almost $9,000 for two days of skiing? You aware of that? I believe I saw that somewhere in the records. I think it might be overly inflated, but somewhere in there. That doesn't well, sound unreasonable. Okay. Now, that's a lot of money to pay for two days, isn't it? It's. All right. Deer Valley costs a lot of money. Mr. <laughs> Sykes. We can either recess now, or if you just have a few minutes of questioning, you could, you could finish. Well, I think it, I hate to hold the jury late. Why don't we recess and I'll finish tomorrow? All right. Is that okay? Uh, I have an objection to finishing well, tomorrow. Why don't we address that at, at, uh, after the jury's excused? Thank you. Members of the jury, we're going to recess now until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So. Uh, remember my admonition not to talk about the case with anyone, not to do any of your own investigation. And if you happen to look at the television or listen to the radio or go online, please avoid or do avoid reading anything or listening to anything about the case. So thank you. Hopefully we won't have a storm in the morning. Thank you. You can step down. Mr. Mr. Owens? Thank you. I've excused my client. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Did you have something you wanted to talk about? Yes, thank you. Your Honor, the plaintiffs still have not rested. Uh, that was supposed to take place Friday at the end of the day. I had Apple Martin, Moses Martin, and Brad Falchuk all ready to go this morning, and they were unable to testify. Uh, I, as I understand it, plaintiffs will not oppose Apple and Moses having their deposition transcripts read into the evidence. Can we confirm? Mr. Sykes? That's, that's, that's correct, as long as our additions are added, which I've given counsel. Thank you. And Brad Falchuk uh, is still um, we still haven't made a decision we may need to read his transcript in too we have two full days tomorrow the court hasn't made a decision about what oh sorry um, Brad Falchuk is the husband mm -hmm. with me and what decision do I need to make about that I'm sorry N we 
you need to make a decision. Okay. Yeah. I'm just speaking through a mask, which makes it hard. Um, tomorrow, Tuesday, can I give my lineup? What's the lineup for tomorrow? McMahon. Well, that's oh, you're the giving the lineup. Us. You're giving the lineup. Okay, go ahead. We're starting with we'll finish up, Mr. Um, uh, Graf. Graf. My, my objection. No. My objection to. Uh, we're already terribly behind. Just, just a minute, it, Mr. Graf, in the room here. Maybe you better run out and grab him and make sure he's going to be here at nine o'clock in the morning. Somebody from the plaintiff's side. So four of our witnesses have been thrown off, just to let you know, because we had seven planned for today. And, and that's can't... your choice, counsel, to throw them off. So each side gets 50% of the trial time, and, and you're making a decision about how to allocate that time. Based on the assumption that for plaintiffs would be done on Friday. And that's between the two of you. OK. I, I'm not complaining. I'm just putting this on the record. And I so we have. Um, Eight experts, four tomorrow, most out of state, four on Wednesday. Um, so we're, we're lumping in now uh, people onto Friday, excuse me, Thursday morning. Uh, anyway. You see that I've got in the time for, thir for Thursday morning, it's two hours and 7.75, uh, 2.75 hours or something like, like that. That includes closing arguments. Wow. That means point, point 0.75 hours well, on Tuesday I, morning or Thursday morning. It's just an estimate of what's available. If we take up a lot of time in uh, out of jury hearings, uh, that will get smaller. And you're running an excellent court. I'm just saying an hour for closing on both sides means essentially no evidence on Thursday morning. Well, you can start your, you can start your closings earlier than that. It just depends on when you rest your case and when the plaintiff rests their case. But your half time includes your closing argument. See, thank you for telling me that. I hadn't focused on that. So you envision the jury commencing deliberations at about noon? That, that would be in a perfect world. OK. And I understand, um, and I, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. And so if, if they have to be charged a little bit later than that, they have to be charged a little bit later than that. Thank you. But that would be in a perfect world. All right. So my concern, sorry to be so loud, uh, long on this. We have Michael McMahon, a physician assistant, Paul Bogger, our ski expert, Irvin Sher, Sher, our biomechanical expert, and Stephen Edgley, our neuro rehabilitation expert. Uh, they are not flexible. Uh, so my concern with having Steve Graff come back tomorrow morning is um, that it's going to throw off these folks that are not flexible. Okay. I, I would rather Steve Graff come back, for instance, Thursday morning so that we can get our, our experts who are time. Sure. Thanks. So you've got an expert that's ready to go at 9 a.m. in the morning? So Michael McCahan is actually not our expert, so I may have misspoken. He was the treating physician assistant at the Instacare, sure. and he is... Uh, Ready at 9 a.m.? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, Your Honor, I, I'll probably only have about 10 to 12 minutes to finish this up. Mm -hmm. Why I don't could we... wait, but I'd rather just get it done. I realize that, but we do have some professionals uh, that we need to make some accommodation for, and so... Why don't we wait with Mr. Graff's, completing Mr. Graff's testimony until we can fit it in sometime a little bit later. Maybe later tomorrow, or if you want to uh, schedule him for a specific time, uh, we can do that as well. So, uh, Steve Graff has flexibility to show up any time? I, I don't know. Yeah, he's not I don't control only the, Steve the best Graff. snow season in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue of, of Salt Lake City, but... And I, would, I would add that Michael McMahon, McMahon uh, doesn't remember the uh, treating Terry Sanderson. It's he, it's just a record review, and there's very little he would have to offer because he has no recollection of ever seeing the plaintiff. I think he will be sure. So why don't you speak with counsel for Deer Valley and find out when you can schedule Mr. Graff? One makes sense to, to schedule him. Uh, can you give him some blocks of time when he could schedule that? Yes. I mean, so if we can hold him to 10 minutes, we can live with it. 
in what the morning, tomorrow morning? Yes. What we can't live with is it's 10 minutes and now it's two hours. Well, are you going to do another 10 or 15 of uh, redirect? James is on it. Uh, probably not. <laughs> Uh, I will commit to 10 minutes. All right, then we'll call him in the morning. Mr. Graff did say that he's available. Okay, so why don't we get him back in the morning, and we'll even try, we'll start as soon as the jury's here. If they're all assembled at 10 2, we'll start. And, and Judge, just for the record, I have never, I've been in lots of trials, lots of jury trials. I've never seen so many sidebars in a case as this one. Is that a compliment? Requested by the defense. Is that a compliment or a criticism? It's a compliment. <laughs> You're working very hard, Judge. Thanks. Anything else, counsel? Thank you, Judge. All right, Thank so you, come early. The jury has been asked to be here at 845. If they're all assembled, we'll start. 845? Yeah, yeah. let's start at them. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give you your time remaining. Or, or I, I'll give the time that you've taken and my anticipated time remaining. Right. Thank you. That would be helpful.